A Crucible Witch, a Supernatural Spy Academy series, Spellcaster Spy Academy Book 3, written by Ashley McLeo, narrated by Ashley Stenner. Chapter 1 I stirred the cauldron with bated breath, waiting for the moment that Morgan assured me was coming. Any second now, my ancestor repeated her twinkling eyes glued on the potion, the scent of bitter nettles and mushrooms wafted off the boiling liquid, herbaceous and earthy. Three, two, star a little slower, Odette. You're going too fast. Diana paused, her lips parting in rapt anticipation. Behind her, I caught a flash of motion and dragged my gaze from the brew. Hunter had snuck back inside and was poking his head into the room. He caught my gaze, and with a trickster wink, pointed at Diana's back and pressed his finger to his lips. I smothered a laugh. It was official. A week in such close quarters was too long. Hunter never would have dared to screw with Diana back home, in the future, where we lived in an expansive magical academy most of the year. But after three days of monsoon-like rains and being stuck inside a tiny cottage, it appeared that Hunter couldn't help but cause a bit of mischief. Almost, Diana cooed, her blue eyes locked on the bubbling yellow liquid. It's going to change now. Now. Hunter leapt into the room at the exact instant that the potion turned neon green. Diana let out a strangled screech, and purple magic shot from her fingers as she whipped around. Damn it, Wardwell. She batted at his shoulder as if he was a gross spider, which only made Hunter laugh harder. I nearly jinxed you. You should have, he replied, wiggling his fingers at her and shaking his hips in a way that made me snort out a laugh. I need to practice my counter jinxes. That can be arranged. A man with a long brown beard, shot through with white, strode into the kitchen, his arms full of herbs. A beaming Eva trailed behind him, her copper hair damp and arms laden with bits and pieces of artifacts she'd picked up. The relics were from a nearby Roman site that she'd been begging Merlin to show her since he'd mentioned it two days ago. The girl looked like she'd won the lottery. It's been far too long since I've jinxed anyone. Merlin twisted to face Hunter. Morgan can practice too. She always came up with the best, most original jinxes. She's so clever. I have a few untested ones. Morgan's cheeks had pinked at her paramour's flattery making the freckles that smattered the bridge of her nose stand out more. Usually she appeared goddess-like and wise, but in that moment she was just a girl enjoying the praise of her loved one. Hunter paled, and I wrapped my arms around my stomach and dissolved into full-blown laughter. Not what you meant, my boy. Alex's ancestor arched a bushy eyebrow. He can't handle you or Morgan, Eva teased. For once, her bow didn't provide a snappy rebuttal. Merlin's bright blue eyes ran up and down Hunter. Not now, but perhaps one day, he will be able to. I stopped laughing and straightened to stand. Eva and Hunter blinked, stunned. The compliment was huge, even if it was a perhaps. We were talking about the Merlin and the Morgan Le Fay, two of the most legendary witches in history, the witches who would eventually seal the Hellgate that I had unwittingly split wide open. The room stilled for a second, before Morgan broke the quiet, scooping a ladle of potion into a mug. What do you lot say we get this to Alex? After that we'll start lessons. The day is clearing up and we should use the light while we have it. I'll take it to him. I held up my hand, and Morgan passed me the cup. As I left the room, conversation began to flow again, and my lips quirked up. No matter what happened, how shocked or out of place we were in this era, M&M's cottage never stayed quiet for long. I stepped outside and covered my head with my arm, only to find that the springtime drizzle I'd expected had ceased. Morgan had called it. A smile bloomed on my face as I approached the small outbuilding, excited to see my man for a moment. The main cottage was where we hung out and ate our meals with M&M. Like most homes of its time, the dwelling was basically one room with a small section partitioned for sleeping. The older witches stayed in the cottage, while the rest of us shared the shack that the legends had built after Merlin experienced a vision of us arriving. Our quarters were about the size of a large backyard shed, a tight fit 
but preferable to squeezing all seven of us in the cottage, and since it was too dangerous for us to rent rooms in the nearby village, we made it work. I knocked on the door. Alex, are you awake? Yeah. His tone was lower than usual. I repressed a sigh. He'd been grumpy since we'd arrived in the past, and understandably so. He was stuck in a room that reeked of hay and too many bodies packed in tight. All I could do was try to be a bright spot in his day. Hey, I pressed the door open. Alex was still reclined in our bed of hay, a blanket draped over him, and a candle lighting the dark room. What are you reading? A healing text. He grinned. One of the first smiles I'd seen from him since he'd woke up four days ago. I'm learning all about the humors and bloodletting. How interesting. Perhaps for your next birthday you'll get a bag of leeches. That's love. He gestured to the cup in my hand. Is that for me? Yep. Morgan has been doing a lot of research on non-spirit walkers moving through the ghost realm. This will help to ground you in our world faster. I handed over the cup of liquid. Alex hated feeling as if he'd float away at any second. But according to Eminem, traveling through the ghost realm often made people who weren't spirit walkers feel weightless, ill, and lethargic. Especially those who were totally unprepared. Which Alex had been when a demon-possessed ghost kidnapped him from spellcasters and transported him through the spirit world so that he could arrive in London in mere minutes. Add in time walking through centuries shortly after traveling through the ghost realm, and Alex was a total mess. For now, the poor guy was allowed only one walk per day for exercise. During that walk, we had to watch after him and keep him grounded. Literally. He couldn't even relieve himself unaccompanied. Perhaps selfishly, I was thankful that task fell to Hunter. Until the sensation that he'd float away at any moment disappeared, Alex was stuck here. Bottoms up. He chugged the potion, then wrinkled his nose as he handed the empty mug back to me. That was awful. You don't want to know what we put in it, I admitted. If dragon piss will make me better faster, I'd drink it all day. He glanced at the healing books Merlin had given him. I'm trying to remain upbeat, but I'm missing out on so much, especially now that your lessons are starting. My heart broke for him. Being bedbound when there were two legendary witches around to learn from was torture for Alex. It didn't help that we barely had any time alone in a week. My hand slid over his. I know, babe, but if anyone knows how to make a potion that will help, it's Morgan. I'm sure you'll be up and running in no time. I bent down and kissed him. In the meantime, I'll tell you about everything I learn. That way, you have something meaty to chew on. I can't wait to hear all about it. Alex replied with a smile that almost hid the sourness in his tone. The door to the main cottage slammed shut, and voices grew louder as everyone stomped outside. Odie, Eva called out. We gotta go. Guess that's my cue. I felt terrible leaving him after such a brief visit, but I was also undeniably excited to get started. Although it had only been a week of resting and allowing our magic to acclimate after time walking had screwed us all up, it had felt like a year. Not to mention, Morgan had something important she wanted to discuss with Eva and me. We'd been on pins and needles for days, wondering what it might be. Alex tried to sit up to kiss me. I laid my hand on his chest and forced him to lie down again before pressing my lips to his. Get some rest, babe. A sigh dripping with resignation left him. Have fun. He reached for his book and cracked it open again. Trying not to take his mood personally, I kissed him on the forehead and left to join the others. Chapter 2 My feet ached in the small boots Morgan had lent me for tromping through the muddy woods. How much further? I asked, hoping it wouldn't be long and I'd be able to take the damn things off. A moment more, Morgan sang back, her long red braid swaying from side to side like a snake. She said that ten minutes ago, Eva muttered. Right? You kids are consumed with how quickly things happen, Morgan replied without looking back. Is this what everyone in your time is like? It's a very unappealing trait. I pressed my lips together and stayed silent. If it were anyone else, I'd have retorted that they didn't understand how painful walking in ill-fitting shoes could be, but that wouldn't fly with Morgan. She would just suggest I take them off and walk barefoot, like her. My ancestor was an all-natural goddess who rarely wore shoes and never in the woods around her home. 
Pine needles, stones, and sharp twigs didn't deter her from trekking miles barefoot, or even climbing trees with her little monkey feet. My modern, shoe-conditioned feet couldn't handle such things. But the tennis shoes I'd worn when I traveled into the past were soaked from our earlier adventure, searching the nearby swamp for potion ingredients. They'd take days to dry. Here we are, Morgan called out jostling me from a daydream involving dry, warm, well-fitted shoes and the fluffiest socks imaginable. Hurry, loves. When we caught up, we found ourselves in a clearing that looked like the others we'd passed on the way, with one notable exception. Gray stones, still damp from the last rain, formed a circle within the clearing. At hip height, they weren't even close to the size of the huge monoliths of Stonehenge. They gave off that important, ancient vibe all the same. I was sure they'd be incredibly heavy. It must have required a great deal of effort to get them here. In the middle of nowhere. What's all this? Eva asked. Is it Fay in origin? Morgan twirled her hand in the air dismissively. Why would I bother you with Fay nonsense? No, girls, this is something bigger, much more special and necessary if I'm to test you. A shiver of anticipation sprinted down my spine. What are you testing us for, exactly. Now that your magic has settled after time walking, I'm thinking it prudent to examine your demon-touched marks. However, we need to be in a safe place to do so, a god's wood. Goosebumps pebbled my skin as I looked around, seeing the verdant, dewy clearing ringed with stones with fresh eyes. A god's wood? There used to be many god's woods, although in the era I hope to return to, few remained. The old gods who ruled over magicals and humans alike had been long forgotten, at least by the humans. And perhaps for an excellent reason. The legends rarely painted them in a good light. They were largely cruel and demanded all humans and magicals worshipped them. A god's wood, Eva murmured. A place where the old gods used to congregate? Precisely. Morgan looked pleased that Eva understood the significance of the place. But God's Woods weren't only meeting places for the gods. They were sanctuaries, too. Sanctuaries? I asked. What could a god need sanctuary from? Weren't they made out of pure ether and nearly indestructible? And yet, they've disappeared from all lives. Morgan arched her eyebrows. Everyone requires a safe place. Had the gods used theirs more effectively... They might still be with us. Never underestimate the power or necessity of a sanctuary. She waved us inside the circle. I joined her, and a surprising wave of pleasant warmth rolled through me. My shoulders loosened. It felt like I'd just received a massage. I was so relaxed. Not at all the reaction that I'd been expecting, considering that I was demon-touched, but perhaps that was a good thing. Maybe it meant that the light in me greatly outweighed the dark. So what did they do here? Eva asked, walking around the outskirts of the circle, occasionally placing her hand on one of the stones. She didn't seem negatively affected either. They hid from the royals of hell, their greatest adversaries. Their own kind turned dark. Morgan made a gesture to encompass the circle. But within the stones, demons, even royals, cannot pass. Interesting, Eva said. So why are we here? Morgan stayed quiet for a second longer than normal, and suddenly I understood. You said you wanted to test our demon-touched mark. Like, you want to see if Ishtar will come here? Will we be safe in this circle? A tinkle of laughter left Morgan's ruby-red lips. <laughs> no, we won't be calling any demons today. However, we will be investigating demon magic. For that reason... I wish to be here, so that the gods would can cloak you. Eva and I exchanged long, confused glances. When she shrugged, I turned back to Morgan. Okay, we bite. What are you talking about? You two went to hell, correct? We nodded. No one who has gone to hell has ever returned unchanged. And though I cannot provide evidence that someone who is demon-touched might also have absorbed demon magic. I sense that this has happened to you, or rather, the dark magic within you has now been activated. 
Her eyes landed on Eva. I can sense it in you both, but particularly in you, Eva. However, I will need to study your scar closely to know. Eva's hands flew up to cover her mouth. What? I asked, nervous. The night we fought the demons, Eva whispered. Something happened that night to my magic. I didn't understand it at the time, but the color was off. A darker, murky kind of yellow. She shot a glance to one of the stones and shook her head. I thought it was because of the stressful situation, that I was manipulating my powers in a new way. Like how some people can make their magic colorless? Morgan nodded. A reasonable assumption. Did you experience something similar, Odette? Not that I can remember, but I was pretty occupied at the time. I was trying to sound level, non-judgmental, although inside, I was a little upset that Eva hadn't mentioned her magic acting strangely. We'd already gone over a lot about that night since arriving in the past. Had she kept it a secret because she was ashamed? Because she hadn't understood what had happened? Or did she not want me to know? What are we going to do if we have demon magic? Eva asked slowly, as if still unable to believe this was a possibility. Morgan perched on a stone. Learn to use it. I have a strong intuition that demon magic could be the thing you need to fight the royals on even ground. My lips parted. Until now, I hadn't had a clue what I was going to do to best Ishtar, who was a thousand times more powerful than me. Dark magic is simply the demon's magic, gifted to a witch or other type of magical as you saw for yourself with the shifter pack. Morgan continued, Most black witches who have made deals with the royal demons do not have their magic inside them. They carry it within trinkets, like the stones you mentioned. She paused, and her gaze leveled both of us. But you're not black witches. You're demon-touched. You have the royal's magic inside you. If you learn to control it properly, that makes you much more powerful. Why couldn't you use it to fight Ishtar or Lucifer? Perhaps even protect yourself from possession? Fear coiled in my stomach. Possession by a royal was one of my greatest fears. Morgan's totem had helped me fend off the possession before. But more than anything, I wanted to be able to defend myself. After all, my totem might be ripped from my neck at any second. I want to learn, I said firmly. Me too, Eva agreed. Then discovering what dark power you have and teaching Odette to time walk accurately will be our primary goals. Morgan rubbed her hands together. Whether from excitement or to fend off the chill, I wasn't sure. Luckily, they go together. While Merlin and I will do our best to help you practice, we can't do it all. We will seek teachers throughout time who know more about the dark side than us. Those who would understand how black witches might manipulate hellborn magics. Then you will use that knowledge to bring down the very creatures who gave them those powers. I blinked. Are you saying that we're going to travel through time and look for black witches? Like, starting now? Today I'd simply like to see if I'm right. Perhaps try to coax the darkness out of you. That's why we're here. Anything that happens in this circle is invisible to the creatures of hell. If you try to access your demon magic and it works... They'll never know. My stomach churned. Black magic was forbidden because to possess it, the witch had to make a deal with a royal demon, a barter for their soul. Or they had to be touched, often in malice, like Eva and me. As much as I didn't like the idea, there was no denying that dark magic was powerful, more powerful than even M&M. &M. We might be training with legends in the witching community, but individually, None of us had any hope of becoming as strong as the fallen gods who ruled hell. Unless we beat them at their own game, let's try it. I hoped I wouldn't regret agreeing. So far, my demon mark had brought only pain. But if there was even the slightest chance that it was hiding something to help us defeat the demons in our time, it would be worth it. Morgan stood. Show me a mark again, Odette. I lifted my pant leg. My mentor squatted down and began examining the mark that Ishtar had left. It didn't feel like anything, only like someone touching my ankle, but I knew it wasn't. Her power, bright fuchsia like mine, was pouring out of her as she analyzed the scar. I held my breath, watching and waiting as Morgan's eyebrows pulled together. 
After a couple of minutes, she let out a long, hmm. I felt ready to jump out of my skin in anticipation. Did you feel anything dark? Instead of answering, she stood and gestured for Eva to join us. When she did, Morgan turned to me. Place your hands on Eva's scar. I gave Eva a look, asking for permission. She nodded, and I gently placed my fingertips on her cheekbone. The scar tissue was cool to the touch, just like my demon touch mark. Usually, I only felt it when I was in the presence of demons, or those who called them their masters. When that happened, the scar seared hot. Close your eyes, my mentor instructed. I did so, well aware of the benefits of depriving myself of one sense so that the others, in this case my magical senses, might become more sensitive. Think of a time when you've seen Ishtar. Even better, if she was with Lucifer. My mind traveled back to the night Alex was kidnapped and taken to hell, before the eve of the spy game's third trial. After we'd emerged from hell, the Hellgate had broken open, spilling hundreds, if not thousands, of demons into the modern world. It was the only night I'd seen Lucifer, king of the demons. Even in the dark of night, his burning red skin had contrasted starkly with Ishtar's blue coloring. He'd had horns, wings that spanned at least ten feet, and a tail that flicked with pride. Ishtar was much easier for me to envision. I'd seen her up close and personal, and she sometimes haunted my dreams. In my mind, I placed them side by side and shuddered. Even in my vision, their eyes glowed with hate and malice. I nodded. I see them both. Now, focus on Eva's scar while you think of them. I did as Morgan instructed, concentrating harder than ever. When my heart began to thunder and my mind wanted to stray away from the devils, I pulled it back. Though it broke my heart to do so, I even ignored the trembling of my best friend beneath my fingertips. If I could access this power, it might change everything. And if a little discomfort on both our parts was necessary, then so be it. After what could have been hours, but was probably no longer than five minutes, a spark ignited at the end of my middle finger. I gasped and nearly pulled my finger away. Hone in on that, Morgan directed, her tone low. I did and clenched my eyes shut. The spark grew and seeped into my fingers. A sensation that I could only describe as thick, artery-clogging, and corrosive ran through my bloodstream. It brought with it a darkness, something that made my body vibrate and my jaw tighten. The foul sensation continued to trickle through me, and the urge to retract my hand grew with it. Keep it there, Morgan instructed. I complied, the sensation growing more intolerable by the second, and finally, it bloomed into something terrible and unstoppable, as if a freight train were tunneling through me. Like an alarm, my scar burned like I'd pressed an iron to it. I wrenched my hand away with a yelp. Eva's eyes were already open, full of terror and watching me. What is it? What's inside me? The same thing that's inside Odette, Morgan replied. Yours is simply a little stronger, easier to find. Why? My best friend asked her chin trembling. Why would my demon touch Mark be stronger? It's not like Lucifer is more powerful than Ishtar or vice versa. They're equals, both terrible. I understood why she said that. And yet, the idea that she wanted my dark power to be as strong as hers stung a little. Yes, they are equals. Morgan spoke more softly in response to Eva's fear. Yours is only stronger because you actually took in part of Lucifer's blood. When that succubus attacked you, and her acidic magic entered your bloodstream, you imbibed the actual blood of Lucifer. Morgan's eyes turned to me. I don't think you carry Ishtar's blood, only her intent to bend you to her will, and the magic that seeped into your skin when she tried to make that a reality. Morgan released a sigh. Oh, both are horrible. But they're what you will need to rid your world of the demons and free yourselves from Lucifer and Ishtar, her expression hardened. That is, if you're willing to unleash the darkness within you. Chapter 3
Eva and I agreed to try to access our black magic. And we did, a dozen times. But by the time we left the godswood, we were no closer to uncovering our demon magic than before. Eva seemed confused by our lack of success, which made sense if she really had uncovered her dark power before. Personally, I was both relieved and disappointed. The sooner I could figure this out and learn how to time walk by myself, the sooner we could get back to our time. Then again, knowing I had demon magic terrified me. Was I ready for such power? Did I want it? And if I let it loose, would it change me? I was still ruminating hours later as my crew walked the narrow village lane to the tavern. Eminem allowed Alex only a single stint of exercise daily, and he usually used it to get as far away from our little shack as possible. Whatever he wanted, the rest of us indulged. No one wanted a grumpy Alex on their hands. Plus, the tavern was fun, and one of the few places Morgan and Merlin would let us go unaccompanied. This was largely because they owned it, and as their guests, we were protected, especially after they made it clear that anyone who bugged us at the tavern would risk dire repercussions. So far, no one had stepped a toe out of line. In the time it took us to arrive at the tavern, Diana, Hunter, and Alex had noticed that Eva and I were strangely quiet, and they'd started to ask questions. Although I didn't want to admit that I had dark magic, even to myself, I finally broke down after a rosy-cheeked maiden brought us a round of ales. Morgan suspected that Eva and I have demon magic. Today she tested us for it. I took a huge swig of the ale and winced. If people thought cheap beer in the present sucked, they didn't know anything about ale in the past. It was disgusting, but considering my current state of mind, necessary. Are you freaking kidding me? Hunter said loudly, earning him a few strange looks from other patrons. Thank the universe we chose the back table. No matter how hard we tried, or how on point the clothes Eminem lent us were, we stood out in the past. Hunter twisted to Eva. Sugar, why didn't you tell me earlier? Eva shrugged. I'm still processing, and Odie didn't mention anything either, so I figured she wasn't ready. The others quieted, obviously not sure if they should push it. But Eva's words had a different effect on me. Her admission that she had been waiting for me to feel ready took the sting out of her keeping quiet about her possible use of black magic in London. Even though we were besties, bonded by being demon-touched, and shared practically everything, she was right. Sometimes, people just weren't ready to share, even oversharers like Eva. I needed to remember that, and cut her some major slack. Will you tell us the rest? Diana asked, cutting through the careful silence. Eva's hand traveled to her scar. Apparently, the magic seeped in when the demons touched us, but was activated after we went to hell. I have no idea how Morgan knew that. I suspect she's been studying up on hell. You know, to close the hell gate at one point or another. Alex's blue eyes had grown wider and wider as I spoke. So if you hadn't saved me, you wouldn't have dark magic? Don't blame yourself, I insisted. There's no way we'd have let you rot in hell. We were always going to come get you. I took another gulp of ale and set the heavy mug down with a thunk. Actually, Morgan thinks this might be a good thing. How so? Diana leaned forward. Out of all of us, she was the only one who seemed calm about this information. Because if we can harness demon magic, then we can fight the royals with power that rivals their own. Will Morgan and Merlin teach you? Hunter asked. Eva shifted uncomfortably and I gulped, sure this next part wouldn't go over well. I leaned in closer. We might be a fair distance from other patrons, and they were definitely a little intimidated by us, but they were also a curious crowd. We didn't need any eavesdroppers listening in on this conversation. We have to time walk again, I said, barely above a whisper, to a period when a black witch who mastered demon magic might have lived. Alex's spine stiffened. That's dangerous, foolish even. Black witches report to demons. I bit my lip. There was no denying that truth. If a witch had acquired black magic, they'd only done so by making a deal with a royal demon. What would stop them from turning us into their demon master? It's our best shot, Eva argued. Not only will it even the playing field, there's a chance that mastering black magic will keep the royals from possessing us. 
It's an interesting idea, Diana hummed. I'll be honest. It almost makes me wish that I was demon-touched. Don't say that, I retorted, annoyed by the flippant remark. I'm serious. You two are embarrassed and ashamed right now. But you have an actual shot at ending this. Diana shrugged. Call me power-hungry or whatever you want. But after what the demons and the dark court have done, I want a hand in ending them. Just like they've stolen the lives from so many others. Her eyes dimmed a little. Suddenly, I realized that while Diana might seem like she wanted glory and recognition, her true motivation went deeper. Her best friend had been one of our classmates killed by the devils. While I hadn't thought about Tabitha Good in a while, Diana probably remembered her every day. You're right, I conceded. We didn't ask for this, and shouldn't be ashamed, especially when this magic has the potential to help. I sucked in a breath, knowing that Alex was going to hate this next part. Which is why Morgan and I are leaving tomorrow. We're not sure for how long. She wants me to practice time walking before we take Eva. Maybe we'll even find a black witch willing to help us on one of these trips. Tomorrow? Predictably, Alex's jaw tightened. If he didn't cool it, he'd probably crack his teeth. I placed a hand over his. Yes, tomorrow. And there's no logical reason I wouldn't go. Or for anyone else to go with us. So, now that everyone is filled in, what do you say we stop talking shop and make the most of tonight? Chapter 4 I gripped the side of my head and groaned as I rose from the bed of hay that I shared with Alex. No one could argue that we hadn't made the most of last night. After Eva and I told the others about our demon magic, I joined my friends in ordering ale after ale. The drink helped dim our worry and temporarily allowed us to lose ourselves in the moment. Now, however, it made me feel like crap especially because its stench permeated the shack. My stomach heaved a little, and I wrinkled my nose. Get it together, Dane. Today's a big day. Although Diana had put a positive spin on our power, I was still nervous, terrified even, and not just over the idea of harnessing black magic. I'd time-walked once, practically by mistake. I hadn't known what the heck I was doing. Even though I knew Morgan would be at my side today, holding my hand every step of the way, time walking was dangerous. People had sustained serious injuries after poorly executing warping and time walking experiences, loss of limbs being some of the most severe. Still, I couldn't claim that I wasn't going to practice because I was hungover and scared. No matter what, I had to be the one to time walk my friends and myself back to the present. Morgan couldn't because as my ancestor, we couldn't occupy the same space in time in what would be her future. It sucked that time walking could only work one way where family lines were concerned. Glad that Diana, Hunter, and Eva had already left the shack. I got dressed quickly. Once I was done, I leaned over Alex and laid a gentle hand on his shoulder. Hey, babe, I'm leaving. His eyes blinked open, and his hand found mine, gripping it tight. Do you need anything before I go? There was no need to add that I wasn't sure when I'd be back. He already knew that it was hard to predict the exact moment a time walker would arrive in the future or past. I shuddered. What if I never got good at time walking and we returned to the present to find that a decade had passed? What sort of dystopia would our loved ones be living in? I don't need anything. Alex murmured and rose onto his elbows. Be careful. Listen to Morgan. Let her help you. Excuse me, I'm not the prideful one in this relationship. He breathed out a laugh. <laughs> I just want to make sure I'm not rubbing off on you. I kissed him and savored the heat between us. We hadn't had much alone time since arriving in the seventh century, and we were both missing it a lot. You are rubbing off on me, I replied as we broke apart, in a good way. I love you, sweets. I love you, too. I squeezed his hand and kissed him one more time before leaving. About time. A voice cut through me as I shut the shack's door, making me jump. I was thinking I'd have to send the chickens in to get you out of bed. I turned to find Morgan, her red hair glinting in the morning sun and blue eyes twinkling. Not for the first time, 
It struck me how much she looked more like Eva than me. Then, as my gaze traveled over her, I noticed something else. She was dressed differently than usual, in a drapey white dress that reminded me of a Greek goddess. One, the sun just came up. It can't be that late. And two, I gestured to the outfit. What on earth are you wearing? You like it, Morgan beamed. I got it at one of my recent time-walking trips. It's all the rage in Rome. Rome? My mouth dried up. Is that where we're going? I think it's a good start. Traveling back a couple more centuries will test your limits, see how far you can stretch into the past. Rome has the added benefit of being home to many great witches. Perhaps we can interview some with darker proclivities. I'd been hoping to try time-walking into the future, but Morgan knew best. I would do anything, she said, if it got me closer to my goals. Okay, do you have an extra one of those dresses? Currently, I was wearing a loose brown dress with a shawl wrapped around my shoulders to fend off the early morning chill. It wasn't extravagant, so I suspected that it wouldn't necessarily stand out where we were going, but it also didn't look a thing like Morgan's attire. My ancestor's lips curled up. Of course, it's lucky that these outfits are roomy. They'll easily accommodate your height. If we were traveling to a period with more fitted fashion, you'd have to make do with what you're wearing until we picked something else up. She led me into the sleeping space she shared with Merlin. It was the first time I'd been in their private area, which was little more than a bed on the ground and a pile of clothing. But oh, what clothing they had. It was clear that Morgan had been on many time-walking trips. She had everything from Greek goddess-style dresses to a gown I was sure would have fit in at Louis XIV's court at Versailles. Each fabulous find only made me miss my closet and all the beauties within it more. How do you get all these? I held up a sassy flapper gown with an eight-inch long fringe that I'd love to try on. You mean how do I pay for them? I nodded. m and weren't poor. But judging by the styles of dress, she'd have needed dozens of different currencies from different times to pay for them all. I conjure something up and sell it. Morgan shrugged. Once you know what people want, it's easy to get what you need to blend in. At this point, I've been time-walking for long enough that I have a collection of items from my favorite periods, so I can usually show up already in character. Wow. I breathed, unable to believe that I hadn't even considered this aspect of my power. Morgan's eyes twinkled at me. Perhaps when this whole demon debacle is behind you, you can use your new skill for a little fun. She handed me a dress almost identical to hers. Here's hoping. I stripped and put on a new outfit. Once everything was in place, Morgan appraised me. Perfect. Now let's go outside. Am I going to get to say goodbye to the others? She cocked her head. Goodbye? Why would you need to do that? I gulped. What if we're gone for a long time? She released a musical laugh. <laughs> oh, don't worry about that, dear. I'll make sure we return within a few hours. I blinked. Morgan was a talented time walker, but to be able to land somewhere with such precision was almost unheard of. Top time walkers could land within a day or two of when they desired. Less able ones might be weeks or months off. As a newbie, I'd likely be closer to the latter, something I really didn't want to think about at the moment. Hopefully, I can learn to be accurate like her. She led me away from the cottage to the outskirts of the woods that surrounded her home. I didn't spot my other friends or Merlin. Here we are. Morgan gestured down to a spot on the ground. A white powder, salt, had been laid on the earth to form a perfect circle. What's this for? A protection circle. A precaution in case we get split up. If you leave this circle, you'll still be tied to it, and will be able to reappear here more easily than if you time walked without it step inside. I did as she said, and she joined me. I was familiar with protection circles. At spellcasters, we sparred inside them. Those circles were mostly used to keep those outside the circles safe from stray weapons or spells. As a result, they generally felt a little stuffy and constricting. This one, however, felt different. Why is it so warm and cozy in here? I designed it suited to your preferences, or as best I could from what I know of you. Damn, Morgan was a badass with a capital B. I needed to soak up her experience and teachings. Will you show me how to do that later, after the time walking? She beamed at me. Of course, but 
but for now let's focus on our main goal. You know of the Colosseum, yes? I've been there, I replied, remembering the amazing family trip I'd taken with my parents before my senior year of high school. We'd traveled all around Italy, and even taken a private tour of the old gladiator ring. That's lucky, because that's where we're going. Envision it. Easy peasy. In my mind, I called up a memory of the iconic arena. It was so vivid, I could smell the dirt on the ground and sense the warm Roman sun on my skin as I walked in the ring. Now, open a wall pole. This was familiar to me, too, and I did it without issue. Very good. Morgan breathed softly. Now take that image and place yourself back in time. When you see the strands of time forming around you, grab the one I point out. I didn't have to do that before. Threads of time just spun around me and we moved through the warp hole. Morgan smiled and tapped my totem with her finger. That's because I was guiding you. You brought time into being around you, and I claimed the proper strand. Otherwise, who knew where you'd end up? I chewed on the inside of my cheek. I hadn't thought about that so deeply. When we'd first arrived here, we'd all been so happy to be safe and away from the demons. Details were forgotten. But now that I considered it, her explanation made so much sense. I hadn't even gone through the warp hole first. My friends had. So yes, obviously someone other than me had to have chosen the era we landed in, and they'd done so very purposely. Thank you. I'm sorry I didn't say that sooner. Morgan smiled. It was my pleasure. Now envision the Colosseum. I nodded and closed my eyes. I imagined myself in the ring, wearing this dress, and staring up at a crowd of cheering Romans. Someone resembling a leader. A Caesar, I supposed. Waved. The air around us grew hotter than it normally did when I made warp holes. Odette, open your eyes. I did as she said and gasped. All around us, Strands of time spun. Sounds came from them, mostly cheering, although I heard a couple guttural screams too. That one, Morgan said after squinting at a specific strand for a few seconds longer than the others. Take that one. As soon as you latch on, pull your warp hole toward us. I blinked, unsure how she knew which strand to grab. They were all colored differently and measured various lengths, but gave no indication as to the era they led to. Still, I trusted her, so I did as she said. My arms stretched out of the protective circle. I plucked the short, bright yellow strand of time out of the air. I was immediately hit with the sensation of oil being poured over my body, and then dirt being blown over the top of the oil coating me. Gross. Pull the wall pole into the protective circle, Morgan whispered, bringing me back to the task at hand. Calling the portal to me, I did as she said allowing its inky darkness to slip over my head, and the heat, followed by a snowstorm of cold, to wash over me. Both being veteran warpers, we slipped through the warp hole naturally. I grinned, barely daring to believe that time walking could be this effortless. Suddenly, the strand of time dissolved, taking with it the icky sensation of oil and dirt on my skin. Wow. I breathed as a beam of sunlight blinded me at the same time our feet touched the ground. I closed my eyes, waiting for the spots to vanish, and relishing the heat on my skin. Dust filled my nostrils, alongside a tangy scent that I couldn't quite place. The sounds of a cheering crowd hit my ear. My heart rate kicked up a notch. We made it. How did you know what strand to pull? I asked. A chuckle left her lips. It's part of your natural magic. Once you become more comfortable slipping through time, they'll start to call you. You'll figure it. She stopped speaking, and her hand tightened around my arm. Odette, back up slowly. I blinked my eyes open and shielded them with my hand. Morgan's face came into focus against the stark sunlight. Her eyes were wide as she guided me backward. What? Why? I blinked again, and the rest of the world came into focus. I had time walked us to Rome, into the Colosseum. The dead center of the Colosseum, complete with gladiators brandishing weapons and beasts prowling all around. And a few feet away, a lion, thin, with a bushy orange mane, stared us down as he crouched to pounce. Chapter 5
My blood pounded in my ears as we eased our way backward. With every step we took, the lion responded by creeping closer. His amber eyes trained on us. What are we going to do? I hissed. I glanced around the stadium. We'd drawn attention. Romans were screaming and pointing. Some even looked to be cheering for us. Or maybe the lion. There was no telling. The gladiators we were in the ring with didn't seem to have noticed our appearance. But they were fighting their own beasts. I'm going to try something. Don't run or cry out. Morgan whispered seconds before the dirt around us kicked up as if we were in the middle of a sandstorm. I choked on the whirlwind of sand and closed my eyes to protect them. The predator tracking us growled, presumably because the dirt was irritating him, too. I was about to ask Morgan what she was doing when her hand landed on mine, handing me something. A blade. She is a damn genius. She'd wanted to hide overt conjuring from the humans in the stands. Now they'd probably assume that we had them on our hips or in the folds of our dresses all along. In regards to magic, humans usually saw what they wanted to see. The dirt and sand fell to the ground, and I wiped my eyes clean to locate the lion. Morgan stood by my side, an even larger sword in her hand. She kept her gaze firmly on the big cat as she spoke. We can't use much magic, certainly not for fighting. If we do, the crowd will go crazy. Even the dirt cloud was risky. But you need time to figure out how to survive. This sort of thing can happen when you time walk. So how are you going to get us out of it? I gawked. Me? I had been about to ask why she hadn't already created a warp hole for us to slip through. This is a prime lesson. If you can't work under pressure and get yourself out of trouble that you've stepped into by time walking, you don't deserve to wield the power. Get us back home. Quickly. Did I think Morgan was a badass earlier? I actually meant crazy. Totally batshit crazy. The lion roared and took two more steps forward. I gripped my sword tighter. What about the time strands? I don't know which one to pick. Out of the corner of my eye, I caught her nod. When you get that far, I will choose one. But I won't call time for you. Her blue eyes darted to me for a second. Don't make this time-walking excursion your last. The lion leapt, and Morgan and I twirled apart, screams ripping from both of our throats. Walk fast, Odette, and only use magic to make the warp hole in call time. Her hand gestured to the crowd or they might drag us out of the arena and burn us alive. I gulped. Morgan was right. Being a witch may not always be a desirable prospect in the world I came from, but historically, it was deadly, just like the lion we were up against. Morgan charged the beast. She swiped at its face, and the big cat flinched backward and batted her with his paws. Morgan moved again, this time coming at it from the side and pushing the creature back. I took advantage of the space, lowering my sword and getting to work. The visualization was easy enough. I knew where I wanted to go, to the salt circle. The warp hole was easy too. As a black hole ringed with fuchsia spun into existence, screams and cries of astonishment flew up from the stands. One glance up told me that we had the arena's attention. I had to work fast. I pushed harder, searching for the threads of time. Men yelled close by, and I twisted my neck to find three gladiators running toward me, swords extended and scowls on their faces. Shit, were they coming to help, or because of the magic they'd seen? Something told me it was the latter. My warp hole dissipated. I darted to Morgan's side. We have company. I gestured to the gladiators. She swore beneath her breath. Start working again. As soon as you have the strands up, I'll assist, but not a moment sooner. I complied, straining through my fear to reopen the warp hole and call strands of time into existence. Out of the corner of my eye, I watched the lion swipe, his claws coming close to Morgan's arm. My terror surged, and the threads of time flitted away. Tears sprang to my eyes as I pushed again and again and again. Finally, after what felt like a decade, a single orange strand of time popped into existence. Is that it? Morgan gave it a glance. Keep trying. I shot a look back to where the men had been, 
and saw to my relief that another big cat, a lioness, had stopped their progress, buying me a few seconds. I pushed harder. Silver, pink, green, blue, and white strands popped into existence one after another. My eyes scanned them, not seeing any discernible difference. And because it was so loud in our immediate surroundings, I couldn't hear anything coming from them either. My teeth gnashed together. Morgan, look! She swiped at the lion, forcing him to back up. Once she had a little space, her attention snapped to me. It's not there. Dig deeper, or those men will end us. Another glance over my shoulder revealed that one of the gladiators had just slammed his sword into the side of the lioness. Her golden body dropped to the dirt, and they spared her a single victory cry before turning once more to me and Morgan. Their swords lifted and their eyes glinted as they stalked our way. My fists clenched so hard that my fingernails drew blood from my palms. I closed my eyes and pushed my magic harder than ever. Although I couldn't see them, I could feel more strands of time popping into existence. There was a faint difference between their energy and that of the warp hole. And then, as sure as I was that the sky was blue, the right one popped into existence. I opened my eyes and saw it shining, a deep green that reminded me of Hunter's magic. I have it. Morgan, I think I have it. Again, she swiped at the line with her sword and then twisted to look my way. A smile bloomed on her face. So you do. I'll be right there. A few more strokes of her weapon kept the predator at bay while she backed up. Once she was close enough, she grabbed my hand. The beast crouched, ready to pounce. Grab the strand and pull the wool pole all away, Morgan commanded. I grasped onto the hunter green strand of time and yanked the war pole over our heads just as the lion leapt through the air, his paws reaching out for us. Chapter 6 The scent of damp leaves and mud filled my nose as a chill rippled across the bare skin of my arms. We made it. I collapsed onto the ground. Salt dug painfully into my forearms. And then the shaking began. My entire body trembled like I was buried in snow. My teeth chattered so hard I feared they might crack. Even my ribs shook. It's okay, love. Morgan's hands landed on my arms. She rubbed me gently from shoulder to elbow, trying to calm the tremors that racked my body. We're back. We're safe. You did marvelously. I couldn't respond. Words wouldn't form. My limbs were out of control. My brain was barely functioning. All I could do was replay what had happened. The gladiator ring, the men coming for us, the goddamn lion that had nearly swiped my head off. How could Morgan say that I'd done well? I had time-walked us into the middle of a gladiator event. We'd almost died. Realizing that I wasn't able to speak, she helped me up and assisted me into a cottage. When she opened the doors, everyone else was at the table. Bowls of hearty stew, sprinkled liberally with fragrant thyme and rosemary, and accompanied by a loaf of fresh-baked bread, sat before them. The savory aromas made my mouth water, and suddenly, through the tremors, I became aware that my stomach was aching. When the others caught sight of us, they leapt up, and taking in my expression, Alex and Eva sprinted toward me. Odie, what happened? Alex asked. Are you cold? What's going on? Eva squeaked, her hands over her mouth. What's wrong with her? She's in shock. She needs to sit and eat to replenish her energy. The food will help ground her. Morgan gestured for them to move aside. Alex's lips flattened, but he listened, going to the table and pulling out a chair for me. Is this just from time walking? Diana asked, examining me from afar like I was some sort of scared animal. She traveled into the past. That in itself is enough to throw someone for a loop. Morgan agreed. In fact, the further you stray from your period of origin, the more time messes with you. And then we saw some unusual activities in our travels. A lion, I blurted. My voice was unnaturally loud and embarrassingly wobbly. We went back to the Roman Colosseum. We fought surrounded by gladiators and lions. We only came up against one lion, Morgan said. And like I said, love, you did well. 
Most people who time walk vomit or pass out on their first few times. You clearly have the stomach for it. And you were made cognizant. And mostly kept a cool head when those gladiators came after us. Gladiators came after you? Alex sucked in a long inhale. You need to start from the beginning. Morgan told the entire story, giving me what I felt was a bit too much credit. When she finished, my friends were staring at her, blinking. Her partner, however, burst into laughter. Morgan, you must be easier on the girl. Why not time walk back to a pleasant field or somewhere nice, stroll through a peaceful village, or even take her to a celebration? Why did you need to take her to the Colosseum of all places? My ancestor shrugged. To be fair, I assumed she would deposit us in the stands. Once again, I was reminded to assume nothing. However, it was a good moment of instruction. These things will happen when she time walks. And when they do, she needs to know how to walk under pressure. If she can time walk with gladiators at her back and a lion about to rip her face off, she can face the demons. And anything else. There was a tone of pride in her voice. Even though I didn't feel like I deserved it, what Morgan said was true. I had time walked. I'd gotten us there and back. No doubt Morgan could do it more quickly and smoothly, but she hadn't needed to. I turned to look at my mentor, hovering over my shoulder. People saw us use magic. Humans. Are we going to show up in history books? Again, Merlin laughed and his blue eyes crinkled at the corners into familiar lines. <laughs> if everything that supernaturals did showed up in history books, there wouldn't be any pages left for what the humans themselves accomplish. Still, I trailed off, nervous about the idea. He waved a weathered hand. More likely than not, nothing will come of it. But since much in the future is weighing on your abilities, I'll send word to a friend of mine. She's a powerful mind witch, capable of modifying memories. When she can stop by, Morgan will take a trip back to Rome. He winked at his paramour. In fact, maybe we'll all go. A girlish laugh tinkled from Morgan. I'm going to hold you to that. She took a seat next to Merlin. Hunter waved to Eva, beckoning her back to the table. She glanced at me, as if afraid that if she left my side, I'd fall apart. I'm okay, I assured her. My trembling had lessened substantially, and my breath was coming easier. Finish your meal. I'm going to eat too. My stomach gave me an audible growl, as if supporting that choice. Alex moved only to get me a bowl of stew and come sit at my side. When we were both settled, he eyed me. It was clearly traumatizing, but how do you feel about time traveling all by yourself? Proud, but not ready to go that far again yet. I spoke loud enough so Morgan would hear. In response, my ancestor chuckled. <laughs> Duly noted. However, you know better than anyone that there's no time to waste, love. We're going to get you some rest and try again tomorrow. Her hand fluttered to land on Merlin's arm as her eyes pierced me. But yes, next time we'll travel to a safer era. We'll practice only time walking for the first few days, making sure we cover as many variables as we can. The legendary witch paused, her gaze shifting between Eva and me. And when you're ready, we'll take a much more important trip. Chapter 7 Over the next five days, I practiced time walking to a dozen periods in human history. Ultimately, none of the others were as terrifying or jarring as our trip to ancient Rome. Thank the universe for that. But safe, I think not. Safer, maybe. But not safe. Morgan and I had walked the streets of Paris right before the French Revolution broke out. The tension in the air had been undeniable and the resentment and dissent burned in the eyes of everyone I passed. In another era, we popped in and out of shops, where everyone was gossiping about an invention by a man named Gutenberg. Some hated the printing press that would revolutionize the world and were vocal about it. Others saw only opportunity. During my favorite trip, we visited England under the reign of Queen Elizabeth I. 
While there, we snacked on the candied violets the queen loved and rubbed shoulders with the likes of Shakespeare, Sir Walter Raleigh, and, to my great delight, the renowned witch and seer, Ursula Shipton. Along the way, we picked up outfits that would fit Eva's petite frame in case we returned. Additionally, everywhere we went, Morgan searched for a black witch, and once, we actually found one. Unfortunately, she wasn't very powerful, which was a letdown. After speaking with Mother Shipton, who suggested a few strong black witches she'd seen in her visions, we arrived back at M&M's cottage to drop off the outfits we'd purchased. We stayed the night, and I soaked up every moment with my friends, telling them of my journeys, while Morgan conferred with Merlin as to where we should go next. Everyone went to bed that night with a belly full of stew, happy to be together. But when I woke the next day, my time-walking mentor had disappeared. Where's Morgan? I asked Merlin, who sat at the table, poring over a book with Alex. The famed wizard had recently deemed my boyfriend strong enough to leave our group shack. Alex was taking full advantage of the privilege, rising early and soaking up every ounce of knowledge with Merlin. My love awoke at dawn and said only that she was going exploring. Merlin replied, looking totally unbothered. Exploring? Here? Or elsewhere? Merlin chuckled. <laughs> you have the measure of her. I expect she's time walking alone. Oh, okay. I tried to keep the dejection from my tone and failed. Merlin's face softened. Morgan is not the most patient of witches. Truth be told, it is one of her few flaws. If I had to guess, I'd say that she went alone so that she might find a black witch to train you sooner. My lips twisted. While that should have made me happy because it indicated that she understood how important it was that I left soon, her taking matters into her own hands stung. Had I been slowing her down? I still wasn't a pro at distinguishing the strands of time, but I was getting better. Or so I'd thought. Maybe she just wanted to get rid of us? Have her life in cottage back? Don't take it personally, sweets, Alex said, reading my mind. Morgan knows that others are depending on us. She wants to help, and there are a lot of black witches throughout history to appraise. That's no joke, Diana said as she breezed into the room. My mother used to be obsessed with researching black witches. She said it helped her understand the enemy better. They were both right. I was being too prideful, which, considering everything we'd be up against soon, wasn't just dumb. It was dangerous. I hope she returns soon. I said finally. Alex patted the seat next to him, and I joined the guys at the table. My eyes landed on the tome laid out on the scarred and weathered wood. The book was new, the leather scent strong, the handwriting on the pages was fresh, and the painted illustrations bright with natural pigments. All of Eminem's books, whether from the past, their time, or the future, were works of art. Many were also usually extremely hard to read, Personally, I'd take typed text any day. Diana and Alex, however, seemed to enjoy and even have a knack for reading the older texts with archaic, loopy scripts. What are you studying? This is an old book of spells, Morgan's paramour replied, some of which I plan on teaching you lot today. I peered at the page. Do we know any of them already? None that I've come across, Alex said excitedly. Merlin asked me to review them with him and pick ones I thought would be beneficial against the demons. So far, I found at least a dozen that could be helpful. Hmm. I hummed. But we have a few spells that work against demons. Nex for lesser demons. More Sultimus for greater demons and royals. Why do we need more? Not everyone will be able to command a sacred enchantment like more Sultimus. Merlin reminded me. Of course... They might not be able to use these spells either, but you should not assume that. Give them the tools to try. Pass on this knowledge. Spread it to those who fight with you. That made sense. Diana glanced at the page. The words look so strange. Certainly not Latin-based, like most of the spells we know. What culture are they from? These are from the Druids. Translated, this means to seal wings. He pointed to another that I could barely read because of the script. This is to freeze, and the last one is to dissolve acid. 
Merlin explained. Dissolve acid? That would be useful against succubi who spewed the stuff. Merlin smiled at me as if he knew what I was thinking. Each is helpful in their own way, and yes, they are tailored to specific demons, as druids fought them often. It's said that their spells are passed down from the old gods. They're powerful and so ancient and forgotten that your enemy will not anticipate them. Are they ether-based? Diana asked. No, Merlin replied. These are for witches. Not rare fae or godlings. Even in this time, godlings are rare, and as the devils hunt them viciously, they grow more rare by the day. His eyes dimmed a little at the idea of a hunted magical race. I didn't want to tell him that in my timeline, godlings were long extinct. The old gods could be cruel, but when they gifted knowledge, they were sensible. My spine straightened. I'd never thought much about the old gods. Here, however, they seemed to pop up in conversation often. The druids were like the old gods' priests and priestesses, right? I asked. In a way, Merlin answered. They were the priests and priestesses in this area. Other parts of the world had spiritual leaders that went by different names. Many existed before the druids. When did the gods live, or whatever you would call their existence? I qualified, unsure whether something made of ether, the fifth and most powerful element, could truly live. Did they travel? You know, like spreading the word? Merlin's blue eyes twinkled reminding me strongly of my man when he was talking about something he found intriguing. It seemed this was a subject of interest. They are timeless, limitless, and boundless. They transmuted endlessly. Some, as you know, into royal demons, while others became new versions of themselves. For instance, the old gods were revered in ancient Egypt, then Greece, and Rome. Often, devotees merely called the same deities different names, that trend continued as other cultures progressed. Our own magical ancestor, the line from where the first witch kings and queens originally received their power, stemmed from a magic goddess. Isis, Hecate, and many lesser-known goddesses are all one and the same. So someone like Odin was also Zeus? Diana's eyebrows pulled together. I was glad I wasn't the only one who was working this out. Correct. Merlin smiled at her, and the corners of his eyes crinkled into his familiar smile lines, deepening them. And after he was Zeus, his followers called him another name, and another and another, as humans explored and settled the world. God formerly known as Zeus. I joked, which earned me a confused look from our teacher, but chuckles from the other two. Indeed. The wizard shrugged and glanced out the window before rising from the table. The daylight is upon us. We're our ever and hunter. In the shack, Diana replied. And I'm not going to get them. They were giggling and kissing when I left. I snorted. Hunter and Eva were less inhibited than me and Alex. We had only snuggled and kissed since coming here. But I knew full well they were taking advantage of their free time right now. Let's leave them be, Alex said wisely. They'll come out when they're ready. <laughs> Very well. Merlin said with a laugh. We won't begin anything new until they arrive, nor will we go far, just to the field on the side of the cottage. They can catch up later. Chapter 8 It took two hours, but Eva and Hunter finally emerged from the tiny shack, their lips swollen, and Eva's mop of red hair an absolute mess. I sniggered when I caught sight of them rushing up to meet us. Please tell me you remembered to leave the door cracked open. Eva stuck her tongue at me. We did. There will be no bow chicka wow wow smell when you go to bed tonight. Bow chicka what? Merlin asked, his bushy eyebrows arched in amusement. Uh, nothing, Eva said, her face turning red. She'd never been quiet about her and Hunter's sexcapades, but around Merlin and Morgan, she was more demure. It was like she was starstruck. What are you all doing? Where's Morgan? We think she's searching for black witches. I pointed to the book Merlin had brought out and set in the grass. And we are learning druid spells. Eva's eyes lit up. 
Cool, are any of them working? Uh, I shrugged. They'd worked for Merlin, but the rest of us hadn't experienced success yet. Merlin leapt into the conversation, explaining what he'd told us earlier, and then listing the spells we'd tried. Once he had filled them in, he tilted his head. And now that you're here, Evadir, I'd like to test something I've been considering. Would you mind? Oh, sure, Eva said, approaching where our mentor knelt by the book. Merlin gave her a bright smile and began flipping through the pages. When he paused, the illustration on the page caught my eye. A creature that resembled a wraith, a lesser demon with wrinkled gray skin and a hundred rows of shark-like teeth, stared back at me. Except, somehow, this guy was even more hideous than the wraiths I'd seen in real life. He had a serpentine tongue that protruded a foot out of his mouth, and claws as long as my hand that seemed to emit some type of magic. What is that? Alex asked, his brow furrowing. That is one of the first forms of demons, Merlin told him. They no longer exist in this time period, nor in yours, I suppose. They were absolutely deadly and terrifying, a boon for the royals. Unfortunately for them, they also had the bad habit of devouring each other. If they don't exist, why are we looking at this illustration? Diana prompted, ever the one to get down to business. Merlin pointed to the page. Do you see they possess magic? We all nodded. That's not just black magic. It's said that these demons were once witches who made deals with the royals, and once the witches had received what they wanted from the demons, this is what they became. It was ideal for the royals because they gained a new soldier with an inherent grasp of magic, no matter how temporary their existence. However, in their new bodily form, spells had to be modified. His blue eyes traveled to Eva's scar. These altered spells became even more deadly to all sorts of demons, but only those who bore a demon-touched mark or had been turned into a demon, like the one depicted here, could manage them. Since you said that you are the only two demon-touched witches in centuries, I doubt a soul in your world remembers that spells of this nature existed. His gaze dropped to the page. Alas, there is only a single spell in this book for witches like you. However, it seems particularly useful for defense. Are you saying that you want Odie and me to try out the spell? Eva murmured. Merlin nodded. The simple motion tied my gut into knots. I'd known for over a week that I'd have to contend with the black magic running through me, but time-walking practice had pushed that chore to the back of my mind. I hadn't expected to have to try today. And yet, if Merlin was right, and the spell concocted by the witches turned demons gave us more tools to fight our foes, then we needed to try, particularly if the black witch we sought out turned on us. Morgan was seeking out someone powerful enough to teach us how to guard our minds. If they betrayed us, we would need protection sooner than we thought. And if this spell was as old and little known as Merlin claimed, it was ideal. Let's do it, I said, or at least try to make our black magic appear. If anything, this could give us a head start for when Morgan finds a witch to tutor us. Eva nodded slowly, hesitation written all over her face. Merlin nodded and picked up the book. Very well. Let us move to the God's Wood. You'll be safe from alerting any nearby demons to your presence. He turned to the others. You three come with us. Everyone fell in line, tromping through the woods. The walk was faster this time, probably because I was dreading what I'd agreed to do. When we arrived at the edge of the God's Wood, Merlin pointed to a small clearing outside the stones. Alex, Diana, and Hunter continue practicing the druid spells we've been working on over there. I'd suggest working with the freezing one. It's the simplest. When you get one to work, move on to the wing sealing spell. Many demons have wings, so it could be of great use. When? Don't you mean if? Diana muttered, clearly bitter that she hadn't nailed the druid spells yet. You will master them eventually, Merlin assured her. The magic of the old gods is difficult. It deals with a more removed part of yourself, something that magicals of your time have not had access to for many generations. But they can do it still, 
and the more tools you have to fight the devils, the better off you will be. Alex Hunter and Diana nodded and split off to work. When they were gone, we stepped into the God's Wood. Unlike the last time, a strange sensation rippled over my skin as I entered the Sanctuary of Stones. Not a chill, per se, more like cold water running slowly over my skin. I paused and turned to face my best friend. Eva's blue eyes were wide as they met mine. Did you feel that, too? Yeah, that's new. Merlin grinned. You have not accessed your demon magic yet, but it appears that Morgan is right. It's been awoken by you seeking it out. That is a good sign for this experiment. And the godswood reacted to our demon magic? I asked, still confused. Shouldn't it throw us out or something? Merlin shrugged. No one knows. But it didn't, and that's all that matters. For now, you're safe in here. He faced Eva. I'd like you to start with this. He turned the page so we weren't looking at the illustration of the ugly demon any longer, but an almost blank page with two paragraphs on it. His finger landed on a word. Read this. I joined Eva in squinting at the annoying Luby text. Bind a demon's power? How does that differ from the Religo spell? It says here. Merlin pointed further down the page. Using this black magic spell will not bind the demon to an object. Say a lamp for an afrit. That is what Religo is for. This spell binds the demon's powers within the creature. Makes them easier to kill, I suspect. I bit my lip. Does this apply to the royals? Disarming Ishtar, Lucifer, Zaphin, and the Furies would give us a huge advantage in the fight to come. I'm not sure. But it's in this book for a reason, Merlin replied. Unfortunately, we have no demon around to test it on. But that is not necessary. For right now, I simply want to see if this spell, which was cultivated for a melding of witching and demon magic, will help draw out your black powers. Eva gulped. Okay, I'll go first. My best friend stepped forward to get a better look at the page. She mouthed the awkward word and then moved away, turning so that her body faced the expanse of greenery before us. My palms began to sweat as I watched her and wondered if this would really work. Eva held out her hands. They were trembling. Silently, I sent strong vibes to my friend. Imagine one of the creatures before you, my dear, Merlin prompted. It might help draw the dark powers out. When you're ready, try the spell. Eva's eyes narrowed. Edo Erasicus, her voice wobbled. As it had the day before, sunshine yellow magic appeared and fizzled, doing nothing. Eva scowled and spoke the word again, louder this time. Once more, her yellow magic made an appearance before quickly disappearing. She threw her hands up, already frustrated. I pressed my lips together. It wasn't like Eva to lose her cool so quickly, but I understood why it was happening. This seemed like an accessible baby step. If we couldn't do this, would we be able to access the dark power at all? Let me try, I said, wanting to give my friend a moment to collect herself. Stepping away from Merlin and Eva, I inhaled deeply. You can do this. An image of a wraith popped into my mind, but I shook it away and envisioned Ishtar. If I was going to access demon magic, might as well go big, right? Staring into the green woods, I could practically see her standing before me, smiling a dangerous smile, her blue wings spread, and her horns glinting in the sunlight. I shuddered, and surprisingly, my ankle began to burn. I cocked my head. That had never happened when I'd thought of Ishtar before. Digging deeper, I added detail to the vision. Spirals on her horns claws, and even the black jewelry and crown I'd seen her wear. With each detail added, she grew more real, more ominous, and my scar burned hotter. I extended my hands. Edo Arazicus. Fuchsia magic flew from my palms, but like Eva's magic, it fizzled out and disappeared. I dropped my hands, and was turning to tell Eva and Merlin about my scar burning when I noticed my best friend was clutching her face wincing. What's wrong? I asked. I don't know. She replied. When you worked your magic, my scar seared. It didn't do that when I spoke the incantation. My spine straightened, and an idea washed over me. 
What demon did you envision when you cast the spell? Eva arched a brow. The succubus? You know the one. I did. The biatch who scarred my friend's beautiful face. You should try the incantation again, I suggested. But this time, envision Lucifer. I paused, because I knew she wouldn't be comfortable with the next bit. And touch my scar when you do it. Eva jerked back as if I'd struck her. But why? What if I hurt you? Then it hurts. I shrugged. Can't be worse than when Ishtar branded me. Merlin inched closer. I understand what Odette is getting at. It's a clever workaround. This would be easier for both of you if you were confronted by an actual demon and could feel their darkness closing in. Perhaps touching the other scar while envisioning your greatest enemy will bring the dark magic to the surface. He turned his gaze on me. But Eva is correct. You may well be injured. Or perhaps, because you possess demon magic, the spell could work on you, bind your powers. Are you willing to take that chance? I hadn't considered that. Would it only bind my demon magic? Or my witch powers, too? There's no way to know, Merlin replied. I chewed on my bottom lip. Was I going to return to a state in which my powers were useless? Immediately, an answer presented itself. Alex had unbound me once. I was sure he could do it again. As for the pain, that was worth it. We really need this insurance against the Black Witch. I nodded. I'm willing. Then you two should try, Merlin said. Eva held my gaze for a long second. If you're sure. Positive. I hiked up my pant leg, and my friend crouched. The sensation had died down, but when Eva's fingers landed on my scar, it flared up again. She gasped and glanced up at me. I was glad that I hadn't let the pain show in my face. I'm fine, I told her. She gulped and held one hand out in front of her. Merlin and I waited, me holding my breath for any pain to come. Finally, after what felt like days, Eva spoke. Edo Razakus. I gritted my teeth as a searing pain shot up my leg. Eva let out a yelp and yanked her hand from my scar to cover her mark, which apparently had reacted too, but instinctively or not, she kept her other hand out in front of her, and black smoke was trickling from her fingertips. I gasped. Eva, look! I pointed to the smoke, which wasn't going anywhere, though it certainly wouldn't have been strong enough to take on a demon. But it was there, irrefutably proving that she could work with the dark magic inside of her, command it even. Now, I needed to learn how to do the same. Chapter 9 After we began using our scars as launching points, our demon magic started flowing. A little. We spent the hours practicing the demon spell in the book, trying to get it to spring from our hands like our own magic. It never happened, and by the end of the day, I was wiped. Working with demon magic was far more draining than practicing with my witch power. Merlin hypothesized that it was because the demon power didn't belong to us. We'd harnessed it, yes, but we were basically using Lucifer and Ishtar's magic. As far as I was concerned, they'd given it to us, so they'd have to suck it up. After the dark magic drained us so much that only thin tendrils of smoke flew from our hands, we switched to practicing druid spells with the rest of our group. We trained like this for three long days before Morgan returned. She reappeared right in the center of her home, her arms so laden with dresses that she almost toppled over. Help, please, she cried, and everyone jumped up from what they'd been doing. I pulled a few of the garments off the top of the pile, revealing her smiling face. Pretty, aren't they? I glanced down at the deeply colored red and blue gowns, plush, velvety soft, and extremely intricate in their embellishments. Beautiful. Where are these from? You'll soon find out. Actually, that one's yours. She pointed to a crimson dress, the exact same color as Alex's magic, with tiny birds embroidered on the bodice. Morgan's eyes were shining in a way that I rarely saw when we time-walked together. Once again, a pang of hurt shot through me. We didn't time-walk for entertainment, but I was holding her back so much that she wasn't having any fun. I hope not. 
and this one is yours. Morgan plucked another gown from the stash and handed it to Eva. See if it fits. If not, I have something else that might work, but it might be a wee bit out of fashion. Welcome back, my love. Merlin sidled up to Morgan's side, and they kissed so deeply that I was compelled to glance away. When they were done, I broached the question burning inside me. So where are we going? Morgan gave me a sly smile. France, 17th century. I found the perfect black witch horrible and powerful. Mother Shipton believed she was demon-touched by request. After watching her for a while, I agree. I cocked my head. I hadn't heard Mother Shipton say anything about a demon-touched witch. Other than me, of course. She told me when you went to relieve yourself, Morgan said, reading my expression. She didn't want to frighten you with the prospect of a demon-touched witch, rather than just a black witch. They're quite a level up, after all. Uh, Eva's mouth was agape. Are we sure about seeking out a demon-touched witch who's loyal to the demons? They don't just communicate through things like demon stones. They have a direct connection. She pointed to her scar for emphasis. Morgan waved a hand nonchalantly. For the right amount of money, she'll help anyone. Who is she? Anyone we'd recognize? Her given name is Catherine Montvoisa, but she goes by Lavoisa, Morgan replied as she accepted a mug of ale from Merlin. You've got to be joking me. Diana barked out a laugh. She poisoned thousands of people at the French court and held black masses. Ah, uh, she is a baddie. Morgan clapped her hands together. I know. The fact that she hid her demon-touched nature is remarkable enough. Take in the events of her life and, well, I don't know of another witch like her. Morgan's gaze cut to me. Don't worry. I investigated her for a while to make sure that the royal demons weren't around. I never caught a whiff of them. I promise that Lavoisa is an ideal teacher. She probably considered herself a black witch long before she asked to be touched by a royal. She knows much of the darker side of magic. Equally important, she's motivated by money, which we will supply her heartily with. Eva and I shared a pointed look. Someone who poisoned a court and called a royal demon master didn't seem like an ideal candidate for anything. But in this case, the pickings were never going to be good. At least now that we could use a binding spell against anyone wielding demon power, Eva and I could defend ourselves if shit hit the fan, which, with us around, it probably would. After a few long seconds, Eva broke our stare. When do we leave? Morgan's lips curled up mischievously. Tomorrow. Preparing dinner that evening was a tense affair. Since Morgan had claimed that Eva and I were leaving in the morning, Hunter and Alex had become very protective. Other than when I needed to do my business in the woods, Alex hadn't left me alone for more than a second. And when the group gathered for our typical supper of pheasant stew and bread, he sat so close he was practically in my lap. I cleared my throat and gestured to the lack of space between our butts on the bench. Babe, I love you, but a little room, please? He glanced down and his cheeks reddened as he scooted over. Sorry. I laid a hand on his forearm. It's okay. I realize that you're worried, but we'll be with Morgan. And we know a black spell now. We can bind the witch if we need to make a quick getaway. Everything will be fine. That's what Eva says, too. Hunter sat across from us with two bowls of stew. Eva was just behind him, carrying her own bowl, heaping high in a basket of rolls. If I thought we ate a lot at Spellcasters, it was nothing compared to what we consumed here. Something about being out of our own time period, in addition to practicing magic, burned a crapload of calories. The food was excellent, although it didn't make me miss cuisine from my own era any less. I'd been dreaming of Hawaiian pizza fairly routinely since we arrived here. We need to trust the process, but I get it, cuz, Hunter acknowledged. It's hard to see them go. Exactly, Alex muttered. I don't like being separated from any of you, especially not by centuries. For sure, Hunter agreed, arching a brow. It's not like we can just run down the road to save you if something bad happens. Eva scoffed. Save us? What do we look like, damsels in distress? She kissed Hunter's forehead to soften her words. But Odie's right. I bet the binding spell can stop a demon-touched witch long enough for us to get out of there. 
And if Morgan is right and Lavoisin is amenable to teaching us, we'll learn even more life-changing magic, I added. The guys fell silent, probably because they knew what I was referring to and couldn't deny that I was right. The demon marks made me and Eva more powerful, gave us the ability to use stronger magic, but they also bound us to the royals. If they ever felt us return to the present, they could control us. Unless, of course, we figured out a way to sever or at least muffle that connection. Really, seeking out a woman who is probably the most horrible witch in history was our best chance. Don't eat anything she gives you, Diana said, sitting down with us. Merlin and Morgan were still in the kitchen area, flirting and chatting and watching a cauldron of love potion bubble over the fire. Morgan wanted to bring it as an offering to Lavoisa, or anyone else who might need to be bribed. She is rumored to have poisoned up to 2,500 people, Diana continued. I wouldn't trust her as far as I could throw her. Morgan has already rented a flat near the Poisoner Witch's home for us to stay in, I assured her. She says we'll get food from the market and eat it at the flat. We'll only be at Lavoisa's for lessons. Which hopefully won't take long. We need to get home. Alex let out a heavy breath. I wonder how long we've been gone anyway. I wondered that often too. Time walking was finicky. Particularly if you were a newbie who didn't have a lot of control yet. A few weeks might have passed here, but when I finally landed us back in our period of origin, it could be years in the future. The thought made my stomach churn. Or what's happened in our time? Diana piped up, ripping my musings off time walking. What's the world going to be like when we return? A silence fell over the table. No one could answer that question. Chapter 10 The next day, after saying our goodbyes, Eva, Morgan, and I time-walked to Paris, 1665, and I nearly got mowed down by a horse. Buddy me, the rider exclaimed as he reared the animal back, flustered by our sudden appearance. I, I was distracted, my sincerest apologies. No problem, I replied. When my words came out in French, I shot Morgan a grateful look. Before we'd left the cottage, she'd gifted me and Eva with dresses appropriate for the era, as well as translation talismans. The talismans were gold rings that would allow us to understand and speak any language. Thank the universe, I thought, rotating the ring on my finger as I watched people walking the streets, all of them speaking rapidly in antiquated French. My high school French would not have stood up well here. Where to? The apartment? I asked Morgan. Since we'd wanted to arrive at a very specific location and moment, she'd been the one to time walk us here. I assumed that was because she wanted to swing by the apartment she'd pre-rented to check that everything was fine. Follow me, she replied, and took off down the street. Eva and I followed. Even though I'd have liked to consider myself cool, calm, and collected after time walking a dozen times, I wasn't. And Eva was understandably worse at concealing her awe. Her mouth was hanging open so wide, I was sure a fly would soar in there at any moment. But honestly, who could blame her? There was just too much to see. Horses were everywhere, which, me being from the city, was both strange to witness and smelly. A mix of people from all walks of life milled around, and although I didn't know too much about this period, the classes were obvious by their state of dress. There seemed to be a lot of beggars, and just as many people trying to make a living by selling brooms they carried on their backs, or carting large buckets of water around for reasons I wasn't sure of. We passed by a woman on the other side of the street who, from her overly exposed bosom, I was sure was a prostitute trying to entice a finely dressed man in a crimson cape. The working classes seemed to stick to brown, black, and white clothing, with perhaps a pop of color in the form of laces or embroidery, on the other hand, the higher classes stood out in bright reds and blues, like our dresses. The men's outfits struck me as funny, billowing at the top with tights underneath. So unflattering. I was still stuck in observation mode when Morgan stopped before a door, and I nearly bowled her over. Do you watch where you're going? She smiled in amusement. Sorry, I breathed, and straightened my crimson skirt. There's just... 
a lot happening. Thank goodness we will be here for a few days so you can see some of it. Morgan fluffed up her voluminous red mane a little. Now get ready. Remember, Lavoisa thinks that I'm from this era, from the south of France. I'd like her to believe the same about you two, at least until I've set up the proper wards. We are at her place already? I squeaked. You've got this. You've got this. You've got this. I chanted the phrase in my head like a mantra. We are. Morgan replied. Gather your wits, loves. This woman is something else. She knocked, and footsteps sounded right away. When the door flew open, a stout, doe-faced woman was on the other side. She wore bright blue, indicating that her dress was costly. As she took us in, her hand landed on her hip, and her thin lips curled up in a crafty smile. I wasn't sure if you'd actually show. I repressed a shudder at her voice, oily with darkness. In fact, the longer she stood there, the more it became obvious to me that Lavoisa was unlike any other witch I'd known. Even without placing a finger on her, I could feel the evil wafting off her in a way that I couldn't discern on myself or Eva. I had a feeling this was because, unlike us, the poisoner had embraced her darkness. Just standing in her presence made my scar burn a little, and her voice grated like sandpaper running down my back. Evil to the core. We must be careful. I said I would return, and here we are. Morgan responded to the witch's remark and gestured behind her. Your pupils. Only if you pay half first, Lavoisa said. This is no ordinary black mass or plea for contraceptives. For this consultation, you pay half of what we discussed up front. Only then will I let you inside to negotiate specifics and discuss my additional fees. I would expect nothing less. Morgan reached into a bag she carried and pulled out a small gold amulet. I squinted at it, trying to discern the details of the piece. But Lavoisa's snarky expression vanished, and she grabbed for the trinket. Is it Roman? Of Juno's cult? Morgan nodded. Authentic in provenance, and imbued with magic from a powerful witch of that era. For the first time, Lavoisa looked impressed. The woman coming here for fertility healing will eat this up. Come in. We shall discuss what you need. I expected to be led into a shared hallway before reaching an apartment, so when the witch revealed that the entire building was her home, I was impressed. Business must be good. I gestured to an elaborate painting as we passed. Historically, homes were smaller than in modern day, particularly for people of lesser means. That Lavoisa had so much space to herself and was able to fill it with non-essentials like art spoke volumes about her talents as a businesswoman. It's why you've come to me, isn't it? Of course, I replied, reminding myself of our temporary cover. We were young women who wished to be trained by the witch so we might start similar businesses in Lyon and Marseille. We arrived at a large sitting room capable of entertaining at least 15 people. It was plush, too, a space filled with furniture and decor that I would expect to see in a royal household. Not only did the notorious poisoner make a good deal of money, I suspected that she wanted her wealthier patrons to feel at home here. Diana had informed me that much of the French court and aristocracy sought Lavoisa out for spells, specialized potions, abortions, contraceptives, and other dark deeds. Evisit. The witch gestured to a couch, on which we all sat. She took the seat across from us, a design that reminded me much of a throne. What do you wish for them to learn? Many things, Morgan replied. But first, I have a request. Lavoisa nodded. Do you mind if I supplement your ward with one of my own? My girls are coming to you in good faith, and I wish for them to be secure. The famed poisoner chuckled. <laughs> you are more skilled than most. As long as you do not damage those enchantments I have set up, you may do as you wish. Morgan stood and spread her hands. Fuchsia magic poured from them as easily as water from a pitcher, it flew about the living area, climbing the walls, obscuring the windows, sealing us safely in this space. I breathed a sigh of relief. Though Lavoisa was a famed witch, Morgan was certainly stronger. Whatever she'd done would ensure our safety. Now we can speak freely. 
Morgan took a seat and crossed her ankles. My girls have come here to be taught by you, although not exactly as I have requested. La Voisa arched a dark eyebrow. It's clear that you have bound your blood to darkness. Morgan's voice dropped low. And that you're powerful enough to control yourself after making such a deal. My girls are demon touched too. They wish to learn how to use the black magic within themselves and resist possession by the royals. Can you teach them? La Voice's eyes went straight to the windows, then the walls, trailing over everything. Morgan chuckled. <laughs> My ward is strong. Any listening devices the royal has put in here will not pick up my request. Ingenious, Lavoisa muttered as she stroked her chin. She studied Morgan for a few long minutes, occasionally darting her gaze between Eva and me. What did you say your name was again? Morgan? No surname? None that I wish to share. In the girls? Morgan gestured to me. I'm Claire, I said giving my middle name, just as we'd discussed. If Lavoisa turned on us, we didn't want her knowing Eva's and my true identities. That might make us easier to find in the future, and we didn't want the demons having a leg up. And I'm Nora, Eva said, using the other half of her full name, Eva Nora. I'm afraid that none of us have surnames, Morgan added, because it was clear that Lavoisa was about to pry further. Hmm... The poisoner pressed her lips together until they became white. What makes you think I have made a deal with a royal demon? History assures us of it, Morgan replied smoothly. You see, we are time walkers. We know of what you've done. All your powers. Only someone who made a deal with a devil could perform such acts. Time walkers. The voice has shot up. How should I proceed with my life, my business, I? Morgan held up a finger. I will not give you any hints as to your future, unless you teach Claire and Nora. The witch fell back into her seat, clearly astonished. After a moment, she began stroking her chin again. That information would be invaluable, but to defy a royal, that's the most dangerous thing one can do. For such a sacrifice, I will require much more than simply the tale of my future and the coin we discussed. Like a cloak to perform in? I have been investing in my home to attract a certain level of customer, but when I travel, I look less than appealing. I need something worthy of a queen. I wish to have it before the lessons. Is that all? La Voisa was quiet for a moment, clearly wondering how far she could push her luck. As if trying to temper the poisoner from being too greedy, Morgan crossed her thin arms over her chest. The black witch didn't bulk, only studied Morgan more carefully. When we're done, I will also require additional monetary compensation in the sum of a thousand livre and an act of magic from you. She pointed to Morgan. My ancestor eyed the poisoner which sternly as she considered the demand. For teaching my girls, and not betraying them, you shall have it all. Your future told, the livre, the cloak, and a single act of magic. Nothing more, nothing less. The poisoner rubbed her hands together just as the clock in her sitting room struck the hour. The intense glee in her face vanished, and she sprang up from her seat. Very well, we have a deal. For now, however, you must go. I have a client stopping by, one who will not appreciate being seen here. She rolled her eyes. It's merely a contraceptive call, as if half the ladies at the court don't use it. When should we return? The sooner the better. Lavoisa looked taken aback, perhaps surprised that Morgan could supply what she promised quickly. If you can get the cloak, we could start tonight. Or in two days' time. I have other engagements until then. They are sure to be bloody and drawn out. A shudder rolled through me as I recalled the black masses and sacrifices that Diana had informed me the poisoner performed. Morgan, however, kept a cool mask and rose. She motioned for us to do the same. We are going to get a cloak now. Do not tamper with my wards. I shall know if you do. 
we will return at sunset for their first lesson. You will either cancel your other appointments or schedule them around my girl's lessons. We are not paying so much just to wait around. The poisoner considered this for a moment before nodding. You make a valid point. I'm all yours. She gestured to the hall and walked us briskly to the door. I shall be ready here this evening. Once we were on the street, I grabbed Morgan's arm. You're such a badass. How did you know what to say? Since I'd known the legendary witch, I'd recognized her as charming, a woman who usually got what she wanted. But I hadn't expected La Voisa to agree to our terms so easily. It was like the poisoner had said. Betraying a royal demon was no joke. But by helping us learn to use their magic to protect ourselves, that was exactly what she was doing. When dealing with people from other times, particularly influential, powerful people, you must understand what they desire, and that stems from the world around them. When I left you in Merlin's care, I was already certain who I wanted you to learn from. I spent weeks studying La Voisa and the French court that she's entangled in. The woman wants power and recognition in her society, and those sorts of people always want one thing above all others. What's that? Eva asked, her blue eyes shining with excitement. Control. She asked for many things, but all of them can be used to gain control and power. However, most of all, she wishes to learn how she will meet her end. If she knows her future, she believes that she can control it, too. I tilted my head. I thought you said we can't inform others of that. That it throws things off? Morgan turned to me. We cannot tell those in our bloodline about how they will meet their ends. It is inadvisable to share that information with others, too. But in this case, it will not matter. The voice will meet her end the same way whether I tell her how or not. Her pride will dictate it. I let that settle as Morgan led us through the streets, pointing out shops of interest that we'd need to stop in for supplies later. We'd walked no more than ten minutes when she paused before another door and pulled a key out of her bag. Welcome to your home, at least in this era. Let's get settled in. Then we will go shopping for what your teacher requires. Chapter 11 The day flew by, and soon enough, we were back at Lavoisa's door, the cloak draped over my ancestor's arm. Eva squeezed my hand as Morgan knocked. Ready? Claire? I smiled at her reminder to use our false names. I think so. Nora, did you ever think we'd be doing something so crazy? Eva snorted. <laughs> You're joking, right? Pretty much every moment since our calling year has been one unbelievable thing after another. You're right, what was I thinking? Seeking lessons from a notorious murderer is mundane. I teased, just before Lavoisa opened the door. Her gaze landed on Morgan's face, but quickly flitted down to the cloak. Her eyes widened, and her lips parted in awe. That's my garment? Morgan handed it to her. The cape was crimson red, and embroidered with golden eagles, easily the most luxurious piece offered in this arrondissement of the city. That had been reflected by the price of 1,500 livres. I was sure that some people lived off less per year. And yet, Morgan had insisted upon this specific cloak. She'd even already gathered the money on her last trip by performing a bit of witchcraft for one of the wealthiest mademoiselles in Paris. I suspected that if I looked in the history books, they might tell me that the poisoner possessed this specific garment. The voice's hands ran over the velvet. I must say, when you make a promise, you deliver. Please come in. We shall get started. She led us into the same room as before, waving at the walls as she did so. Everything is still intact, but I must ask, will your wards hinder their ability to work with black magic? Morgan shook her head. I don't think so. But if we discover that they do, I will alter them. Very good. The voice gestured to a salt circle in front of the fireplace. First things first. Which of the royals gifted you with a demon-touched mark? 
I repressed a shudder at her use of the term gifted. Ishtar. Lucifer, Eva said, with no hint of waver in her voice. The witch's eyes widened. The fact she was impressed told me that her mark was not from the king or queen, but one of the three Furies, or Zaphin. Very good. This will work out well. It would be harder to teach you if you were all demon touched by the same royal. This is an ideal situation as it spreads the risk out a bit. Now, if you don't mind, please step into the circle. Why? I asked. One of the most basic rules of witchcraft was that you never stepped into someone's salt circle unless you knew what they intended to do with it. The voice wagged her finger in the air. Smart girl. Remain skeptical. She motioned down to the circle. I'm bound to Zephyr. Although Morgan's magic has, presumably, veiled you from the royals in this place, I felt it necessary to add more specific protection. The circle null Zaphin's reach into the home, a place where, according to our bond, he is welcome at all times. Why is it so small? Eva eyed the area that couldn't have been more than three feet in diameter. I can't very well make it too spacious now, can I? He would feel a larger null area and pay me a visit. Good point. Assured that what she said made sense and would only help to protect us, I stepped into the salt circle. Eva followed a moment later. We will get to the lessons, but first I need a bit more information. The voice positioned herself in front of us. In addition to learning black magic, you wish to out the influence of your lord and lady, or perhaps hide from them in whatever era you call home. Is that true? We nodded. Very well. I have done this before. Temporarily. It is not for the faint of heart. It also takes time to arrange, which is why I'm posing the question now. How familiar are you with spirit walking and talking? Familiar, but we can't do it ourselves, Ever replied. Have you ever called a spirit? Yes, the hair on my arms electrified at the memory. But we had a spirit worker there to guide us. Nora and I didn't manage that alone. Well, that is how you will keep the royal demons out of your head. We're going to resist being possessed by banishing a ghost? I asked. Lost? No, girl. La Voisa sounded like she wanted to roll her eyes at me and barely refrained. By inviting a ghost, specifically, one from a mind witch, into your head for protection. My heart began to pound. Back when Amethyst had been possessed by a ghost, I'd asked her if I was at risk, too. I distinctly recalled her answer. A ghost wouldn't want to possess me because I was naturally resistant to ghostly energies. It would be terrible for both parties involved, perhaps even kill me. I whirled to face Morgan. Is that safe? Her eyes were wide as she shook her head. To be honest, I'm not sure. It seems rather drastic. We live gossities. This is the royal demons we're talking about here. Did you expect the solution to your problem to be easy? The voice that threw up her hands. It's the only way I've found that works. And yes, it can be dangerous if a ghost possesses you, but this would not be a true possession, rather a union. You would invite the ghost of a mind witch into your body to live life as they once did. The vibrancy of feeling alive is a lure that most spirits can't resist. How? Eva asked, her voice shaky. I'm not sure of this specific incantation. I had to have a spirit worker perform the rite on me. But it has to do with blood. La Voisa spread her hands wide, as if that was a foregone conclusion. With ghosts it usually does. I nodded. When we'd banished Amethyst's ghost, he'd drunk my blood. So I could believe that. So all it takes is calling forth a mind witch's ghost and providing blood to create a bind? Morgan asked. If we learned the incantation, is there any way we can do it ourselves? Not involve a spirit worker? It was obvious to me that Morgan didn't want to let even more people in on who we were or our secrets. 
the Poisoner Witch was a substantial threat as it was. The voice shook her head. Absolutely not. They need a witch familiar with spirits to bind them. Once the spirit worker completes the binding, the mind witch's ghost will protect the girls by using the skills they had in life. If they're ghosts, how do they do that? Eva asked. Once the ghost is bound to you, it is reinvigorated by your magic. Essentially, it uses a bit of your own power and life force to do what it does best. With mind witches, that generally includes controlling or protecting minds. She paused, and her eyes narrowed briefly as if something frustrating had occurred to her. Also, there is one problem. One? I could think of a dozen potential issues. What's that? Morgan asked. I know a spirit talker who will do the deed for you. For a fee, of course. But time walking or traveling to other realms will loosen the ghost's bind inside of you. It may not last if you time walk more than once. The further you travel through the centuries, the looser the bind. Then you'd have to start the process all over again. I chewed on my lip. We'd totally be time walking more than once. Of course, we knew a spirit worker who could renew the bond should it break. But she was new, our age. Would Amethyst be up for such a thing? Or maybe we could ask her parents? Would this crazy scheme even work? I don't think we have much of a choice, Eva whispered to me. We need to get home, and we need to be undetectable when we do, particularly if we plan on using demon magic. I'm guessing that the royal we're connected to might sense someone using their power if they're in the same realm? She looked at Lavoisa. Yes, which is another reason why you'll be performing what I teach you in a protective circle. The witch crossed her arms over her chest, as if daring us to fight back on that. I loosed a sigh. <sighs> It looks like we need you to get hold of that mind witch tomorrow, if you can. Until then, I gestured down at the salt circle that I stood inside. Teach us everything about working with black magic. Chapter 12 The black tendrils of magic flew from my fingers to swirl around Lavoisa. She tried to bat it away, but unlike all my previous attempts, my power stayed the course, doing my bidding. It only took two days. Since we'd arrived in 17th century France, the voice that had been showing me and Eva various ways to work with our dark magic. For me, the first time I released it without a spell was the most difficult occurrence. From there, it had grown easier, although the effort still drained me a lot more than my natural magic. From the look on her face, our teacher hadn't expected such rapid advancement. I got the sense that it actually annoyed her, which, for some reason, probably because I knew what a terrible person she was, made me pretty happy. I grinned and bid the magic to advance on the demon-touched witch again, tickling at her arm. Enough, Lavoisa snapped. Clearly, you're quite skilled at bidding the shadows to do as you wish. The clock on her mantle chimed the hour, and her scowl lifted slightly. Ah. Once again, I have lost track of time. We need to move on anyhow. She waved for us to follow her. I stepped out of the salt circle and shuddered with relief. Being inside the poisoner's protective circle was uncomfortable, prickly, but we continued to practice within its confines because it was prudent. Should the royals be lurking nearby and sense our power, they would surely come check it out, and even Morgan claimed she wouldn't be a match for any of them. As far as I knew, she was right. Neither Morgan nor Merlin would be able to defeat a royal. If that were the case, they would have done so in their lifetimes. And I wouldn't be in this position, training for a war and risking the lives of those I loved. The best M&M could do was trap them in hell, and that experience was in their future, after the demons forced them to split up. Will you be going over spells for black witches? Morgan stood from her spot on the chaise, We've heard of such things. She was always careful not to mention too much, like that we already knew a black spell. I have never come across any, the voice has said. And besides, after a few more days of practicing with shadows, these two won't need spells. 
witching or otherwise. The shadows are more potent. As much as I wanted to argue her point, I had a feeling she was right. The shadows were scary strong, but I still liked the idea of using spells. They were more direct and less open to interpretation. The shadows, on the other hand, had strayed a couple of times and gone farther than I intended them to once. Each instance in which they exhibited their own will, no matter how slight, worried me. I would need to be very clear in my intention when I used them. Moving on, the poisoner pulled out a large blue book and opened it to a page in the middle. I watched as her fingers ran down the smudged and yellowed pages of what looked like a ledger. So what are we doing? I asked. This book holds the records of all the deceased witches in Paris, or at least those I know about. When death is a part of your business, it's good to know when people perish. From here, we can choose a suitable mind witch so that the spirit worker can call their ghost to help you. The black witch replied, There are so many, Eva murmured, eyeing the names on the page. Not all are mind witches, but that's to our benefit. The spirit worker I spoke with will be here at any moment to perform such a task. She will need to know who to call. My eyes bulged. I hadn't expected that to happen today. Truth be told, I'd have been content to wait a little longer before I invited some random ghost into my head. Who are you choosing? Where do we get to? Eva asked warily. The voice snorted. Ugh, you may choose, but as mind witches are rare, there aren't many options. Her finger tapped three names on the yellowed page. These deceased witches are the most trustworthy candidates and a strong with mind magic. If the spirit worker I called can get two of them to come, that would be ideal. Tell us a little more about the mind witches. What were they like in life? Morgan asked, probably noting the sweat trailing down my face and wanting to calm me. The poisoner did as she asked, relaying what she knew of the three witches, which wasn't more than the basics. One had been a baker who supplemented his income with mind magic. Another had actually lived at court as one of the queen's ladies-in-waiting. The last was a fortune teller. My best friend and I shared a long glance as Lavoisa detailed the third witch. It was clear that neither of us wanted the fortune teller in our heads. He'd not only dabbled in reading the future, but performed black masses. Even if Lavoisa claimed he was trustworthy, the similarities were too stark for us to trust such a ghost. How are we going to know if this works? Eva asked. It would be idiotic to call upon Lucifer or Ishtar to test it. By the darkness, of course it would, Lavoisa has spat. If you tried that, I wouldn't dare be at your side. I work for hire, but I don't want the king and queen of darkness knowing of my involvement. As you've mentioned about a million times, Eva muttered. The black witch's eyes narrowed. Well, luckily for you, I have a plan. I'm not the only servant of a royal in Paris right now. In fact, there are two witches who serve the same masters as yourselves. We don't serve them, I shot back. Obviously. The poisoner held up her hands. I misspoke. An honest error from a follower of darkness. Universe, give me strength. Please, continue, Morgan urged, although she too looked annoyed by the witch's declaration. Currently, there are two black witches at court. One follows Ishtar the other Lucifer. Both have learned to read others' minds from their masters and always carry the demon stones gifted by the royals. If you can keep them out of your mind, you should be able to do the same with Ishtar and Lucifer. Though I suspect that it will take more effort to keep the royals at bay? Morgan asked. There's no way to know for sure, Lavoisa said with a shrug. But I believe that you're right. I mulled that over. It wasn't an ideal situation, particularly as we'd be up against high-powered individuals in a court that respected them. Then again, nothing about this was really ideal, nor would it totally ensure our protection worked. I agreed with Morgan in that the royals would be stronger, much stronger. The true test would come when we faced Ishtar and Lucifer, and they tried to possess us, which was inevitable. Until then, 
our best hope was to trust that the vile woman in front of us was motivated by a passive payday. A knock came at the front door. That must be the spirit worker now. Make your choices. The voice has set the book down, still open to the same page, and went to get the door. Eva and I exchanged alarmed glances at having to make such an important choice so quickly. Do you want the baker or the court lady? I asked. The baker. Maybe he can instill some knowledge of how to make a good croissant while he's in there. I snorted as Lavoisa re-entered the room with a woman trailing behind her. The newcomer wore a long, olive-green dress done in a style simpler than what Lavoisa wore. The shawl around the woman's shoulders was white, just like her hair, and gauzy. Most reassuringly, her blue eyes twinkled kindly as she studied us. My shoulders loosened a little. Mademoiselles, this is Melanie Citron. One of the most experienced spirit walkers and duckers in Paris. This is Nora and Claire. The two wish to keep the royal demons from invading their heads. Understandably, Melanie replied, to which Lavoisa frowned, clearly in disagreement. Catherine has informed me that binding you to the ghosts of mind witches will keep evil from possessing you. I can do such a thing. But are you young ladies amenable to such a relationship? Eva and I nodded. Melanie arched an eyebrow. Are you sure? Yes, we are. I nodded to emphasize my reply. La Voisa told us that as long as it was mutual, the ghost wouldn't harm us. Is that right? It is. Melanie's gaze went to Eva. I wish there were another way, but I'm told there isn't, Eva admitted. So yes, I'm ready. The spirit worker gave us a small, understanding smile. Very well, then. Catherine tells me she has chosen three candidates. Who would you like me to call from the spirit realm first? Eva offered up the name of the baker, and Melanie nodded. Excellent choice. Claude is a recently departed soul. I've actually spoken with him in life. You might call us old friends. That would make him easier to find. I bit my lip and hoped she'd say the same about my choice. The ghost whisperer got to work, drawing a new salt circle specific to calling spirits, and set items in the circle. The setup looked very similar to the one Amethyst had created when we banished the ghost who had possessed her against her will. When Melanie was ready, she invited Eva into the circle. Then she pulled a small silver dagger from her boot and a silver bowl no larger than a half cup from the pocket of her dress. We must make a blood offering, not only to attract Claude's ghost, but to bind him to you. Her eyes ran over Lavoisa, who had been standing at the edge of the room, watching intently, and then slid back to Eva. You have been informed that this binding is not permanent, right? That the spirit may leave sooner than you wish, particularly if you time walk or move through realms? It was the first indication that Melanie recognized we weren't from this time. It was also a reassurance that while Lavoisa wasn't a good person, she had told us the truth. My shoulders relaxed a little more. Yes, Eva whispered. We're hoping that they'll stick around, but we have an idea what to do if they don't. Holy universe, I hoped it wouldn't come to that. We would have to time walk at least twice more. There was no getting around that. And as much confidence as I had in Amethyst and her family as spirit walkers and talkers, I only wanted to undergo this binding once. Very well, Melanie said. Remain standing right there. Cut your palm when I indicate. Allow some blood to drip into the bowl. And agree to the binding when asked. Otherwise, stay silent. That is all I require of you. Eva gulped audibly and gave a single nod. The spirit worker stepped up to the edge of the circle and held her hands in the air. Spirit world, hear my plea. I jumped as the air began crackling with electricity. Hazy violet light swirled out of Melanie's hands, so light and bright in comparison to the dimly lit room and dark magic we'd been working with for days. I request that Claude Faust return to this plane. I ask that he walk among the living once again. Melanie gestured to the dagger in Eva's hand. My friend sliced into her palm and allowed blood to drip into the bowl. An offering is waiting for you, Claude. Come, drink, come live once again. Crucilarva. 
violet magic soared all around the inside of the circle. It swirled like a vicious vortex, kicking up dust from the floor. I watched, mesmerized, as, a breath later, a diaphanous figure popped into existence in the circle and bowed to Eva. May I? He pointed to the bowl. Eva darted a cautious gaze at Melanie, who gave her a gentle nod. Yes. The ghost picked up the bowl and sniffed it, as if it were a fine wine. After one sip, he sighed. Ah, this is what it feels like to live again. So vibrant, so lovely. If you wish, you can experience it for longer. We have a barter in mind, Melanie offered. The young woman before you needs help keeping a royal demon out of her mind. She's sensitive to possession. From who? Claude asked, curious. Lucifer, Melanie replied, because Eva was keeping good on her word to remain silent, save for at the appropriate moments. The ghost's eyes widened. I see. Well, that is rather serious. What does he mean to you, mademoiselle? Once again, Eva glanced at the spirit worker. Tell him, Melanie whispered. He means to take over the world. This world, but centuries in the future. Claude gasped. No. Yes, Eva whispered. They fell silent, each gazing into each other's eyes. The ghost seemed to be thinking. Finally, when it felt like someone had to say something or I'd bust, the ghost spoke. I have a son, and soon he will have a child. I have seen the babe growing in his wife's belly, though she does not know it yet. He took another sip of Eva's blood and shivered with delight. I do not know if my family line will continue for many centuries, but if there's any chance they will, I must do what I can to help. Yes, I will assist you. Protect your mind from infiltration as long as I am able to resist a call back to the spirit world. Eva breathed a sigh of relief. Thank you. The ghost turned to Melanie. I presume that you are capable of performing such a binding? She smiled at Claude. Yes, old friend. Just drink your fill of blood and enjoy. I'll do the rest. Claude did as she said neatly setting the cup down when he was finished. Melanie raised her hands to the ceiling. May two join as one until the living's work is done. May two join as one until the living's work is done. May two join as one until the living's work is done. A purple ball of light glowed in her hand, and she stretched it toward Eva. Garibstrom, Claude gasped and soared toward Eva, as if he was being sucked through a wind tunnel. When the ghost hit my friend, she let out a yelp and closed her eyes as she gripped her head. A heartbeat passed in silence. Two, then three. I drew in a breath, realizing that I'd quit breathing some time ago. And still Eva didn't move, didn't speak, didn't even open her eyes. My lips parted to ask a question, but Melanie held up a hand, stopping me. After seconds that stretched on like an eternity, she stepped toward Eva and placed her hand on her shoulder. The binding is now complete. Eva gasped and her eyes flew open. Whoa, what was that last bit that happened? Melanie nodded. Claude was trying to find a place to settle. For an incorporeal being, it is difficult to inhabit a restrictive form again. When he found a place, he let me know. He is safe, not obtrusive, and willing to serve and protect you from the royals. Eva's eyes shimmered with unshed tears. Thank you. You're welcome, my dear. It is the least I can do. I too have a family and hope my line will live through the centuries. She dropped her hand from Eva's shoulder and turned to me. And now it's your turn. I switched places with Eva in the circle. The process went exactly the same. And when my ghost, a woman named Louise, dressed in a fine gown and done up with a full face of makeup arrived, we had a little chat. It didn't take long before she too agreed to help. All I'd needed to mention was that she'd feel alive inside me, and Louise was ready to hop into my head. Melanie ran through the ritual, and I steadied myself for the moment the ghost would enter my head. When she did, I understood why Eva had been deadly silent. 
It was unlike anything I'd ever experienced, as if someone was rifling through the inside of my head, flitting about. I could even hear Louise laughing. It was loud and made me cringe. After a few moments of this, unease trickled through me. Like bugs walking on my arms and legs, she was taking a long time, much longer than Claude. Melanie began tapping her foot, and my instinct that Louise was taking her precious time solidified. Everything okay in there? I thought, before I could even stop to question if she could hear me. Of course, I'm looking through your memories. Louise called back, as if what she was doing was natural. Your gentleman friend is rather handsome, isn't he? So his hair is quite odd. So short. My throat tightened. I had even considered that the ghost in my head would be able to see my memories, but of course they would. Internally, I groaned. Sure, she was peeking at some of my most intimate moments, things I could barely tell Eva most of the time, but I didn't want to rock the boat and risk losing her protection. That, and Louise was from a different time. Maybe people were more up in each other's businesses in her era? Oh, Louise added a moment later. And your name isn't Claire? It's Odette! I can see that being bound to you will be very interesting indeed. Can you please not do that and settle in? I tried to keep my cool. Melanie needs to finish binding us. Oops, sorry. The ghost chirped. She ceased moving, and the feeling of spiders crawling on my skin ground to a halt. I sighed. She is nussy, isn't she? Melanie asked, raising an eyebrow that made me wonder if she heard the bit about my name. Are you sure about this one? I studied the spirit worker carefully. If Melanie had heard Louise's comment, it didn't seem like she'd say anything to the poisoner. I moved on and contemplated her question. While I wasn't at all sure about Louise, the only other option was too much like Lavoisa. I wouldn't be able to trust him at all. Yes. Very well, Melanie said, and extended her hand to bind the ghost to me. Chapter 13 I scratched the nape of my neck, trying to dispel the sense of discomfort creeping around within me. It had been hours since Melanie bound Louise and me, but I still hadn't gotten used to the sensation of a ghost sitting inside my head, moving, chattering, peeking into my private memories. I'd already come to the conclusion that Louise was less than an ideal guest. Eva, on the other hand, appeared at ease with Claude. Spin it, I told myself, and reached for something positive. At least we have a chance at keeping the royals from controlling us. Considering how much Melanie charged for so little time, I think I might have to contemplate a new business venture. La Voisa studied me as the carriage we'd hired to take us to the Louvre Palace came to a halt. Of course, that will be after... I see how well you take to the ghost. She shook her head, as if she actually cared. I don't want my clients in distress. If the experience isn't good, they won't pay. Apparently, I wasn't hiding my unease as well as I thought. Yeah, you okay? Eva placed her hand on mine. Fine. Just not used to her yet. I reassured my friend as I twisted to face her. How do I look? Like someone who would stroll around court? Perfect. Me? Your style's on point. I winked. We were both dressed to the nines and ready to search the Louvre Palace for the witches, who called Lucifer and Ishtar master. Our plan was to nudge them into thinking we were one of them. La Voisa was sure that they would want to check for themselves by infiltrating our minds. It still puzzled me that the royals would teach someone to do this, but I suspected it was so they'd have a presence within the powerful court, a say in what the King of France did. Truly, their motives didn't matter. As long as Eva and I could keep Monsieur Renard and Louise de la Valliere out of our minds, that was all that mattered to me. Remember, loves, Morgan said as the driver stepped off his platform to come open the door. Let me and La Voisa do most of the talking. At least, until we find Louise de la Valliere and Monsieur Renard. Just watch and pay attention to what's happening. If we're lucky... The witches will try to gain information on you before we even tell them who you are. Then you can practice without outing yourself. We nodded just as the carriage door opened, and a man extended his hand. 
Apologies for the rough journey, mademoiselle and madame. The streets are a mess. No apologies needed, I said, as I gave the young driver a winning smile. Thank you. We paid him and approached the palace. I'd been to the Louvre before, but in the era of the Sun King, what was now a world-renowned museum looked different. In the future, it was hard to visualize the grandness of the palace through all the tourists, but not now. The building itself looked brighter, cleaner. Most notably, however, was the lack of the glass pyramid that stood in front of the modern-day museum. In place of the art installation, people milled about in open space, gossiping and laughing, while soldiers stood dutifully. What are we going to do about all the guards? I couldn't imagine that we would be allowed to simply walk around a royal palace, particularly with King Louis XIV in residence. Won't they stop us? La voice had chuckled. <laughs> I've already made arrangements. One of my best clients, Madame Montespan, is vying to become the king's favored mistress. She lives nearby and spends much of her time at the palace as a lady in waiting to the queen. She's close to the queen and wants her husband? Eva's blue eyes widened. That's cold. Very backstabby. I agreed. Lavoisa laughed. <laughs> she will one day prevail, no doubt. The king is hardly known for his chastity. However, my client's biggest problem is not King Louis, but his favorite mistress of the moment, Louise de la Valliere. She is the very witch you seek, Nora. Right. Eva huffed out a breath. France really needs to come up with a new name to fall in love with. So many Louis and Louises. So what do you do for Madame Montespan? Black messies, poisons, even bushins. Lavoisa shook her head. The silly girl thinks after she becomes the favored mistress, she can entice his majesty to leave the queen. A most foolish idea. My methods are powerful, but the ties that bind nations and keep the peace are much stronger. She shrugged. I've told her such things, that she should be happy to grace the king's bed when he calls. But she won't listen. She claims every time she talks to the king, he seems just a bit more enamored with her. The poisoner spread her hands out in front of her. Perhaps he is. All I know is that each amulet, mass, and poison brings me more livre. Madame Montespa will ask about us, won't she? Eva inquired. The voice nodded. She is loquacious and curious. But it is easy enough to distract her with talk of something new that I'm whipping up. Any time I mention a poison or potion that could gain her the king's favor, she obsesses over it until I can provide it. And she will introduce us to these people who serve the demons? Morgan asked. Even the one she does not like? She won't like leading me to Madame La Valliere, but if I tell her that the king's favorite mistress owes Mademoiselle Nora money, there will be no issue. If there's any chance to undermine Louis' prized whore, Madame Montespa will introduce us happily. Morgan seemed placated, and we strode through the open courtyard, receiving a few surreptitious glances from a couple of the guards. I got the sense that Lavoisa's reputation preceded her. However, when a young woman approached, calling out the witch's name, the guards looked relieved that they hadn't stopped us. Madame Montvoisa, over here! A curvy, golden-haired woman waved as she picked up the skirt of her heavy dress to hurry over. I get your notes that you wish to speak? Indeed I do, Madame Montespa. Lavoisa said once the woman reached us reeking of rose oil so strong it made my nose twitch. I have a few new wares I thought you might like to hear about. The woman's eyes widened, and the flush on her cheeks deepened. Indeed, please come inside. We shall have some wine. Madame Montespan led us through the doors of the palace and down the hallways. With her guiding us, few glanced our way. The ones who did were accommodating rather than suspicious, and asked if we needed anything. We'd entered a more femininely decorated wing of the palace when Lavoisa's hand snaked around Madame Montespan's forearm. Actually, it the nice. Lavoisa switched to using her client's first name, a tactic she claimed made the woman think they were friends. Might I ask a favor first? 
Certainly, Catherine. Atenaïs used Lavoisa's first name in return, as her blonde eyebrows pulled together with interest. What can I do for you? I was hoping for an introduction to two people at court. One is Monsieur Renard. She paused, swallowing for dramatic effect. La Voisa wanted Madame Montespan to believe that she felt bad about asking her to introduce us to the king's favored mistress. She continued after a moment. This next one you may not like much, but my friend requires an introduction for very specific purposes. You see, Mademoiselle Nora's family, she gestured to Eva, has been requesting money from this particular woman. She is in their debt, and Mademoiselle Nora wishes to collect. The mistress nodded. Who is it, then? Louise de la Valliere. For the first time, Madame Montespan's lovely face soured. Eva stepped forward to play her part. We would be ever so grateful for the introduction, Madame Montespan. She does owe us quite a bit of money. The wannabe mistress cocked her head. How much? Five thousand livres. Madame Montespan's hand flew to her mouth. For shame. That is a fortune. Yes, Eva said. And she has been dodging payments for quite some time. I thought to bring it to the king. Atenaïs's eyes lit up as the dots connected. Oh, no. She should not be allowed to skate by. I shall make the introductions today. If things do not go your way, then I shall speak to the king for you. As you know, I have great influence with him. Lavoisa had figured that Madame Montespan would jump at the chance to make the other woman look bad. She had predicted correctly. Eva performed a small curtsy. My family would appreciate that very much. Madame Montespan's hands fell to her side. Well, if you'd like to get this done first, I can show you where Monsieur Renard is at this very moment. Lavoisa arched an eyebrow. How would you know that? Madame Montespan frowned. When he is not in direct service of the king, which he isn't right now, her tone soured even more, he is always in the library, reading. My spine straightened. If the Louvre's library was anything like a modern library, this could be perfect timing. A quiet, untroubled space for me to test my demon powers would be ideal. I held out hope as Madame Montespan led us through the halls of the palace. When she stopped before the door, I steeled myself. Once Monsieur Renard realized I had demon magic, he would want to investigate. I would have to be on my toes for the moment he tried to infiltrate my mind. Louise and I would only get a few chances to silence him before he drew attention. And then we'd have to find the king's mistress so Eva could undergo the same test. Madame Montespan opened the library door. If you don't mind, I'll wait out here. Monsieur Renard and I do not see eye to eye, but he will not mind you introducing yourselves. He's always in the chair in the far back right corner. Always. Lavoisa nodded and led the way through the palace library. It was a grand room, and yet, if one could look past all the gold decor and garish cherubs, the library was still just a library. It reeked of old books and had a calming, erudite air about it. Monsieur Renard was in the exact spot Madame Montespan had said he would be, with his nose stuck in a book. He barely glanced up as we approached, and only gave us his attention a full ten seconds after we'd stopped before him. Yes, madame and mademoiselles, his voice was pompous, exactly how one would describe a stereotypical snooty French voice. Good day, Monsieur Renard, Lavoisa said. We have a few questions for you. I readied myself. Lavoisa had promised she would get to the point. The quicker we worked, the faster we could leave the palace. And what would they be? He asked dully as his eyes dropped back to his book. We are wondering what exactly you can do with that demon stone in your pocket. Lavoisa pointed to his right pocket. The man's head snapped up from the page he'd been reading. The poisoner witch had hit a nerve. I don't know exactly what you mean, he said coolly. But my skin had already begun to prickle as Monsieur Renard called his power to him. 
he was going to try to read my mind. Knowing I needed him to attempt this only on me, I stepped forward. She knows because he made it obvious. I sneered, as if he couldn't disgust me more. Gallivanting around court, giving his majesty exactly what he wants before he even wants it. You might have bound yourself to a dark royal, but you weren't careful about it. Your rise to power was too sudden. I wonder what the king would say if we told him of our suspicions. The man shot up and pointed at me. Who are you? Wouldn't you like to know? I raised a palm and allowed a few inky black tendrils of demon magic to show. Monsieur Renard's hand flew to his mouth. Who? He decided against asking and acted exactly as we'd predicted. A presence enveloped my head, oily and sticky. Monsieur Renard was trying to break in. I allowed him to get a good grip, to believe that he would succeed, even to see who I was. Once he pulled up one of my memories of the future, I called Louise to heal. Get him out, I commanded. The mind witch yawned. We have an agreement, I yelled. Get him out, or you'll be back to the spirit world. There was a heavy sigh from the ghost. I can see this is going to be a lot more work than I believed. I was about to tell her she had no flipping idea how much work it would be when Louise flew into action and the oily, sticky sensation of Monsieur Renard trying to infiltrate my head ceased to exist. How dare you try to expel me, he cried and crashed backward into his chair with wild eyes. I shall call the guards. The voice had grabbed Monsieur Renard by the back of the neck and tipped a vial into his open mouth. The man collapsed back into the chair and began snoring. Well, Eva whispered, did you do it? I nodded. Once Louise got off her ass, it was easy. I asked her to kick him out, and she did. But before that, I felt his influence in my head. Of course, it will probably be harder with Ishtar, but still, it was so easy. The voice had chuckled. <laughs> do you think I went through all that work of seeking a spirit worker for nothing? I shrugged. She was right. There would have been no point in putting herself out there and opening her home to another witch she didn't know if this wouldn't work. Eva gestured to the man. How long is he going to stay like that? Our dark mentor's hands turned to the air lazily. Hours. He'll wake up with his stomach ache and have forgotten all about us when he finishes shitting his pants in a few days' time. I turned to Eva. Let's go find your lady and see if Claude performs as well. We made it to the door of the library and realized something was wrong. Madame Montespa was still out there, but she was speaking with someone. No, not speaking, yelling. The voice that held out her hand to stop us. Let me go first. We allowed her to pass and peek through the doors. When her head popped back into the library, she was beaming from ear to ear. Who is it? I asked. The voice's gaze locked on Eva. Just the person you're looking for, the king's favored mistress, fresh from his bed. The poisoner smirked, likely relishing the chaos on the other side of the door. I'll take care of it, Denise, while you test your ghost. This is cause for celebration. Morgan opened the door to our apartment with a flourish and twirled around with a smile. Each of our mind witches had protected me and Eva. Not only that, but Madame Montespa had been so embarrassed that we'd caught her arguing loudly with the notorious Louise de la Valliere that she'd claimed to have had an engagement that she'd forgotten. We left the palace with no one any the wiser as to what we'd done. Once we were in the carriage and trotting away from the palace, Lavoisa had admitted that she was impressed and unsure what other wisdom she could impart on us, which relieved me. We might be leaving soon. When you say celebration, does that mean champagne? Eva wiggled her eyebrows. Morgan shimmied her hips in a move that reminded me a lot of salsa and grinned. There's a charming little restaurant right around the corner. Lavoisa said that she wouldn't be able to teach us much more. I remarked. Should we leave soon? Actually, I wanted to ask you that. Morgan replied. Do you feel ready? Because if you do, we'll pay her tomorrow morning. Then, of course, I must perform whatever bit of magic she requires and hint at her future before we can leave. 
Her lips turned down in a slight frown. The monetary amount alone was staggering, but that Lavoisa also required magical payment and a hint as to what her future held gave Morgan a sour taste in her mouth. Thank you for being willing to do that for us. I said, I know it's a lot. Her hand twirled in the air. There's no need for thanks. The money is nothing to me. And there was little doubt that she'd recognize me as the elder and more powerful witch. Her requesting a favor was bound to happen. As long as I can perform magic, and it doesn't harm anyone, I'll do it gladly. She turned and began rummaging through the wardrobe for a new dress. Since arriving in Paris, she'd picked up a few of the latest pieces and some trinkets for Merlin. She'd also purchased a few skimpier outfits that I was sure were for him as well. Get dressed, loves, Morgan said as she pulled out a beautiful red frock. We'll begin with champagne down the street. After that, we shall see where beautiful Paris takes us. Chapter 14 I groaned as we walked to Lavoisa's home. The night before, Morgan had proclaimed we should celebrate. And celebrate we did. So hard. I would probably be sweating champagne from my pores for weeks to come. I couldn't wait to get home. Not only for the people, pizza, showers, and beds, but also for more moderate celebrations. The past was way too hardcore for me. Surprisingly, Morgan seemed completely unaffected, and she downed at least twice as much champagne as me. How do you look so bright-eyed and bushy-tailed? Eva asked, rubbing her temples. Morgan let out a laugh. You've seen the drinking tendencies of my time. It's part of our lifestyle. I nodded, knowing what she meant. We'd frequented the village taverns numerous times and seen the same people there over and over. Sometimes I wondered if they ever left. I was hoping it was some kind of spell or something, Eva admitted. Morgan's spine straightened. No, but if there's one of those in your time that does the trick, let me know. I could earn coin from that. I snorted. <laughs> if there was, we wouldn't look like a pair of hot messes right now. Morgan's eyebrows furrowed at the modern slang, but she decided not to question it. When we arrived at Lavoisa's home, my ancestor knocked, and the poisoner witch flung the door open with a flourish. I was wondering when you'd show up. Had a night out, did you? It was that obvious? We must look terrible. Indeed we did, Morgan said. Paris is a city for celebrating. So they say. The voice let out a bark of laughter and waved us inside. We followed her into the expansive sitting room where we'd taken all of our lessons. The familiar rush of Morgan's wards flitted over me as I crossed the threshold. I sighed as a warm cocoon gave some relief. The one for comfort. So you wouldn't let your nerves get the best of you during lessons, Morgan explained, noticing the reaction. Apparently you didn't need it before, but today it probably takes the edge off. Thank goodness, I muttered. The voice pointed to the salt circle, already drawn on the ground. Whoever wants to practice first, hop in. My ancestor stepped forward. Actually, we've only come to tell you that today will be our final day in Paris. Yesterday, you said you couldn't teach the girls much more. That's our cue to move on. The voice nodded, seeming unsurprised. I thought you'd say that. She collapsed onto the chaise. That just leaves the matter of my payment. From the bag Morgan wore against her hip, she pulled out a small pouch of coins, then another, and another. Five sat side by side by the time she was done. It's all there, count it if you will. The voice's eyes lit up like a Christmas tree as she took the pouches of Livra. No need. I trust that you're honest. My eyebrows furrowed. Her emphasis gave me pause. Did she think Eva and I were dishonest? Next, the magic, and then a bit about my future before you go. The voice leaned forward and placed her hands on her knees. I've thought long and hard about what I wished for most. What could you give me that I could not conjure or create for myself? It took a while before I realized what that was. The same things that brought you to my door. The voice's eyes slithered to latch onto me. Me? My blood froze. You want Morgan to give you me? 
The voice has scoffed. <laughs> I already have a daughter to care for, and she's enough work as it is. A sensation of relief was just settling over me when the witch's smile grew in a way that made my stomach sink. I am referring to time walking. Time walking? She wanted Morgan to give her time walking? I'd never heard of such a thing. When I shot a glance at my mentor, I was sure she hadn't either. Her ruby lips were pursed and her ginger eyebrows knitted together, as if she wasn't sure what to say. I cleared my throat. You want Morgan to give you the powers of time walking? I asked in an effort to clarify. Or you want her to time walk you somewhere? I'm aware that she cannot just transfer the skill. However, an amulet or a pendant of some sort imbued with the power to time walk should be achievable. The poisoner shrugged. That is what I want. Silence descended upon the room. Was that possible? My totem had allowed me to time walk, but that was only because Morgan had been controlling it, and I possessed the inherent magic. We were connected by blood and a destiny that Merlin had foreseen before the pair split. Surely it wouldn't work for someone like Lavoisa who had never revealed such a talent. After a prolonged pause, my ancestor spoke. I'm not sure I can create such a thing. I can spell pendants for many reasons. However, time walking is an innate skill and rather specific. How you alter time matters a lot. I'm not sure that enchanting any sort of object would allow you to explore the eras as you wish. The voice's lips pressed together until they turned white. Perhaps... I might be able to create one if you wanted to time walk to a specific place and time, Morgan offered, clearly trying to come to a happy medium. But many eras? I'm sure that's just not possible. The Black Witch shot up from her seat. You said I could have anything. Any magical favor, and now you tell me you will not give me what I want? I'm not saying I won't give it to you, Morgan corrected. I'm saying I can't. It's impossible. The voice's hands drifted to her hips, and for a moment, I thought her eyes would start shooting daggers at Morgan. After several long seconds, she dropped her hands and sneered. I'd hoped it wouldn't come to this, but as always, my master was right. Now I have no regrets whatsoever for telling him about you. She snapped her fingers. The room grew stiflingly hot, and the rotten stench of sulfur hit my nostrils. I backed up, my skin tingling at the change in atmosphere. A horned figure appeared in the salt circle. In my periphery, I caught Eva's flinch and knew what had caused it, as my scar had begun to burn dully too. Morgan threw herself in front of us. We had a deal. We did. And you couldn't give me what I wanted. You expect me to betray my master for a bit of coin, a cloak, and a slice of my future? The voice snorted. What good would that do? What good are you if you can't give the Prince of Darkness what he needs? I stifled a gasp as the Black Witch's plan became clear. She'd wanted the power of time walking for her demon master, to help his ultimate cause, not to allow her the freedom of moving through the ages. No matter, my humble servant. Zaffin growled from where he stood in the salt circle and expanded his impressive black wings. If I kill them now, there will be no need for a time-walking amulet. It's either that or they join us. The Prince of Hell's red eyes pinned me. I sneered. Never. He shook his head, as if I'd just said the dumbest thing in the world. Unleash me. The voice had darted across the room and kicked a bit of salt out of the perfect circular formation. I groaned. What idiots we were. We'd missed our chance to rush out of the room while Zaffin had been bound in the circle. Now, as he stepped over the broken ring of salt, there would be no simple way to escape. We had to fight him. I lifted my hands, and pools of darkness sprang into my palms. Zaffin was terrifying. With his glowing red eyes, black, scaly skin, and claws so sharp they could shred the bone over my heart. And yet, I knew instinctively that he was no match for the king and queen of hell, which meant, perhaps, that Eva and I had the power to beat him. Morgan caught sight of my magic and shook her head. Fuchsia power bloomed in her hands. Get back. What if... 
Together we won't fail. Eva stepped forward. I mimicked her boldness, flanking Morgan on the other side. Zaffin boomed out a laugh. Ha, <laughs> we'll see about that. He thrust out his hands, and black spiderwebs spun out of them to crawl up the elaborately papered walls of the room. Without hesitation, Eva and I flew into motion. Our black power surged, chasing Zaffin's magic as it met the prince's power. The spiderwebs began to scream, to wail, as if his magic was alive before they fizzled out entirely. The demon prince loosed a roar and, beating his wings, surged toward us. A wave of fuchsia washed out of Morgan, hitting the demon in the chest, beating him back. Get out of this room, she ordered us, out of the house. Eva and I took two steps back, but Zaffin's black spiderweb shot around us, covering the door into the hallway. The voice had jumped into the mix. She began blasting off her own magic, a repulsive grayish-green mix of witch and demon power. I caught Eva's eye. Attack the web. I'll take her. My friend twisted and struck the web without hesitation. Both sunshine yellow magic and black demon power streamed out of her, as if she'd been born to wield them equally well. For a moment, I stood transfixed. But when a beam of light nearly sliced open my shoulder, I too whirled to face my adversary. The poisoner witch smirked at me. Come on, girl. Let's see if the light or dark shall prevail. The room filled with fuchsia and yellow magic. Portraits flew off the walls and candles fell over as we battled. The voice was magically skilled, but less fit and nimble than the rest of us. Using my endurance to my advantage, I danced around her, and it didn't take long for me to land a blow to her leg. She dropped to her knees, her hand pressed to her thigh. And with a wail, the witch pulled her skirts up. I gaped. Rivers of blood gushed from her leg. I must have pierced her femoral artery, and yet the poisoner still had it in her to fight. She lifted her hand, a murky green light blooming in her palm. Ito Arasicus, I murmured quietly so she wouldn't hear. The last thing we needed was a traitor like Lavoisa knowing such a spell. Black tendrils soared from my fingertips and smothered the poisoner witch's power. She tried to return my attack, but her magic fizzled right out of her fingertips. The witch gaped. How? The demon-touched witch thrust her hand out again, and a spell I didn't know slipped off her lips. Nothing happened. Victory bloomed inside me. The binding curse had worked. Mester! Lavoisa screamed cutting my inner celebration short by reminding me that a bigger baddie was in the room. Mister. Elp. But Zaffin paid his follower no mind. He was locked in the battle with Morgan, streams of blackness fighting bright fuchsia light. The Prince of Hell never once took his eyes off my ancestor, which relieved me. The Prince knew I had demon power, but I didn't think he'd seen or heard me use the curse, which was something I'd like to keep in my back pocket anything to give me a leg up for the war to come. That is, if we made it to the war. Even as I watched Morgan, she started to flag, growing strained. We had to get out of here. My mentor wouldn't last much longer. To be safe, I wound up a net of black magic and sent it flying over Lavoisa, trapping her. She screamed for her master again, but once more, Zaffin didn't spare her a glance. That's what you get for making a deal with the devil, Biatch. I twirled to see that Eva was making great headway with the black spiderweb. Whipping back around, I struck Zaffin, first with a witch spell, and then with demon magic pulled from the deepest recesses of my being. When the black tendrils hit him in the heart, the Prince of Hell gasped and fell backward onto his ass. I grabbed Morgan's wrist. Run! With another blast of dark magic, I helped Eva make a hole in the web, big enough for the three of us to squeeze through. We were in the hallway within seconds. It took only a couple of heartbeats more for our lead to narrow. Heavy feet and beating wings sounded in the passageway behind us, telling us that Zaffin had recovered. We only needed to get out of the house, past Lavoisa's wards, to disappear. My mentor loosed a scream as a torrent of shimmering black magic surged past her, the edge of it hitting her shoulder. She stumbled, but I was there and caught her and pulled her forward with all my strength. Faster! 
Eva screamed, throwing herself at the front door and wrenching it open. She leapt outside and twisted to face the devil. Magic surged as she tried to fight him off, buying us time. Morgan, a warp hole. I shot a beam of black magic behind us. Zaffin grunted as it hit him. My ancestor cried out in pain as she extended her hand. I felt the essence of time shift milliseconds before a warp hole opened and the strands of time materialized. Eva stood between them, her gaze swaying from the threads in front of her and the warp hole behind her. I scoured the threads, but none popped out as the right one. So I plowed forth and trusted that Morgan would find it while I held her up. Blasting another stream of demon magic at the Prince of Hell, I sprinted straight into Eva, felt Morgan reach for a strand of time, and saw her fingers graze one before we disappeared through the warp hole. Chapter 15 My breath billowed out of me, producing small white clouds in the chilled morning air. Needing to feel the earth beneath me, needing the grounding, I slipped off my shoes. My bare feet pressed into the damp dirt, releasing the earthy scent into the air. I studied my chipped polish and two long toenails. Once this is over, a petty will be a necessity. The thought surprised me. It was so positive, almost an assumption that we'd win. Despite my tendencies toward mantras to manifest what I desired, since we'd stumbled from the 17th century France back to 7th century England the day before, my worry had escalated. Zaffin had seen us and knew that we'd found Morgan. Thankfully, we'd been careful to use false names with Lavoisa. Still, would this change anything? Everything? Hopefully he wouldn't discover our true identities, and we hadn't inadvertently changed the future. I huffed out a breath. Time walking really confused a lot of things. I glanced back down at my toes. But even the idea that a pedicure might be an option was kind of nice. A subconscious bright spot. I loosed a sigh, allowing that hope to wash over me as I leaned back into the tree behind me. A cheery hum cut through the silence I'd sought. Footsteps approached and I twisted to glimpse the other side of the tree. Morgan walked my way with two piping hot drinks in her hands. Her red hair gleamed in the sunlight. It contrasted starkly with the abundant green surrounding the cottage. I smiled as she approached and handed me the mugs. They smelled of apples. Using both hands and more care than usual to lower herself, she sat down next to me, her standard grace lacking. Although Alex and Merlin had begun fixing up the injury Zaffin had inflicted, it was nowhere near healed. That would only come with time. Thought you might want something warm to drink. It's a nice day, but still chilly. She smiled and held out her hand. Now that she was settled, I returned one mug. She was right. It was colder than I usually preferred. But I'd woken early and needed time outside the shack. Time to prepare for our journey home. Are you ready? Morgan asked when I didn't reply. I stared out over the waving grasses, breathing in the spring air of long-ago England. I don't know. We've done a lot of time walking, even with other people, but I've never done it without you. My free hand landed over my totem against my chest. Or this. Morgan nodded understandingly. For what it's worth, I believe you're more than ready. Her eyes gestured down to the totem. And you have no use for that anymore, love. It was your training wheels. Training wheels? One corner of my lips lifted in a smile. Morgan grinned. I may not use modern words or sayings often, but I've time walked across the centuries. I know a few things. The question I'd been dying to ask burst out of me. Do you know if we'll be successful? Are we going to beat the demons? Morgan's hand landed on my arm. I don't know. And even if I did, I wouldn't be able to tell you. That's so frustrating. Yes, but you understand why I can't. You're my blood. You can visit me any time, but I can't visit you in your time. Hence why Merlin and I used the totems to speak with you before. I would never forget that. Alex and I had been heavily making out when the illusions of Merlin and Morgan popped out of our totems. Thank the universe it wasn't the actual people. She squeezed my hand, apparently taking my silence as nerves. 
It's just like how I can teach you things about others' pasts, and yet neither of us can reveal information about how the other might meet their end. She shrugged. Time walking has loopholes. That way, fate proceeds as it should. I snorted. <laughs> fate can suck it. She laughed her musical laugh. I savored the sound, unsure if I'd hear it again. We fell silent for a few moments. Then Morgan took a sip of her drink and looked at me once more. The rest are awake and done eating, but I told them you needed a moment. Whenever you're ready, we'll be waiting for you. She squeezed my arm before rising and making her way back to the cottage. I sipped my drink and listened to the bird song. I felt the morning dew evaporate and fill the air with moisture as the sun rose higher. I smelled the flowers opening, lacing the day with their sweet scent. Was I ready? I was almost positive I could time walk back to the present, even with so many people in tow. Only a niggling doubt remained that they might arrive in the present injured or ill. But would I be ready for what I had to do when I got home? Had I squeezed every ounce of precious knowledge that I could from Eminem and even the traitorous Lavoisa? Only time will tell. Once my cup was empty, I stood. When I stepped inside the cottage, everyone was sitting at the long table, waiting. Empty plates and bowls sat before them. There was a nervous tension in the air, a mix of excitement and fear potent as any drug or dream. If everyone else is ready, I cleared my throat. I think we should be going. Diana shot up first. The others followed after a moment, putting away their dishes before filing out to our shack to get their things. We weren't taking much from our time with Morgan and Merlin, just the clothes we'd arrived in and a couple of trinkets that Alex and Eva had wanted to keep. It was best that way. The more items someone brought back from the past, the harder it was for them to leave that time period. Morgan seemed to manage it just fine, but she was the exception to the rule. I didn't want anything to hinder me from getting us home, particularly excess baubles. After getting our things, we gathered in the same field that I'd passed the morning in and faced our mentors and ancestors. It was a pleasure meeting all of you, Merlin said, fingering his beard. His eyes rested on Alex, his blood. If you wish to visit again one day, our door is open. I swallowed the lump rising in my throat. The emotion on everyone's face was plain. Even Hunter and Diana, who usually kept it together, looked like they might sniffle at any moment. Thank you for everything, Alex replied, his voice crackling. We owe our lives to you. He approached Merlin and slid his totem off his finger and put it in the old witch's hand. And if we get the chance to return, we will. Merlin smiled, his eyes crinkling proudly at the corners into deeply grooved smile lines. We hope that day comes. A flurry of hugs and kisses ensued. Morgan grabbed me last. The sage she often burned in the cottage wrapping around her and clinging to me as protectively as her arms. When we broke apart... I unclasped my necklace, her necklace, and placed it in her hands. Thank you for everything, for teaching me, for showing me the past and how to act in it, for being so incredibly patient. My eyes darted down to the necklace, and for saving my life more times than I can count. How can I ever repay you? Morgan shook her head. You being here is enough repayment. Seeing my blood and knowing that she will do great things. To fight great evil is the biggest blessing of all. Tears filled my eyes. I'll try not to let you down. You never could, Odette. Morgan gave me another hug. And for what could be the last time, I took in her face, focusing on the freckles that I was fond of, trying to memorize their pattern. My friends and I parted from the legendary witches, I just extended my hand to create the war pole when Morgan spoke again. Be prepared for anything and everything. You're returning to a time unlike other magicals have ever seen. She clasped Merlin's hand. We can't be sure, but we sense that you will be thrown into a crucible, formed and tested in hell's fire. Take care how you emerge. Crucible, Eva murmured, a little amusement in her voice. 
I turned to face my ancestor and beamed at her. It's funny you say that. Crucibles are exactly what we'll be soon. The five of us waved goodbye again before I opened the war pool. Easy as you please, I called the strands of time and grabbed the one I knew was right. I took one last look back at our mentors, unsure if I'd ever see them again, or if death would claim me first. They smiled encouragingly, and Morgan placed a hand over the moonstone necklace, the piece of jewelry that had saved my life and brought me to her. My throat tightened, and with a final nod, I turned and led my friends back into the future. Chapter 16 With a gulp of air, I collapsed onto a soft rug as the warp hole deposited me exactly where I'd envisioned. Home. My heart rate slowed. I'd done it. I'd time-walked through centuries without Morgan or the totem. I lifted my head to take in my friends. To my great relief, I saw that they were all whole, no limbs lost. They appeared uninjured and awake. Joy burst through me, but I tempered it, needing to check on one more person to consider the time-walking a total success. Hello? I asked in my head. Louise moaned. What happened? I feel funny. Uncomfortable. I time-walked. You're in the 21st century. You'll get used to it. She didn't reply. For once, I'd stunned Louise into silence. Fine with me. I needed a moment, too. Wondering if Claude still resided in Eva's head, I shot her a questioning look and tapped my skull. She nodded, a slight smile on her lips. I exhaled fully for the first time since arriving in the present. We were back. Safe. Louise was still there. Claude, too. No one would possess Eva and me as long as they stayed put. Everything we'd gone through with Lavoisa had been worth it. Tears sprang into my eyes as I took in the familiar living room. My mom's mid-century modern flair and love of plush pillows and blankets shone through the decor. Bits of dad were present, too, in the hints of red, his favorite color. Where were they? My pulse quickened as I listened for mom and dad. The house seemed quiet, hollow. It was also a little dirty. A fine layer of dust coated the side table. And now that I was noticing it, the air smelled stale. Standing, I moved over to the alarm system in the hall. They'd set it to stay, the setting my parents used when they were home but wanted to be alerted if anyone stepped onto their property. On a whim, I moved over to the nearest oil diffuser and popped it open. It was bone dry inside, something mom didn't permit unless they were away on vacation. My stomach sank at the mixed messages the alarm and the diffuser gave off. Mom? I yelled. Dad, are you here? Hunter groaned. Keep it down, will you? The room is rotating. Oh, sorry. I lowered my voice and pointed to the seat nearest him. Don't worry, you'll be fine. Just sit down until the spins wear off. Morgan reminded us that if someone hadn't time-walked recently, which the guys and Diana hadn't, they might feel disoriented and nauseous for a brief spell. You sure? Hunter blinked rapidly. I feel like I just slammed one too many beers or something. It wasn't this bad the first time. I wasn't so sure he was remembering correctly. When we arrived in the past, Alex had been a wreck, and Hunter had definitely been off for a few hours. The girls had reacted to time walking a little better, but our magic had been wonky. Still, there was no point in reminding him of that now. Positive. You should be okay in an hour tops. My gaze traveled over the others. Eva had more experience time walking and looked unruffled. Surprisingly, Diana looked fine too. The girl was tough as nails. Alex, however, looked out of sorts. The poor guy couldn't seem to catch a break. Babe, lie on the couch. Let me help. Alex shook his head and hauled himself on top of it. I suppose that after days of being bedbound, he wanted to do it himself. I'm glad we don't have to do that again soon. Hunter gripped his head and allowed Eva to help him into a chair. Are they here, Odie? Eva asked. I can't hear anything. Me either, but the alarm tells me they should be here. If they left, they'd arm it away. I don't understand. I began searching the house. With each passing minute, my heart rate ratcheted up as a new troublesome possibility entered my mind. 
Had someone taken them? If so, how had they gotten past the wards my parents set? Were they still in the house? I shuddered at the last thought, but found nothing to reinforce my worry. The house was tidy, not a dishcloth out of place. I have no idea where they are. I walked into the living room and threw up my hands. There's no sign of a struggle. Hmm. Eva had been getting the guy's water, but now she looked around the room. Maybe they had to flee after the hell gate broke open, Diana suggested. I wonder if they left a note. Mother used to do that when she was out. Because the academy didn't allow them, my phone was still locked away at Spellcasters, probably long dead. I checked the spot where my parents charged their phones and found nothing. They weren't on the tables and counters either. We'd always been more of a call or text family, but Diana was right. It seemed that an old-fashioned note was my only hope. Where would mom or dad put one? Especially if they wanted only me to find it. Mentally, I moved from room to room. Right away, I disregarded my room. Too obvious, as was any place where leaving messages would be normal. If they didn't want someone to read them, which I had a hunch was the case, it had to be somewhere smart, somewhere other people wouldn't consider. I gasped. I have an idea. I dashed out of the living room. Eva and Diana ditched the guys and followed, both their eyes widening as I led them into my dad's enormous study. I'd just crossed the threshold into the room when the scent of leather from my dad's jacket hanging on the wall hit me. My throat constricted as the familiar aroma bolstered my need to find them. Dad had a crazy big library. He devoted most of it to the film industry and history books on old wars. But there was also a section on magical books, if he knew where to look. I went to the shelf, next to which a statue of a woman stood. Placing my finger squarely on the tip of her nose, I pressed it inward. The hidden button receded into her face, and the shelf that appeared to only house historical war books began to turn. On the other side, a new shelf appeared, this one full of magical books and artifacts. Just like in the movies. So cool. Eva breathed. Where do you think he got the idea? I waited until the shelf stopped moving before searching for one specific book. The volume I saw sat tucked in the corner of the top shelf, as dingy and battered as the last time I'd asked to see it years ago. I pulled the library ladder over and climbed the rungs to pluck the book from its place. Is that the first edition of Mastery Potions and Elixirs? Diana asked. Experts regard that text as one of the best instruction manuals on potions ever. It's also excellent at hiding love letters, I said, amused by Diana's awe over the book that my parents claimed began their courtship. Eva tilted her head to the side. Explain. My parents met at Spellcasters. They were in the same year, but I guess things were different back then. They didn't have every session together. When they had to split, my dad would write a love note for my mom and put it in this book. She'd read it in class, and the instructor always thought she was just really into the text. My chest warmed at the tale. My mom told me about it when I was little. I thought it was so romantic and smart. And of course, I wanted to be in on the action. I asked them to leave notes in it for me, too. And they used to do it all the time, before I got too busy to check. Hopefully they remembered. I flipped through the pages with bated breath. I was about halfway through the book when I found it. A regular piece of computer paper folded and shoved tight against the spine. My heart thumped hard as I pulled it out, hoping that it was a recent note. The paper still felt crisp as I unfolded it. The handwriting was undeniably Dad's, done in a hurry. Is that it, Odie? Eva asked. A lump rose in my throat. Yes, they're safe. After we fought the demons in London, they had to hide. All our parents did. Where are they? Diana's tone had gained urgency. I'd wondered if she'd even considered that her mother might be in trouble. I had to admit it was hard to envision Battleaxe Priscilla Wake doing anything other than dominating. Are they together? I nodded. Andre and Sam alerted Headmistress Wake. She called our parents and they banded together. They're all in the same place, somewhere the demons can't go. I shook my head, unable to believe this was happening. I swear, Dane, if you don't spit out where in two seconds, I'm going to hex you. Diana hissed. Very, I said. They are currently guests of the Riverlands Court. Thanks to the Torna twins. Eva breathed out a sigh. Going there should be easy enough. 
I cocked my head at her. Easy to get to ferry? Why do you say that? You and Diana already went there once. You know how to enter the realm. Even if we don't arrive in the same court, surely they'll have something we can leverage for someone to show us the way. Unless, of course, we land in the dark court. Then we're screwed. Yeah, about that. Diana arched an eyebrow at me. The champions don't actually know where the entrance to Ferry is located. But you said it was at their academy? It is, but we warped there. Diana answered. The location of the academy is kept secret from other magicals, except warpers who have been approved. Pretty sure Odette isn't on that list. No, I'm not. I set the book down on Dad's desk. But we need to find a way there. Taking on a whole army of demons without help just can't happen. We need our parents and their friends. Diana nodded. Totally agree. Especially considering we don't even know what's happening in the outside world. What if the demons have taken over the government entirely? Well, shit, Eva muttered. If it's not one stumbling block, it's another. I was about to agree when a shrill sound cut me off. My blood skittered in my veins, and I stampeded out of the room. What is that? Eva squealed. An alarm, Diana shot back. Where the hell do you live that you've never heard a house alarm, Pleasantville? I ignored them and rushed into the living room. Get up, now. The guys, who were wide-eyed and already struggling to stand, swore. I darted over to Alex and hauled him up. Eva did the same with Hunter. If someone broke in, we needed everyone on their feet and all the magical power we could get. That's a human alarm, not a ward, Hunter said, his tone low. Yes, but my parents' alarm differs from others. The human alarm goes off when someone approaches the home. It's only when... Another sound, something similar to a cat yowling, pierced through the shrill beeping of the human alarm. I stiffened. Someone had breached the front door. Everyone, conjure a weapon and get ready to fight, I ordered. A blade appeared in my hands. For a moment, I wished it was my demon dagger, the weapon I had given to my friends the night we disappeared into the past. If the intruder was a demon, the hellblade would supplement our black magic. Hunter reached for his totem, an emerald-encrusted dagger, which he'd had on him the night we first time-walked. My other friends conjured blades, too, and everyone stood stock still, waiting. Footsteps sounded in the hall, coming closer. Listening through the blood rushing in my ears, I tilted my head. They sounded like normal human footsteps, not the tread of a large demon. There was no snarling or growling, no whiff of a noxious scent. Still, not about to be caught off guard, I pulled my weapon back, prepared to strike as the shadow of a figure entered the room. Chapter 17 Whoa, Dane, back up! Andre entered the living room, his hands raised in surrender. Right behind him, Sam and Ayla Torna dropped the daggers they held out in front of them. Andre! Diana ran to her boyfriend and flung herself into his arms. They embraced and shared a kiss so thorough, it would normally make me avert my eyes. But this time, I couldn't. I was too shocked. I lowered my weapon, blinking at the figures before me. Welcome friends, yes. But how had they gotten past my parents' wards? And more importantly, how did they know that we'd returned? A smile blossomed on Sam's face as she approached me. We'll explain everything. If you have food and booze, I'll even make the story good. My eyes ran over her. She looked much thinner than the last time I'd seen her. Almost too thin. Andre and Ayla had lost weight, too. Clearly, they'd missed a few meals. On it. I ran into the kitchen. Eva followed a half-step behind me. How did they? No idea. Just get them what they asked for. I think they're starving. As much as I wanted to hear about the events happening outside my home, Mom would keel over if she knew I didn't get our guests any food or drink, particularly guests who were going hungry. As it turned out, everything in the fridge had gone bad. Not a good omen. Luckily, there were lots of frozen pizzas in the freezer, all with a thick crust of ice on the boxes. Pizza was not something my mom usually kept on hand. That made me think she'd anticipated this situation. When I realized that the pizzas were my favorite type, Hawaiian, 
Tears pricked my eyes. Mom had suspected that I would be hungry. When I found a tube of slushy margarita mix and a bottle of tequila, I prepared drinks for our friends. Once the first pizza was ready, we popped another in the oven and brought the food and cocktails out, alongside a pitcher of water. Sam, Andre, and Ayla fell upon the pizza like a pack of hungry wolves. When all three of them had downed a drink and three pieces of pizza, Sam sat back in her chair, closed her eyes, and groaned. Even if it was sinfully topped with pineapple, I don't care. That was the best pizza ever. Okay, now you need to spill it. My heart was thumping so hard, I worried it might crack my ribs. Or I'll take all this away, I added, trying to infuse some lightheartedness into the room. Ayla threw her arms over what was left of the pizza. If you even try, I'll ether slap you. A laugh, half nervous, half real, burst out of me, inciting chuckles from the others. The sound was strange, far too infrequent these past couple days. Finally, after the laughter died down, Andre leaned forward and began telling us what we wanted to know. We've been on the run since London. Before we had to disappear for good, we spoke to your parents. They told us that when you returned, you'd most likely come here. Your house is warded better than Fort Knox. It was a safe bet. They hoped you'd find that book. My eyebrows furrowed. How did you know I found it? They enchanted it. Once it opened, a spell would inform me that you picked it up. A clever twist on a motion detection spell. But if you've been on the run, why didn't you stay here? You said it yourself. This house is protected. It always has been. Because Mom and Dad always rightfully suspected that someone was after me. Andre shook his head. The house is being watched at all times. And we needed to make sure it was still an option for when you returned. I had to warp us to a specific spot on the front porch so no one would see us. We set off the human alarm with our motion. But none of the more dangerous wards. Then I had to say your password your parents gave me to allow us inside. I leaned back, stunned at all the workarounds my parents had implemented. But then, why haven't the baddies come inside and waited for me? Some of your parents' words are real doozies, Sam said. Honestly, I'm impressed. Your mom and dad warded almost every inch of however many zillion square feet are in this place. I huffed out a laugh. <laughs> yeah, tell me about it. It's been like this since I was young. Sam arched her eyebrows. Well, the wards have already killed off dozens of demons. I bet our adversaries figure it's not worth it anymore. For now, as long as they don't see anyone coming in or out, they won't make a move. So why didn't you guys join the others in Ferry? Diana twisted to face Andre, who sat at her side. Demons can't go to Ferry. You would have been safe there. We well, wanted to, Ayla replied. But the spell your parents placed on the book to inform us that you'd come back wouldn't cross realms. A fae had to stay behind to get you into the Fae Academy of Elemental and Arcane Arts. And from there, fairy. I volunteered for the job, and to glamour everyone to make finding us more difficult. We needed Andre to warp us into the house, and Sam... Sam pulled a demon dagger from each of her hips. To kill those bastards. She tossed one of the daggers so that it flipped through the air before she caught its hilt. I've gotten really good at throwing these, by the way. Wow. I shook my head. You guys must have some stories. We've had a few run-ins with dark witches and one rogue pack looking for us. Just like you have stories too, I'm sure. Andre said. Where have you been hiding these past few months? Months? Hunter leaned forward and swayed a little because he still wasn't quite right after time walking. I'm sorry, what month is it? What year? It's July, Sam replied. You've been MIA since January. July? We'd been gone nearly half a year. My stomach wound into tight knots. I missed a birthday, I thought. Even though there were clearly much bigger things to worry about, it still felt sad. I'd always liked celebrating my birthday. And my parents must have been so worried on that day. I'd just gotten over my personal pity moment when I noticed that Alex, Hunter, and Eva were all staring at me. Months, Odie? Eva squeaked, wanting an answer. I lifted my palms in a defensive shrug. Morgan said that time passed strangely. Sorry, but I'm still pretty new to this. I tried to get us back just a few days after we left, but clearly I was off a little. 
Honestly, though, I'm happy to have gotten us here in one piece. Morgan? Sam prompted. Morgan Le Fay, I offered, to which three mouths dropped open. And Merlin. Yes, the Merlin. That's who we stayed with and learned from. Despite knowing that my black magic was powerful and might be the difference between victory and defeat, I wasn't quite ready to admit to the others exactly what I'd learned. And from the way Eva was squirming, I could tell she felt the same way. We'll tell you about it later, Alex said, coming to our rescue. What's the plan for right now? He was trying to appear pulled together, like the time walking hadn't thrown him for a loop. When can we leave? Andre gave him a once-over and arched a bushy eyebrow. As soon as you and Hunter look like you can walk a few miles, Ayla tells me I won't be able to warp onto the Fey Academy grounds. Neither will Odette. Only specific warpers have that privilege. And Tittlebalm is... He gulped loudly. Still at Spellcasters. Why do you say it like that? Diana asked, her tone high. Andre and Sam shared a long, pointed look, until Sam turned to us. Spellcasters fell to the demons after the Hellgate broke open. The royals chose it as their new palace. Chapter 18 After Sam dropped the Spellcasters bomb, Alex and Hunter tried to insist that they were ready to journey to Fairy right away. However, since the guys fell over the moment they stood up, no one believed them. They tried to fight it, to insist that we could leave, but ran out of steam after a half hour. Honestly, it was just as well. As much as I wanted to see my parents and finish off the royal demons, a brief break was necessary. Andre, Sam, and Ayla were still ravenous, and after they'd told us more about what they'd been through, I planned on feeding them until they passed out in a food coma. The rest of us needed a shower, a bed, and some quiet time to process what had happened in the months we'd been gone. Thankfully, my parents' house was large enough to shelter all of us. After we'd devoured seven more pizzas, I showed everyone to the spare bedrooms. Alex and I retreated to my old bedroom, where I called solo dibs in my in-suite shower. I wanted to shave, and he did not need to be around for that mess. Good-naturedly, my man took the separate bath down the hall. For the first time in living memory, my mom's insistence on too many bathrooms in our home proved reasonable. I groaned as the water hit me and ran over my skin like silk. The fresh tingle of my rosemary-scented shampoo made me want to cry with joy. As I massaged my scalp, I breathed in the delicious scent and mulled over the situation. According to Sam, Andre, and Ayla, the demons hadn't made an overt play for world domination yet, just small moves attacks and maneuvers that a lay person wouldn't see as too crazy or fiendish, unless they knew that thousands of demons had recently infiltrated the world. I wondered if that was because they were waiting to use me and Alex to wrench the Hellgate back open. Or maybe they simply wanted to find us and make sure we watched the world burn. Twenty minutes later, I turned off the water and wrapped a buttery soft towel around my body with a pleased shiver. Eminem's cottage had been nice enough, and I'd be forever grateful to them for housing us, but it had been too long since I'd been clean, warm, and swathed in comfortable fabric. I primped a little more, and was still lost in thought and gratitude for modern luxuries when I emerged from the in-suite bath. Alex was already sprawled in my bed. He was staring at the ceiling, clad only in a spare pair of my dad's sweats. You okay? I asked. The effects of time walking had worn off by the time the group split to rest, but I wasn't sure if people could relapse or not. There wasn't a lot of data on that sort of thing. Fine. Just worshipping how soft this bed is. Like a damn cloud after sleeping on hay for so long. He propped himself up on his elbows with a small grin. And soaking everything in. Honestly, I just can't believe we're here. In our own time. You got us here in one shot, sweets. Why the tone of surprise, I deadpanned. And when his face tightened, a small smile broke on my face, and I threw a wave. I understand what you mean. Morgan let me hold the reins of our first time-walking experience, but I'd never spanned so many centuries, or time-walked without my totem. My hand went to my chest, where the necklace would have lain, had I been wearing it. I miss it. Me too. Alex glanced down at his unadorned finger but it is reassuring that they don't think we need them anymore. I wonder if that means we'll get another one. 
I smiled to let him know that I was being flippant. Totems are kind of a status symbol. Alex chuckled. <laughs> I'm sure that after we get rid of the demons, Headmistress Wake will give us another crack at Spellcaster's totem cache. I hope that if something chooses me again, I get earrings. I've always been more of an earrings person. Not that I didn't love the necklace. I added hurriedly, because that little necklace had saved my ass many times, particularly the moonstone. It looked good with all my outfits. You look good in anything, babe, even that towel. I wiggled my hips suggestively. White terry cloth doing it for you, Wardwell? After living in that shack for weeks, you wearing a burlap sack would do it for me. He reached for me. Come here. I acquiesced, joining him on the bed and savoring the feel of his hands as they traveled from my exposed knees up my leg. It had been so long since we'd shared anything more than a kiss or a tight squeeze that my body hungered for him. So much had changed. So many things we'd taken for granted had been wiped from our lives. Had I known how amazing I had it back then, I would have taken more care to be grateful for all the goodness in my life, savored it more, which I intended to do right now. Who knew when the good would come again? My hands landed on Alex's cheek, freshly shaven and slightly red for it. Smooth, I murmured, and breathed in the smell of him, fresh for the first time in weeks. Although I have to say, I was kind of digging the beard you grew. Ugh, not me. Food got caught in it. It was disgusting. I chuckled. How sexy. I leaned in for a kiss. Our lips met, soft and tender at first but growing more needy by the second. Heat rushed through my core. I wanted him. Badly. Do you have protection? He asked. I parted from him and arched an eyebrow. Don't judge me. I've never brought guys home when I lived here. But I always thought it was best to be prepared. His lips twisted in adorable confusion. Oh, just wait. I pulled the drawer to my nightstand with a flourish. Inside was an old Barbie jewelry box. I opened it and packages of condoms glinted up at us in the lamplight. Alex burst out laughing. <laughs> Who would guess that my classy lady would hide condoms in a Barbie jewelry box? I slapped his shoulder. You should be happy that I even have any if I didn't. He pressed a single finger to my lips. Don't even end that sentence. He gestured down to his crotch. I smiled. It seemed he was as ready for me as I was for him. We started kissing again. Every touch, Every breath along my skin, every soft growl and gasp from Alex made my heart thud harder in anticipation. The towel disappeared, as did his sweats. Unable to wait a moment longer, he grabbed for one of the condoms. Sure they're not expired? I am a responsible woman. I check that they're replaced every time I come home. That would have been just after Yule. Hopefully you're not too responsible. He winked and was about to rip open the package, when suddenly my breath caught in my throat. I slapped my hands to the mattress. Alex's eyes widened. Odie, sweets, what's wrong? He dropped the condom and reached out for me. What's happening? But I couldn't answer. I was incapable of speech, because my scar had begun burning, and I could feel a vile influence spreading through me, trying to take me over. Somewhere in my house, a scream. Eva's rang out. I called back with one of my own. Footsteps sounded down the hall, and though it should have been the least of my worries, I grabbed my towel and pulled it over my naked body, just as Alex ripped the blanket over both of us. Odette! Sam yelled. What's going on? We heard screaming. Come in, Alex said. The door swung open, and the girls barreled inside. What happened? Ayla asked, her eyes scanning my face as I clenched my teeth still gripping the bed sheets, unable to speak through the pain pummeling my head. Not sure, that first scream wasn't Odie. Alex's eyes were wild with fear. I think it came from Eva. As if in answer, Eva screamed again. A stream of curses in a deeper voice followed. I drew in a sharp breath as another assault came at me. What's going on? Sam asked, the muscles in her neck sticking out. She looks like she's in so much pain. Holy universe, was I ever in pain. A dark influence spread through me like wildfire, threatening to burn me from the inside out. My jaw was tight, and using everything I had, I commanded Louise to fight for me. Lazy as ever, 
the mind which moved at a snail's pace as she wrapped my head in a protective shield that dispelled the darkness. Each inch of ground we gained was like moving a mountain. Sweat slicked my body, and I trembled. But slowly and surely, the mind witch gave her full protection. The inky blackness pulled back, like a slow tide, and I collapsed onto the bed with a sob. Alex's hand found the back of my head. Sweets, what happened? I tried to do a scan, but couldn't figure it out. His voice trembled as he spoke. Alex was an excellent healer and had been able to deduce practically everything that we'd ever encountered. But no one had taught him how to sense demonic magic from a royal floating in my body. We hadn't even considered it. Fast footsteps came charging toward our door. A second later, Hunter appeared, with Eva passed out in his arms. His breath was ragged and green eyes wide with fear. She started yelling and grabbing her face and... She's breathing now? Alex asked. Check on her. I whispered, my voice raw. After wriggling back into his sweats, Alex did as I asked and breathed a sigh of relief. Everything seems okay. Yeah, except for the fact that both the girls are pale as ghosts and covered in sweat. What happened, Odie? Hunter asked. Do you know? I nodded. My worst nightmare had just come to life. Ishtar and Lucifer just tried to possess us. Chapter 19 After Eva regained consciousness, she confirmed what I already knew to be true. Lucifer had been trying to possess her. While Claude had protected her, the pain had been too much for her to bear. The question then became, did the royals know we were here? That we'd defended ourselves? Or had they been routinely trying to possess us while we'd been gone, and the ghosts merely successfully stopped one of the many attempts? Things had just gotten way more real. As much as I wanted to stay home, sleep for a night in my own bed, and feel secure with Alex's arms wrapped around me, that was no longer possible. After what had just happened, I wouldn't be able to sleep anyhow, not knowing that there were demon peons right outside my door, and they might try and break it down at any second. Ishtar might not have succeeded in possessing me, but she had to have figured out that I could time walk. During the battle in London, she'd warded the entire area against regular war poles, rightly figuring that I wouldn't be powerful enough to slip through time. At least, I wasn't powerful enough on my own. Not back then. With Morgan's help, my friends and I had escaped and traveled through time, and Ishtar had seen it happen. I wasn't positive, but that made me think that Ishtar routinely checked for my presence. If she knew that I was back, or even suspected it, she could probably guess where I'd hide out. And if she guessed correctly, my home was no longer safe. Everyone else agreed, and we began packing. New clothes, dried goods for snacking in case our journey didn't go as planned, small toiletries, and flashlights because it was pitch dark outside. We threw all our supplies into backpacks and duffels, and once everyone was prepared, we met in the living room. I turned to Ayla. So we have to go to your academy to get to Ferry. I tried to infuse some pep in my tone, but truth be told, I felt exhausted all the way down to my bones. Where is the academy? Can I warp into it if you tell me about it? Or do I just warp somewhere nearby? Ayla chewed on her bottom lip. We won't be able to warp directly inside. We have ether wards up, and they'll deny any magical who hasn't been branded or approved. You'll only be able to get us nearby. Luckily, I brought a photo of a good spot, and think you might be semi-familiar with the area. She showed me the photo, and I understood her assumption. I didn't know exactly where on the map the picture had been taken, but it was undeniably my home state of California, somewhere close to Highway 101. This is Bixby Creek Bridge. Ayla pointed to the bridge in the pic. Do you think if you know the name and have a visual that will be enough? Less than a year ago, I would have said hell no, but I'd progressed leaps and bounds in warping since then. I nodded. I got this. Just give me a couple minutes. I studied the photo until I could practically hear the waves crashing along the shore and the seabirds calling out overhead. When the vision was firmly in my head, I turned to my friends. Andre, go through first. I said, it's best to have a warper on the other side, just in case there are demons around and we need to make a quick exit. I assume you can get anywhere now? He grinned proudly at me. Have been able to for months. 
months. My poor parents. Good for you, I said, again shaking off the shock of how much time had passed. Then I say we get right to it. I inhaled a deep breath and worked the surrounding magical energies. The whirlpool opened easily and grew to fill the room from floor to ceiling before it stopped. I nodded to Andre. He passed through. Then the others followed one by one. When I was the only one remaining, I looked around my home and fought the lump rising in my throat. Would it still be here if I returned later? Would I ever return? There's only one way to find out. Keep going. I spared the living room one last glance before stepping into the warp hole. The moment I exited, I noted the scent of salt and the sensation of sand pummeling the skin of my face. It was dark, but we were undoubtedly at the beach. I caught Ayla's eye. This is where we need to be. She pointed east, into the National Forest. The Academy is eight-ish miles that way. Everyone should stay close. There are traps along the way. But as long as you don't stray, we'll avoid them. Everyone fell in line behind the ferry, their flashlights piercing the cover of darkness in front of them. After we'd trekked for ten minutes, I sidled up next to her, wanting to understand more about her magic. What in you, besides being a fey folk, allows you past the Academy's safeguards? Well, it is mostly that I'm fey, but also all of us receive small tattoos when we enroll at the Academy. She pulled up the sleeve of her shirt, exposing her forearm. I glanced down at a nondescript circle bearing the five elements that Faye could use. To a human eye, it might appear new age, but not overtly so. Ingenious, I said, even though I wasn't sure I'd want a tattoo. Spellcasters should implement that, Alex muttered, clearly of a different mind. Would have saved us a lot of trouble during the culling and grind. Will we arrive in the snow-capped court again? I asked Ayla. She shook her head. There's another portal to fairy at the school. One made specifically for me and Santa, in case we need to make a fast exit. It will take us directly to the Riverlands court. Why only for you two? Hunter asked, reminding me he didn't know much about the spy game champions from the Fey Academy. My sister and I are in line, far back in line, mind you, for the throne of the Riverlands, distant cousins of Prince Halid, the heir. He has about two dozen cousins, so that's really nothing special. But our parents act like we're the actual heirs. They insisted upon a getaway portal if we were to attend a spy academy. Her cheeks reddened. Her lineage always seemed to make her uncomfortable. We'll use that portal and go to the Riverlands Court. To the castle, to be exact. Great plan, I said, thankful not to be visiting the snow cap Court again. It had been nice, and the royals were kind, but the place was also freezing. The cold and I weren't friends. We continued through the forest. Conversations popped up here and there, but fizzled out after a few minutes. Mostly we trudged forth in silence, listening for something approaching in the dark. When the pleasant distant sounds of a cascading waterfall became audible, Ayla held out a hand, stopping me. That's the signal. I have to remove the glamour I keep up. Otherwise, it sets off an alarm. Could anyone hear the alarm way out here? I asked. Ayla shrugged. That depends how close they are and who's around. The night we left London, Andre warped us as close as he could to the Shifter Academy. Once we were there, we found the heads of the schools. Headmistress Cristalla left immediately and began the evacuation of the Fay students. The school has been empty since except to transport people to ferry. But who knows if magicals have been lurking in the area. Has there been any sign of enemies? Hunter prompted as his hand fell to his totem on his hip. The perimeter is heavily enchanted, so I doubt demons would have found it. Ayla bit her bottom lip. But I guess you never know, especially if they have a fey ally who gives them a workaround. She trailed off clearly not liking the idea that a fey could betray their own kind. A shiver spider walked down my spine. I didn't like the idea either. Should we have waited and found Headmistress Cristalla? Ayla asked, noting my unease. She's assembling forces somewhere in this realm. No, I replied, 
We don't have time to wait. The fay ran her hand over her body, and inch by inch, the glamour she always maintained in the human world disappeared. She looked pretty much the same. She was still a petite, beautiful redhead with bright green eyes, but the glamour's removal revealed otherworldly attributes that had been hidden before, like her pointy ears and the diaphanous, ruby-veined wings that fanned out from her back. Ayla sighed as she spread her wings wide. You have no idea how good that feels, like taking off a bra at the end of the day, but a million times better. Where do you hide them? Diana asked. I use ether to bind them to my back. If you ever ran your hand down my back, you'd notice. But no one does that unless they're invited. Yeah, because that would be awkward. Sam sang the last word, and a few of us laughed. All right, Ayla said once the mirth had quieted. The ether ward should be a hundred or so yards away. If you're too far from my body, you won't be let in. So huddle around me. I claimed a spot right next to her, and we progressed forward as one tight-knit pack. The fairy warned us a few seconds before we walked through the enchantment to prepare for the strange sensation of water flowing over our heads. I shivered as the ether ran over me, setting all my nerves on fire, but in a good way. Almost familiar. Once we were on the other side, I blinked. Fey magic was palpable, making my head spin a little. The Fey Academy of Elemental and Arcane Arts was right in front of us, white and glowing in the moonlight, which seemed mystically drawn to this spot. The sweet scent of flowers hung in the air, nearly intoxicating. Damn, Eva muttered. This makes spellcasters look like a prison. Yeah, Hunter agreed. What's with that? Alex, too, looked impressed, but he said nothing. I suspected he just wanted to get into Fairy, where we'd be safe. I grabbed his hand and squeezed. Lead the way, Ayla. The Fairy approached the castle gate and opened it without issue or password. No one was on the other side, and from what we could see, no light shone in the building. Looks dead inside, I said, my voice hopeful. Yeah, but demons aren't exactly fond of good lighting or hanging welcome signs, Andre said. He was right. I needed to stay on my toes. Until we stepped foot in fairy, we were in danger. Ayla led us through the castle grounds and into the courtyard that hid a portal to the snowcap court. We marched deeper into the academy, past large halls and classrooms I hadn't seen before. Lounges filled with cushy furniture and relaxing plants dotted the surroundings. Ayla led us up flights of stairs to the fifth floor, and then stopped before a door at the end of a hallway. You guys don't room in towers? Diana asked. Our guide's eyebrows scrunched together. Why would we? To separate the classes? Ayla's hand twirled in the air dismissively. Fae, even a lot of demi fay live extraordinarily long lives. Our time here is a blip on our radar. What would be the point of dividing us up when we'll run into other classes in the real world all the time anyway? I agreed. I'd always thought that spellcasters should be more commingled, especially now, when so much relied on the bonds of friendship, love, and camaraderie to see us through the war to come. Anyway, this is our room. She turned to us, her cheeks pink. Santa packed in a hurry, and then a bunch of people came through here retreating to the Fey Realm. It's... Definitely going to be a mess. Sorry. I choked out a laugh at the innocent and reassuringly normal worry. I think we can all handle a messy bedroom. Lay it on us, Torna. Ayla still looked like she was about to seriously regret letting us into her room, so I gave her a reassuring smile. With a small sigh, she pushed the door open. I blinked. Damn, the girl hadn't been kidding. It looked like a tornado had been through here clothes everywhere, a lamp overturned, makeup lay scattered, and random items spilled out of the dressers and closets. Ayla pressed her hands over her eyes. By the ether, my sister is such a slob. Behind me, Hunter let loose a laugh. A few others joined in, lightening the mood. When we get to Fairy, you can tell her how much she embarrassed you. I patted her on the shoulder. But we should get going. I hadn't felt anything strange or demonic but the Hellborn could crop up at any second. The last thing we needed was for the demons to watch us retreating to another realm. They might not be able to enter, but they had other magical minions who could. Ayla picked her way through the room, 
muttering and shaking her head every couple steps. She stopped when she reached a bed, presumably hers, because it was more well-made than the other, and ran her eyes over it. I don't think anyone's been here since your parents left. Your bed is the portal? Diana asked, a tone of incredulity in her voice. In response, Ayla leaned over the queen-sized mattress to tap the headboard. My eyes widened. What appeared to be a nondescript headboard, decorated with concentric circles from the middle all the way to the outside, was actually a well-disguised portal. In the dead center, a knob protruded ever so slightly, presumably the handle. Brilliant, I said. How do we open it? The fairy's lips pulled up at the corners. Easy. Be me, Santa, or a headmistress. Her hand landed on the knob, and suddenly it began to glow a brilliant white. When she pressed inward, the portal door swung away, and a stream of yellowish mist flew into her bedroom. She turned back to us. Shall I go first? I nodded and watched as the fairy crawled on her mattress and through the portal hole. I went next bracing myself for the strange sensation that had overwhelmed me the first time I visited the other realm. But as I traversed the ten or so feet of the portal, it didn't come. In fact, nothing about entering this realm felt strange, which both relieved and confused me. I'd reached the other side, but was still on my hands and knees. Ayla extended a hand to help me up. You won't feel very drunk this time. You've acclimated. I breathed a sigh of relief. My last visit... I'd been out of it for hours, but now I didn't have time for that sort of nonsense. We'll have to have rooms prepared for Eva, Alex, and Hunter so they can sleep off the fairy drunk, Ayla mused, as if it had just occurred to her. Rooms have been ready for you for ages. A familiar yet pinched voice shot through my heart. I peered past Ayla and found my mom at the door of the room we'd entered, her arms extended. Mom! I ran to her and threw myself in her arms. I've been so worried. When I didn't find you guys at the house, I... I know, honey. Mom stroked my hair, and I noted that she smelled different. Still like vanilla and myrrh, but lacking the touch of her favorite perfume or oils. It was so hard for us not to leave a more obvious message, but we couldn't risk it. We had faith, though, that you would figure it out. She pulled away to look at me. The months I'd been away had changed her, given her lines where there hadn't been any before, and she looked thinner, from anxiety, no doubt. Her brown hair even had a couple streaks of gray. I'm so glad you're here and that you're safe, Odie. Her voice broke a little. We've been so worried. All the parents have. We've been taking turns waiting here for word of our children. She gestured back to the single chair and table in the room. I had just gone to take my plate to the kitchens. When I came back, you were here. A sob escaped her mouth, and tears began streaming down her face. Finally here. I pulled her tight again. I'm here, Mom, and I have so many things to tell you. I... Ah! My hand flew to my head as a pressure increased all the way around my skull, and then, just as suddenly, eased up. I blinked, unsure what had happened. Odie? Mom's eyebrows knitted together. Are you okay? What happened? I was about to tell her that I wasn't sure when Eva fell out of the portal from the human realm with a yelp and pressed her hand to her forehead. The truth crashed over me. The voice I had mentioned that time walking and traveling between realms would loosen our ties to our ghosts. Louise and Claude had stayed with us through two rounds of time walking, already an extraordinary feat. Had the shift into fairy been too much for them to remain bound to us? Louise, are you there? There was no reply. Chapter 20 Once I was sure that Eva was okay, ghostless and growing more fairy drunk by the second, but otherwise fine, we continued with the reunions. Parents spilled into the room and clung to their kids. Mom and Dad fretted over a ghost having been in my head, even though Louise was long gone. Eva's parents exclaimed over every other story she shared. Both Wardwell units couldn't get over the time walking. Everyone cried, even Headmistress Wake. After the initial reunions were over, Eva, Alex, and Hunter were shown to bedrooms to sleep off the fairy drunk sensation. 
Everyone else settled into a room Mom dubbed the leisure room. Families congregated together, save Andre and Sam, who perched next to headmistress Wake and Diana because their parents weren't present. We had been seated no more than a few seconds when two unfamiliar figures wearing long silk robes entered the room. Ayla, Santa, and their parents shot out of their seats and fell into deep bows. Mom and Dad did the same, as did the other witches who had been in fairy for a while. All righty then. I rose and followed suit. Welcome to the Riverlands Court. The man, presumably the king, said with a warm smile. He was very tall, with long brown hair that covered his pointed ears. But he had no wings. An elf, then. His wife, on the other hand, greatly resembled the Tornas with her bright red hair, silver-veined wings, and pointed ears that marked her of the fairy race. Yes, welcome. The queen continued. I do hope that everyone is well after the journey. I apologize that we are not more appropriately dressed to receive guests, but you arrived at such a late hour. Please sit. Everyone did as she requested, and once we settled, the queen spoke again. My name is Aquatia Vapos. This is my husband and king consort, Elon Geisis from the Cove Court. I apologize that our son, Crown Prince Halid Vapos, is not here to greet you. It seems he has taken to a night out in the city. She pursed her lips, indicating that she didn't agree with her son's late nights out. However, we are so pleased that you're all here and safe. Her eyes landed on me. You must be the one who the Demon Queen is after. You look just like your mother, who has told me so much about you. I smiled at the compliment and nodded. Thank you, Queen Aquatia. It's a privilege to visit your kingdom and even more of an honor to be given refuge. An enemy of the Dark Court is a friend to us, the king said. I am from Cove Court, a cousin to the current king. As you probably have guessed, I have not seen my family in many years. Because of the rift, right? I asked, wanting to be clear. The queen nodded and placed a sympathetic hand on her husband's arm. The rift spanning the inland boundary of the Dark Court is a terrible thing. It not only cuts those of the Dark Court off from the rest of Fairy, but the coastal kingdom of the Cove Court, too. Although we realize that your battle is in the human world, there are parallels here. We're hopeful that if you defeat the demons, it will weaken their ally, the crown of the Dark Court. That would be wonderful, I said. From the mountains of the Snowcap Court, I'd seen the rift. The black swirling cloud on an otherwise pure emerald landscape along the border of the Riverlands Court. I'd heard tales of what happened to Fay that tried to escape through it, and it was nothing good. That being said, Queen Aquatia smoothed the skirt of her robe. We have been waiting for your return to learn how we can be of assistance. Her eyes scanned Ayla, Diana, Andre, and Sam. Besides providing a bed, of course. After time walking, reuniting with friends, walking miles through the forest, and arriving here, it was no surprise that our fatigue was noticeable. As much as I wanted to hear what was happening, the exhaustion was real. Still, with Louise's and Claude's departure, I did need help. Since the Queen was offering, I might as well ask a favor now. This might be a shot in the dark, but you wouldn't have a spirit walker and talker hanging around here, or the Fae equivalent, would you? Actually... We do. I believe you're acquainted. The purple-haired witch? The queen offered. My spine straightened. Amethyst, she's here? I cast a glance around, as if I could have somehow missed my sweet, loyal, purple-haired friend before that moment. But instead of finding her, I saw looks of discomfort flit across many faces. An uneasy hush fell over the room. Santa cleared her throat. She's here, and a little off. Very drunk? I asked, confused. If she'd been here for even more than a few days, that should have worn off by now. Not quite, Santa replied and gulped. Her powers have amplified since coming to Fairy. She's talking to all sorts of ghosts. What Santa isn't saying, Ayla interjected, is that Amethyst's parents perished, trying to flee their home. She hasn't spoken to anyone but ghosts since coming here. I exhaled. 
Hearing the news of Amethyst's parents made me feel like someone had punched me in the gut. After a moment, however, I latched on to the last bit of what Ayla had said. My eyebrows knitted together in confusion. You mean she's ignoring real life? Like, depressed? My heart cracked for Amethyst. That seems reasonable, considering her parents just died. Hunter's parents shifted uncomfortably. The king dropped his gaze to the floor, and Santa began bouncing her leg up and down rapidly. Ayla drew in a long breath. Well, yes, and no. She's here, but not here. I'm sorry, what? Was I being dense? Why did everyone seem so scared? She's in the spirit world, Santa blurted out, all tact lost. Mentally, not physically. And since she's arrived in Fairy, no one has been able to coax her out. Chapter 21 When I woke the next morning, Eva, Hunter, and Alex were still sleeping, acclimating to Fairy. So I asked Diana to join me. We were silent as we followed Queen Aquatia and Ayla through the ivy-laced hallways of the castle. Occasionally, the queen would try to break the uncomfortable silence by pointing out a particular fairy plant or decorative object of interest. Diana would reply, uncharacteristically engaging in small talk for the both of us. I was grateful that she realized that, at the moment, I just couldn't. Although I'd been exhausted, after the meeting, I'd ended up tossing and turning most of the night. All my thoughts were on Amethyst. I felt so bad for her, but didn't know how to help. I hated that. Plus, selfishly, I knew that if Eva and I were going to be able to stand up against Lucifer and Ishtar, we needed Amethyst back. I understood why she was in another plane of existence. She was trying to find her parents. I hoped that she hadn't gone so deep that she'd gotten lost. When we reached Amethyst's room, I was astonished to see that her door was being guarded by none other than the vampire champions from the spy games. Francis? Simone? Magdalena? I cocked my head. One was missing. Where's Anton? And what are you doing here? It was a polite way of asking how they had convinced the Fae to let them into Fairy. The Fae had strict requirements regarding other magicals entering their kingdoms. The event had to be underway, or their need for the creatures must be great. They extended the fewest number of invites to vamps. As far as the Fae were concerned, vampires were the lowest on the magical totem pole. Anton died in London. A demon staked him as we retreated, Simone said, her tone typically chilly, although her eyes softened when she said her classmate's name. He tried to fight, claimed that he knew the city well enough to pick a few off. He was always too reckless. I'm so sorry, I said, and I meant it. I hadn't bonded with Anton, but he'd helped us the night we escaped from the demon horde. I'd be forever in his debt for that. The vampires insisted that they come to fairy with the spirit worker. Queen Aquatia gestured to the vamps as she answered my second question. Said that you put Amethyst in their care in London. They haven't wavered on their guards since she learned that her parents perished. Oh, I tried hard to mask the shock in my voice. I had asked the vampires to get Amethyst out of there safely. Obviously, they'd taken that to the next level. Considering what she'd been through, it was pretty thoughtful. Thank you, guys. We've all lost parents, too, Francis said. Even if it was long ago. She might be a bit odd, but the spirit walker grew on me. I nodded, knowing what he meant. Amethyst had that way about her. How is she? Ugh, <sighs> awful. He sighed dramatically, reminding me what a showman he was. There's been no improvement. I fear if she doesn't come back soon, she'll be lost for good. Ice flew through my veins. That couldn't happen. We needed Amethyst. And more than that, I wanted my friend back, safe and healthy. The vampires led us into the room. The moment I stepped foot inside, I was so transfixed by my friend that I barely noticed the door close softly behind us. Amethyst sat by the window in a green, winged-back chair, a blanket draped over her legs. Her shoulders were hunched as she stared out over the verdant, rolling hills below. She didn't turn, didn't even blink her glassy brown eyes when I approached, confirming that the others were right. She was somewhere else. 
lost in a place that few witches could go. Amethyst? Hey, it's Odette. Diana joined me as I knelt next to Amethyst and clasped one of her thin, dry hands, hoping that my touch would get through to her. We heard about your parents. We're sorry. I swallowed a lump in my throat. To be honest, I feel responsible. I shouldn't have brought you along that night. I should have gone alone. The demons would have broken through the Hellgate anyway. But none of the other stuff, the rest of the pain, would have happened. Don't think so highly of yourself, witch. Simone spat, and I twisted in shock. I hadn't realized that she'd followed us inside. The Queen and Ayla, too. If you went alone, you'd likely be dead. Then how would you stop them? She arched an eyebrow. Just wake the spirit walker and quit making yourself feel bad over things that you can't control. Damn, vampires sure had a way with words. I looked back at Amethyst. Even if what Simone says is true, I'm so sorry about your parents. I fell into silence, not sure where to go from there. Amethyst, Diana piped up. Do you think that you could return? We want to see you and make sure you're okay. And if you're feeling up for it, Odette and Eva need you for something specific and important. Her sharp blue eyes roved over our friend. She'd grown thinner, and her purple hair was lank and oily. Plus, I think you need to eat. We have been feeding her, the queen whispered, slightly defensively. However, she's very particular about what she ingests, and honestly... It's only when she eats a few specific items that she seems to become more responsive. I'm afraid we're unsuited for taking care of a spirit walker in this court. My spine straightened. The queen's talk of food had sparked an idea. Alex had been ill after being pulled through the ghost plane. I suspected that the effects of that place were stronger on Amethyst because she, unlike Alex, resonated with ghostly energies. But still, Alex had gotten better. Why couldn't Amethyst? Diana, do you remember those potions you made for Alex at Morgan and Merlin's cottage? I had been present at the making of those potions, too. But Diana was always the most serious about potions. At Spellcasters, she'd memorized how to brew at least a hundred. In the past, she'd wake up nearly every morning at the crack of dawn, ready to brew a new batch. Of course I do, she replied. Good. We need to make those same potions for Amethyst. I think her grief has gotten her stuck in the ghost plane, paralyzed. Perhaps we even need to have her eat the most potent of the ingredients whole. Diana cocked her head. That's a very sensible plan, Dane, she said slowly. For someone who's mediocre at potions, I'm impressed. I rolled my eyes, but took the jab because, well, compared to Diana, I was mediocre at potions. Thanks. Ayla, will you show Diana to the kitchen so she can get started? The older Torna twin nodded and slipped out the door with Diana. When they were gone, I twisted to look at the queen. I don't think she'll be prepared to work magic anytime soon, so I must ask. Do the Fae have anyone who can talk to ghosts? Queen Aquatia looked thoughtful. There is one ether-blessed Fae who claims she can speak with ghosts. She's the only one. Is she nearby? I asked. Maybe she can help us bring Amethyst back, or even help us find two more ghosts of mind witches and bind the witches to Eva and me. As much as I wanted Amethyst back, I had a feeling that leaving the spirit realm was not something that anyone could force her to do. She had to be ready, which hopefully Diana would help her with. In the meantime, we needed to check out other options, preferably before we returned to the human world where Eva and I would be at risk. She lives on the outskirts of the Riverlands and the Dark Court, the Queen answered. Many years ago, we sent delegations to her aid. We begged that she move, so that if the Dark Court struck, she would not be in harm's way. After all, she is our citizen, and we felt responsible for her well-being. Aquatia shook her head. But she refused. I nodded. I think I'll need to pay her a visit. Maybe after I speak with Eva, you can tell me more about her? But of course, the queen said graciously. I turned back to Amethyst and gripped her hand again. I know you're hurting, old friend, but hang in there. We'll help you out of there, safe and sound. You'll be in a place where you can grieve properly. And if you want, you can take revenge on those who killed your parents. 
I kissed her lightly on the cheek before leaving the room. Chapter 22 When I entered the corridor, the queen split from me, which I preferred. I needed some time alone to think. Unfortunately, I had made it only a few steps out the door when Francis and Simone appeared at my sides. So much for time to think. Where have you been all this time? Francis asked. Where hadn't I been? I might rattle off a dozen places and times, but I knew what he meant. My totem helped us time walk to the era of Morgan Le Fay and Merlin. Both vampires drew in sharp breaths. That's before both our times. Wicked. Francis said, clearly impressed. I spared him a small smile. We stayed with them. Morgan is my ancestor, and Merlin is one of Alex's. They trained us in ways lost to witches over the centuries. Like? Simone prompted. I learned how to use demon magic and a few druid spells. The vampire's eyebrows shot up. Demon magic? Francis hissed. Like the same magic the royals use? I nodded. Then I remembered something I'd wanted to ask when I first saw the vampires. Hey, where are the shifters? Are they... Alive, Simone said. Dasha wanted to come to Fairy too. We all figured this would be the first place you'd return to when you realized your parents had to abandon their house. But Alpha Conan pulled rank. He did it with all his students and their families. Pulled rank? Alpha rank. The shifter headmaster is what you would call an alpha's alpha. He's one of the top dogs, no pun intended, in their society, and he's using his influence to build an army of shifters, Francis explained. That's what headmaster Ezra is doing too, with vamps of course, and the fey headmistress with her kind. They're reaching out to all of their most trusted acquaintances and best ex-students, telling them what happened, and seeing if they will fight with us. Francis's eyebrows arched. Basically, we've been amassing people for your return. We figured that once you came back, you'd know how to finish this shit. Do you? I snorted, unable to help myself. That was the question of the century, wasn't it? <laughs> well, we're getting closer every day, I said, noncommittally. I think it's good that they're building armies. We'll need all the help we can get. We should also consider a base in the human world. The Fey Academy could be a good one. It seems more secure than most. More secure than spellcasters? Francis jabbed. I assume that you heard what happened there? Yeah, the demons made it their palace. He nodded. Yeah, I'm not sentimental, but I feel for your peers there. Who knows what kind of torture the demons are subjecting them to? I stopped dead in my tracks. Wait, students are still there? They didn't get them out in time? Francis and Simone shared a surprised look before she replied. No, Spellcasters was the first place the demons hit. A few parents tried to break their kids out later. Didn't go well. Why didn't anyone tell me that? My voice was tight, laced with fury. I thought back to when Sam had told us the school was under the demons' control, how the guys had blown up. We'd spent the next half hour convincing them they couldn't just leave for fairy, which sort of explained why it hadn't come up then. I'm not sure. Francis said carefully. For us, it happened months ago, and no one likes thinking about it much. Have you spoken with your headmistress yet? I shook my head. Not one-on-one. -on -one. That seems to be something I need to rectify. After 20 minutes of searching, I found Headmistress Wake sitting with my parents in one of the three castle solariums. This one had an excellent view of the wide, raging river that ran right beside the castle and through the capital city of the Riverlands Court. Normally, I would have found the water and greenery calming, but I was wound too tight, ready to burst. So many scenarios had been running through my mind while I searched for the headmistress that now the view was merely a blip on my radar. I entered the room and stopped right in front of their table, which was covered in sheets of paper. Was anyone ever going to tell me that the demons had taken over spellcasters and are holding students hostage? My hands flew to my hips as my gaze traveled between my parents and landed on the headmistress. She took in my body language with unimpressed arched eyebrows. I'm so sorry that we didn't get right on that when you showed up out of the blue after having gone missing for months, Miss Dane. I suppose it slipped my mind in between reconnecting with my daughter and the Queen of the Riverlands calling a meeting in the dead of night. 
Headmistress Wake's tone dripped with sarcasm. My cheeks heated as the truth of her words sank in. Fine, I'm sorry that I'm being a bit of a ball buster, I said, my tone much more level. It's just that we've been talking about coming back and finishing this fight since we escaped London. It's practically all I can think about day and night. I hated discovering that the demons took spellcasters, and now I hear that my peers are hostages? How did it happen? They arrived at spellcasters the same night you went missing, and took the academy right away. Of course, many wished to fight, but they were too late to get the children out. Many who tried to liberate the students were injured or died. She cleared her throat as unease flickered across her face. As you well know, I was still at the Shifter Academy that evening, preparing for the third spy game event. I didn't even know my own school had fallen until Andre and Sam came running and shouting through the forest. I tried to contact Professor Tittlebaum. He didn't respond. She stood up and paced the room. No one did. Not even my husband. After hours of trying to make contact, I called Miss Iris in Wanstown. She told me that a demon horde had flown overhead, blocking out the light of the moon. Screams tore through the darkness, and fires burned all around spellcasters. Headmistress Wake wiped at her face hastily, as if she'd shed a tear. But how did they move so fast? I threw up my hands, no longer angry at her, but still not understanding. The Hellgate opened in London. They'd have had to cross an ocean to get to the Academy. Mom gave me an understanding smile. Demons had hidden portals in our world for millennia. Some say new ones appear occasionally, too. Witches close them whenever they find them. They teach you how to do that as a crucible. But of course, we'll never find all of the portals. Either that, or royals have warpers at their beck and call. Mom drew in a long breath. We're upset about the Academy, too, honey. It's the first place on our list to liberate once we build a large enough army. I pressed my fingers to my temples. Is the Hellgate still closed? Or did it rip open and we have more demons spewing in? Do the humans know? You and Alex did a good job closing it up, P, Dad said. Although we do think it's weakening, it will need to be permanently sealed again after we force the demons back. And as for the humans... He rolled his neck telling that this next bit was a source of anxiety. Many saw the demons fill the skies that night. Mind witches are currently scouring the globe to erase the memories of those the devils came into contact with. Thankfully, since that night, the demons haven't made their arrival public. But wouldn't they want to make themselves known? Don't they want to take over? Of course, Dad replied. But for now, they're sowing a nice little environment of fear and using the top echelons of world governments like puppets. They don't need to be in the limelight right now. They're preparing for war, just like us. I flung myself onto the wicker couch between my parents. I swear, it's just one thing after another. Mom gripped my hand. Yes, honey, it is. That's why we've been recruiting. Our army is building, and we have an idea as to where we'll get magicals willing to fight. Where? Remember all those PIA agents who went missing? I nodded. We've found that they're being kept in a government facility in New Mexico. We're going to break them out. Alpha Conan is working to rally. The vampires are helping too, Headmistress Wake interrupted, assumedly in case Mom forgot about them. Yes, Mom said. All of those people will do their part. If we can coordinate an attack on spellcasters when the royals are there, we'll have a good chance of success. Don't you think? I mulled it over. It did sound like the start of a decent plan, particularly the freeing the prisoners part. I was sure that none of the incarcerated magicals had done anything wrong, other than question a crooked wing of the PIA. Yes, I said. And if the Fae don't mind, using their academy as a base could be smart. It has really strong protections around it. I paused and steeled myself to add the bit I'd been dreading. There's one thing I need to do before we attack. What's that, P? Dad asked. I need to find another spirit worker to bind the ghost of a mind witch to me so I'll be protected from possession. Eva needs the same. If we can get this done, 
Neither Ishtar nor Lucifer will be able to harm us from afar. We'll be able to fight them. I'd hoped that Amethyst's parents or even Amethyst could do it. But after seeing her... Miss Rhines is not in shape to be helping anyone at the moment. Headmistress Wake's voice was strained, making a lump rise in my throat. Although she rarely showed her emotions, this had to be hard on her. The school she called home was under control of an enemy. Her husband was there, and the students she'd sworn to protect. Definitely not. I agreed. Diana is working to help lure her back to this plane, though. Hopefully it will work. In the meantime, Queen Aquatia tells me that there is an ether-blessed fae in her kingdom who might help. After Eva wakes up, we'll begin planning a journey to visit her. Does she live in the capital city? If so, why not invite her to the castle? Mom asked, her face wary but curious. I'd hoped this question would come up later, but should have known better. My parents always had liked to keep tabs on me. Not the city. She actually lives along the border. Which one? Dad asked astutely. I folded my hands tightly together and squeezed. The one the Riverland shares with the dark court? The room stilled. Dad's eyes latched onto Mom's, and they shared one of those moments that made me feel like they could read each other's minds. When his gaze traveled back to me, I pressed my back into the couch. They were clearly going to take some convincing. Chapter 23 It took the entire day to convince my parents that letting me seek out the ether blessed Fay was the best option. And honestly, I suspected that I only succeeded because Crown Prince Halid and three of his cousins wished to join in the quest. Considering that I still used GPS in my hometown, the escort was just as well. They'd keep us from getting lost, which would save time. Of course, Alex, Eva, Hunter, Andre, and Sam wanted to come too. The only shocker was Francis, who brought our cohort up to 12. Diana had wanted to come too, but understood that caring for Amethyst was a priority, especially if this ether-blessed fae couldn't do what I asked. Thankfully, in the hour since Diana had started feeding Amethyst the right foods, our spirit walker friend had already shown slight signs of improvement. As I entered the stables where the horses waited, Mom grabbed my hand. Please be careful. We just got you back. Don't worry, Mom. I mounted the mare I'd been introduced to earlier, Silverhoof. You've already had enough to think about. I'll be fine, I promise. I know you're capable, but you're still my baby. I smiled, trying to ease her nerves. From what I've heard, the fae we're seeking is an old biddy who lives alone. We should be fine. I gestured to the large contingent traveling with me. And if she gives us trouble, Prince Hallid will make it an order that she has to help. I didn't like the idea of forcing someone, but desperate times called for desperate measures. And right now, I was so damn desperate. Still, honey, this is fairy. The dangers are different here and prevalent. Mom's gaze traveled to the prince, all done up in a royal uniform and beaming jovially at all who passed him. The prince seems nice enough, but I'm not sure how capable he is. I don't want to nag, but please do be careful. I snorted. Prince Halid seemed more the type to woo the court than slay a dragon or battle danger, but his cousins looked battle-worthy. However, I couldn't deny that the prince's position might help and I wasn't about to turn down the assistance of someone familiar with fairy. Mom was right that this realm was full of dangers. We'll be on alert for dangers, Mom. Tell Dad I said goodbye again. I love you guys. We love you too, honey. Once everyone was astride their horse, we galloped out the castle gates and into the city that surrounded the fortress. As we rode, Faye, who recognized the prince, cheered and waved. He waved back, grinning at all of them and calling out the names of those he knew. The rest of us just took in the city and smiled at the crowds as if we were celebrities. Being royalty must be super weird. When we reached the city wall, the guards didn't hesitate to open the gates, and we rode into the wild fields of the Riverlands Court. From the window of the room I had slept in, I knew that the countryside around the castle was green and rolling, but until I was in it, I hadn't realized how all-encompassing the greenery would be. Swaying grasslands stretched on both sides of the road, dotted by the occasional tree or patch of shrubbery. 
There was nothing else in the wide expanse. No homes, no monuments or animals, not even a stray gray boulder to break up the verdant scene of the fields. I inhaled a full breath of fresh air. It smelled amazing, like grass, a sweet scent that mingled with silver hoops, musty aroma. For the first time in days, I felt as if I could take a moment to breathe, to think, to be in the moment. I planned on savoring the ride out to the ether-blessed Faye's home. The day and night spent on the road would be the closest thing to a vacation that I'd had in a long time. As we trotted down the road, my gaze roved over my friends. Most had ridden horses back home before applying to spellcasters, because you never knew what they'd spring on us at the academy. The only one who was unsure about her skills on a horse was Eva. Thankfully, Hunter was a natural horseman if I ever saw one, and his confidence was eroding her doubt. We'd only been trotting along for a few minutes, and already she looked more relaxed than when we'd settled her on her mare. You look like you were born on the back of a stallion. The Riverlands prince, who I'd met hours before, rode up next to me and beamed good-naturedly. His cousins trotted in his wake, all grinning too. I've had a fair bit of practice, I admitted. When I was young, Mom wanted me to be in horse shows, I think because she was terrified of horses growing up and didn't want that for me. Anyway, I didn't like it so much. I preferred dancing. Still, I stuck with my riding classes long enough to pick up the basics and then some before she allowed me to quit. Riding is an excellent skill to have in one's arsenal. The prince nodded to Alex. Your gentleman looks like he agrees. There was no doubt about that. Alex looked nearly as comfortable as Hunter on the back of his stallion. He's good at most things he tries. I remarked. Ah, we have Faye like that. Prince Hallad arched an eyebrow. Personally, I find them quite frustrating. It's such poor form to be good at everything. Yeah, none of us understand how that feels being around you, Hallad. A cousin teased. He was built like a linebacker, with black hair and vibrant blue eyes that rivaled Alex's. I'm lying, by the way. My cousin has manners but he sometimes forgets to use them. Good to meet you. What are your names? I nodded to the other two. Gran. The brunette with a crater-like dimple in his chin nodded at me. Flynn. The last one with long flowing white tresses said, unlike his cousins, he didn't have wings, but shared the pointed ears of the others and towered over the rest. Probably an elf then. Flynn's the baby of the group, Hallad said. Though you can't tell by looking at him. The guys bantered, occasionally asking me questions until I broke off to ride solo for a bit. Everyone fell into their own rhythm as we traveled across the countryside for hours, stopping only for food and water for the horses. By the time the sun began its descent, the prince had already diverted toward a place to camp. When we found it, I leaned forward and patted Silverhoof's neck. You did good today, girl. I dismounted, and my legs wobbled precariously. That's not going to be good tomorrow. A squeal hit my ear, and I whipped around to find Eva had also gotten off her horse and fallen to the ground. Hunter assisted her in standing and gave her a hand as she hobbled to the edge of the clearing. The poor thing would be in a world of hurt tomorrow. Andre, Sam, and Francis were already pulling the tents from their mounts and tossing them on the grass. This semicircle clearing looks like a good place to set up tents. Sam pointed to the indent in the thicket of trees we'd stop by. There's a little cover but it's also open enough that we'll be able to see someone approaching. The prince nodded. We're a fair distance away from the border, but we should still rotate a watch through the night, just in case. Vampires don't need as much sleep as other magicals do, Francis piped up. Plus, my vision is far superior, so I'll take the whole night. I smirked at his pride. My eyelids were already drooping. So long as I got some sleep, he could keep his superior vision. We took care of our horses, erected the tents, and made a fire. Dinner was simple. A few sandwiches, fruits, and a strange vegetable that reminded me of carrots, but with the spice of a weak pepper. I gobbled it all down and crawled into a tent. I was lying on a mat inside the tent Alex, Hunter, and Eva and I shared, when Eva let out another squeal. I shot up. What is it? Before erecting the tent, we'd check the area for anything strange. Leprechaun holes or puka dens. Most fey lived within the kingdom's town and cities, although there were still wild creatures that preferred to live in the old ways. 
we'd tried to be considerate and not encroach on their space. Dunno, Eva said, her brows furrowing as she palmed the ground under the tent. What the hell? It feels like I'm lying on a tiny cooking pot. It's probably just a rock, sugar. Hunter rubbed her shoulders. No one's about to disassemble this tent to find a strange little pebble. Do you want me to push it out of the way? I groaned at the idea. Yeah, shove it to the side. I laid my head down, intent on ignoring my friend's grumbling as she shifted the rock out from underneath her. In the next few moments, silence blanketed our tent and, eventually, the camp. My eyelids fluttered closed. My body grew heavy as a haze of sleep dragged me under. Chapter 24 Ugh! Something freaking bit me! I scrambled up and nearly bonked heads with Hunter in the pitch-black tent. What's going on? Eva mumbled. She rustled under her blankets. Guys! Her tone became frantic. I can't move my legs. They're hurt. Help, I think I'm paralyzed. I rolled my eyes. Dude, if you feel pain, you're fine. You're just sore. Stay there. I'll check out what the commotion is about. I barreled out of our tent. Alex and Hunter following close behind. Do you guys see any... Oh, what in the world? It's a dragon, isn't it? Eva screamed from inside the tent. I freaking knew we'd see a dragon. Not a dragon, sugar. Hunter called, sounding as baffled as I felt, staring at the swarm of teeny tiny pixies swirling around Andre. Prince Halid was up too, clearly trying to bargain with the pixies, which snarled and darted around him. A fair distance away, his cousins were sniggering and not even bothering to hide it. Maybe a dragon would be better? I muttered as a pixie started yelling at the prince, who stepped back and cupped his hands around his mouth. Get up, everyone, Halid called out. We have to leave now or the swarm will attack. They're only holding off out of respect to my mother. I blinked. Pixies attacking? A swarm? Was this a joke? But instead of wasting time questioning things, we did as the harried Prince Halid said, hauling a whimpering Eva out of the tent and taking it down in record time. As the guys rolled up the canvases, I glanced at the moon, high in the sky. It was probably near midnight. And don't think you can just move down the hill and camp there. One of the larger pixies yelled as Prince Halid mounted his horse. We own all the land until the next grove. The prince's lips flattened, but he didn't argue. Merely nodded and told everyone else to saddle up. I did so gingerly, my body still aching from earlier. Once I was sure Eva was in her saddle, I rode up to the prince. So what happened back there? Prince Halid rolled his eyes. Wild pixie swarms. They're very territorial, and this is their land. They weren't pleased when we made camp here, but decided against retaliating out of respect for my mother. Their resistance held out until the chief's mate couldn't find her favorite cooking pot. After that, he lost it, attacked Andre when he got up to relieve himself, and as you've noticed, kicked us out. Cooking pot? My mouth fell open, recalling Eva's description of the item she laid on. All that was for a cooking pot? Okay, so they were upset, but... Why did you look so freaked? I leaned close because I wasn't sure if pixies had sensitive hearing. In case you didn't notice, they're tiny. Tiny and deadly, the prince said. They have venomous fangs. With that number, we'd all have been dead in minutes. Deadly? Did you just say deadly? Andre pulled his horse up next to us. He held up his arm, which was a single swollen red lump. Not from that. The prince was unable to keep the exasperation from his tone. One pixie bite is nothing. You'll be fine. But if the swarm had gotten to you, that would be a different story. It's not nothing, Andre muttered. This shit stings. I muffled a laugh, and as the prince cantered ahead, dug my heels into my horse's sides. Between Andre's hysteria over his pixie bite and Eva's, I knew it was a pot, ramblings. It was an hour or so before exhaustion took over our group once again. When everyone finally fell silent... It was dark, and the prince estimated that we had at least three more hours until the sun rose. I wasn't sure if we'd reached the next thicket of trees that indicated the end of the swarm's land before then, but I sure hope so. I was desperate for sleep. 
As it happened, I was fated for disappointment. We came across the grove about a half hour later after the sun inched over the horizon. Prince Hallid pulled his stallion up to the grouping of trees and squinted into it. Is it safe? None of those tiny devils? Andre asked, his eyes narrowed. I see no signs of a pixie swarm living here. Of course, that doesn't mean it's not in another swarm's territory, but as long as they aren't nearby, we should take this chance to sleep for a couple of hours. The closer we get to the rift, the more alert we need to be. I blinked through blurred vision and nodded. A nap sounded glorious. This time, when we dismounted, we didn't bother setting up tents, but simply lay in the grass and passed out. Francis woke us all up three hours later, and we trucked onward. By the time the sun hung at its zenith, I was more than ready for another snooze fest, but knew that wouldn't happen. According to Prince Hallid, we would reach the ether-based Fae's cottage at any moment. More importantly, we were approaching the border of the Riverlands and Dark Court, the Rift. I'd noticed it an hour ago, a dark cloud on the horizon. As we journeyed closer, the inky stain had grown and expanded to encompass miles and miles. A cold emanated from it, one that made me shudder every few minutes. Wild, isn't it? Alex said from his place at my side. I feel like depression is washing over me just seeing it. I felt it too. I can't imagine living so close by. Why would this ether-blessed fae want to subject herself to this? Even with ether power, it would have to affect her, right? Most definitely, the prince replied from a few feet away. I feel it. However, she has a strong motivation. Rumor has it she lost a child to the dark court. They killed her kid? Alex asked, horror-stricken. We're not sure. She claims that her son crossed the border right before the rift appeared. He's either in the dark court, or the rift sucked out his soul as he journeyed through the expanse. I doubt she'll ever learn the truth. He trailed off. Why can't anyone get rid of it? Eva piped up, eyeing the swirling, inky storm up ahead. And what is it? No one knows, just as we know practically nothing about the dark court. The prince replied with a frown. Personally, I believe that the ether-blessed fay probably the most powerful in fairy's history, created it. I cocked my head. The rift looked nothing like the bright ether power I'd seen, but the prince probably knew better. Not a demon? Hunter asked. Hallid shook his head. True demons cannot enter this realm. Once, they were able, long before the rift came into being, but not anymore. I was about to ask what had changed to make this place immune to demon infestation when a hut came into view. I pointed. Is that her home? Prince Hallid's mouth spread into a smile. It must be. Anyone up for a gallop? Since we were all antsy to fulfill our quest, we kicked our horses into high gear. We were about halfway to the cottage when I noticed that something was off. The door was wide open, as was the gate door. My gaze flickered from side to side. No one else seemed to have noticed, or if they had, maybe they figured she kept her door open all the time. She did live in the middle of nowhere. Despite that point, I couldn't shake off the inkling that something wasn't right. Not wanting to worry them by shooting off a spell, I called up my demon magic and bid it to slither through the lush grass like a snake. Glow red if adversaries are ahead. My magic flew forth, faster than our horses, and entered the cottage. When it didn't glow red right away, I released a breath that I hadn't realized I was holding. And then the damn cottage lit up crimson. Stop! I yelled as cries of surprise flew off the other's lips. Everyone, stop! There's... My mouth snapped shut as two dozen armed fae resembling walking corpses burst from the home. Dark court shadows! Prince Hallid yelled. Prepare to fight! He darted a fearful glance at me. If you can use your demon magic, it would be much appreciated. An inky blast of magic soared from one of the shadows. My eyes popped open wide. Oh, shit. These fae weren't just soldiers from a crappy place. They had magic that most others didn't. Magic that they'd gotten from their ruler, who answered to a royal demon. Eva! I screamed. I saw! She yelled back and rode up to my side. Fight like with like? I nodded, and together we kicked our mares forward. The horse's hooves pounded against the dirt, as loud as thunder 
as the shadow sprinted ever closer. Prince Hallad was at the forefront of our group, his other hand pressed out, bright white ether blooming from it. His cousins rode just behind him, all using their ether magic too. I surged forward, maneuvering Silverhoof to fight by the prince's side, figuring the ether and shadows would be an unbeatable combination. I was almost there when a fay popped into existence, literally out of nowhere, and tackled the prince, throwing him off his horse. Before my eyes, the creature shifted forms into something more beastly and sank fangs deep into the prince's chest. The metallic tang of blood filled the air as Prince Hallid loosed a scream, and the inky blackness inside me attacked. It soared around the shadow shifter, encircling his neck and squeezing. Ice slithered across my nape as the fay thrashed and screeched, but I didn't let up. I pressed harder and waved Alex over to care for the prince. He was there a second later, falling to the prince's side and shoving aside the body of the shifter who'd attacked him. As if I had a target on my back, five more fay encircled us. While Alex assessed the wound, I took them down one by one. My lips trembled as the last shadow fell. He had survived five witch spells before my demon magic sucked the life out of him. Too resilient. That's not good. A scream cut through my revelation, and I whirled to find that my friends were still battling ferociously. Swirls of darkness floated around Eva as she struck down her opponent. Andre and Sam had made good use of their demon daggers, pausing in their attacks only to pull the blades from the fallen fae. Hunter had been struck and was bleeding from his arm, but he didn't stop fighting. He used his totem in conjunction with his magic to great effect, slaying three shadows as I watched. Prince Hallid's cousins had taken down their fair share, too. A growling voice came at my back snapping me back into the moment, and I twirled to find a fay behind me. It lunged, and without even a second thought, I flicked my finger, and demon magic surged. It slammed the creature in the face and dragged the shadow fay to the ground, where my magic smothered the monster until its last breath. When I looked up next, only our group remained standing. Though we'd been outnumbered two to one, we'd made fast work of the shadow fay. Someone moaned, and Alex murmured something in reply. I twisted to find the prince still on the ground. Alex was pouring his energy into Halid to help stop the bleeding from his chest. Prognosis? I asked as I fell to my knees next to my boyfriend. Not good, Alex replied, his gaze darting up to mine for only a moment. We need to get him back to the castle and fast. You can't fix him here? Leon asked, his blue eyes misty. I'm doing what I can, but I'm not familiar with fey physiology, particularly that of the ether blessed. You guys have a whole different type of magical energy running through you. Ether magic changes things. He chewed his bottom lip, visibly upset by his limitations. To be honest, the prince was lucky. Two inches higher, and that beast would have sliced through his carotid. Alex's fingers fluttered over the gaping injury at least eight inches long and four inches wide. Small tears spiraled off the main injury, turning the surrounding skin a sickly gray, nearly necrotic black color. I can keep him alive, but I'm not sure that I'm capable of healing the wound, he finally admitted. Fay healers will surely be able to help. There are many healers at the castle, Gran said in affirmation. What can we do to assist until we get there? Alex looked at me. The ether-blessed fay we seek might not be able to help us any longer. He trailed off, not wanting to say that she might not be able to help because she was likely dead. You should go check her home. Take one of the fay too, just in case. My stomach sank. No doubt he was right. If the shadows had infiltrated her cottage, it would be a miracle if they'd left her alive. Still, we hadn't traveled all this way for nothing. Flynn volunteered to go with the rest of us, and we approached the cottage. Absolutely no one was surprised when we found the home in shambles. There'd been a struggle, a massive one. If the singe marks and exploded furniture was any indication, the home smelled dirty, uncared for, with the telltale beginnings of rot hanging in the air. We discovered a body curled up in the far back corner, covered by a tattered blanket. The fay we'd been looking for, dead. 
I pulled the blanket off to look at her face. Dried blood crusted her nose, and bruises bloomed beneath her eyes. The poor woman, I said. I wonder why they attack now. Do you think it was because they knew we were coming? Sam stepped forward. No time for speculation. We need to bury her and get moving. I nodded. She was right. We might never know why, but that didn't change what we needed to do next. As a group, we lifted the fay and took her outside. Just off the cottage was a small, lovingly cared for garden. We found only two shovels, so everyone except Hunter, who was still bleeding a lot from his wound, took turns using them. In less than an hour, the hole was dug. Once we nestled the fay inside, we covered her up and stood over her. A few people shuffled and darted unsure glances at their neighbor as unease mounted. Feeling as if someone should say something, I bowed my head. I'm sorry this happened to you. I'm sorry that you waited for your son and he never came back. I'm sorry that your life was hard and we came too late to help. I wiped away the tears beginning to form in the corner of my eyelids. My words could apply to so many people, particularly if we failed. We're going to do our best to beat the demons. I promised her, if we do, maybe fairy will change for the better too. May the ether light your way, Sam said, which made me lift my head to stare at her. She shrugged. It's kind of like amen for humans, right? Flynn, the only fae present, nodded, looking surprised and a bit intrigued by her knowledge. That's right. I like that many people in your group have brains and bravery, as well as beauty. My lips curled up when Sam's cheeks flushed, but I bowed my head again in an attempt to finish the funeral rite as respectfully as possible. May the ether light your way, I echoed. Chapter 25 We rode the poor horses hard all day and through the night. Leon, the best rider, pushed his stallion ahead to warn the castle to be ready. The other advanced riders, excluding Hunter because of his injured arm, took turns carrying the prince on their horses. When it was Alex's turn, he'd often try to infuse healing magic into Halid. Still, by the time we reached the capital city of the Riverlands Court early the next morning, the prince didn't look any better. He looked much worse. As soon as we entered the castle, a group met us outside. Among them, Queen Aquatia. Quick, the queen yelled. Healers, move. Within minutes, Prince Halid had disappeared into the bowels of the castle. Needing his own arm bandaged, Hunter followed, and Alex went with him, hoping to be of help. I scanned the retreating crowd and found my parents rushing through the fay to join me. We heard the news of what happened at the cottage, P, Dad said. Are you all right? Fine, I replied. We've barely slept since leaving, so I'm exhausted, but there isn't a scratch on me. They embraced me, and I squeezed them tight in return. When I pulled away, my gaze traveled from Dad to Mom and back again. But we failed. The ether-blessed Faye was dead, so I'm back to square one. Maybe not, a familiar, proud voice announced. I craned my neck around Mom to find Diana walking my way. Amethyst just spoke. She asked for you and Eva. Serious? My lower lip trembled, partly out of joy for my friend, and partly because we still had a shot. Diana nodded. I heard people running through the halls. I glanced out the window to see your arrival, and she woke up. The first thing she said was to bring you two to her. I nodded, and after calling Eva away from her mom and dad's grasp, we followed Diana to Amethyst's chambers. Our parents trailed behind, the proctors asking questions every step of the way. When we reached Amethyst's door, Simone and Magdalena were still there, standing guard. The door was open, and inside, Headmistress Wake was speaking with Amethyst. I knocked on the doorframe before entering. Their heads turned simultaneously. My friend's eyes lit up when she saw me, although her lips did not curl up in her familiar smile. Odette, Eva, please come in. She waved us toward a few chairs, settled around the one she'd sat motionless in for days. We took the seats, and I leaned close to her. Amethyst, I am so sorry about your parents. I should have never let you come. 
I would... She held up her hand. I would have come, even if I'd known what would happen to my parents. I couldn't live with myself otherwise. Her words choked out of her, but she fought through the emotion. They believe in what you're doing, you know. They've seen what has been happening to our world. Things that haven't even been set in motion yet. Terrible things. Her eyes drifted out of the window for so long that I'd thought she'd forgotten we were there. Eva shifted in her seat, and Amethyst's attention snapped back to us. Thanks for helping me back, by the way. I needed the proper nourishment to become grounded. Not that I was lost while I searched for my parents, but I might have been. Of course. Diana did most of the hard work. Amethyst nodded and cleared her throat. They've seen so much where they are now. That's why they couldn't come back to me. It's why I searched for so long and never found them. Until today. She folded her hands together, as if that made perfect sense. Maybe it did to her. She was the spirit worker, after all. Did you talk to them? Eva asked in a small voice. Yes, in the ghost plane. They told me everything. Where you've been, what you've accomplished. She bit her lip. What you need me to do. My breath hitched. I hadn't expected to show up and have my friend already understand what we needed. It will be difficult, I said carefully. We had a very adept spirit worker do it for the first time in 17th century France. She had to have been at least 70. Walked around the spirit worker block a few times, if you know what I mean. Amethyst snorted. But I remember what she did, I said. I can tell you if you can do this. It'll be the key to us surviving the demons and hopefully sending them back to hell. Amethyst gulped. My parents said you'd say that. And as always, Mom and Dad were right. Maybe the Fae have books on how to do it, too, Eva offered. Then you can study up for a day before you try. Amethyst shook her head. I don't need that. My parents will help me. They're actually already on the hunt for the perfect ghost. They said you'd need strong, trustworthy mind witches, right? Right, Eva replied. Amethyst's gaze trailed out the window once again. Well, then they're on it. So now, all we have to do is wait. We left Amethyst in her room, awaiting the return of her parents. I hoped they would find the ghosts of mind witches quickly. The sooner Eva and I were protected, the sooner we could all return to the human realm, free the prisoners that the U.S. government had locked up, and build an army. Eva and I had made it halfway down the hall when Alex and Hunter turned in to our corridor. They were both covered in dirt, and dried blood caked Hunter's dark blonde hair. I pressed my lips together hard as my gaze landed finally on Hunter's bandaged arm. You okay, honey bunch? Eva asked as she picked up her pace to meet the guys. Usually, when they came together, she would throw herself into her man's arms, but not this time. This time, Eva stopped carefully before him, caressed his arm, and kissed him softly on the lips. Alex slid his arm around my shoulder and squeezed me close to his body. I cuddled in, savoring his familiar, comforting aroma, mingled with the scent of horses, sweat, and dirt that we all carried, and the herbal concoction that was seeping from beneath Hunter's bandage. Fine, Hunter said. Those fey, whatever they were, are apparently more dangerous if they bite you. I only got slashed by a blade. So Prince Hallid? I prompted. Alex let out a long, slow breath. He'll be fine. The healer said that if we had been even two hours later, the story might be different. My boyfriend frowned. Still, they'll be scarring. You did your best, I said, not about to let him feel bad about being unable to heal someone when he didn't know how. He's a prince, a leader. Hallett is sure to earn a few more scars in his lifetime. How's Amethyst? Hunter asked gesturing down the hallway. Well enough, all things considered. I shook my head. Her parents' spirits told her everything. They're already on the hunt for the ghosts of trustworthy mind witches. Now we just wait. Well, we have a few more things to do. Alex pivoted and brought me with him. Queen Aquatia requested to see us in the poppy lounge as soon as possible. My spine straightened. 
and a trickle of fear washed through me. Was she mad? Hallid had gotten injured on the quest? I tried to warn her that was a possibility, that perhaps someone else would be better suited than the future king of the Riverlands court. She didn't seem mad, Hunter said, clearly reading the worry on my face. Sam and Andre are already waiting. Oh, you mean Andre's still not the infirmary for his pixie bite? I teased, trying to lighten the mood a little. Alex snorted. <laughs> because of Hallid's condition, Andre wasn't so dramatic about his own when we all arrived at the infirmary. But you could tell he wanted to be. He rolled his eyes. He so wanted to be. Everyone chuckled, and we made our way through the halls, trying to keep the conversation light. When we reached the designated lounge, we knocked on the door. Surprisingly, the queen herself opened the double doors. Behind her, the room appeared empty, save for the king, two servants, Sam, and Andre. Won't you please come in? She asked. We acquiesced. And when she gestured to a circle of chairs surrounding a heavy table made of blue-gray stone, we made our way over there. I stifled a groan as I fell into the chair. After hours of riding, sitting in a regular seat with cushions had never felt so good. The queen took us in. I know that you have slept little, and would probably like to wash up after such a long journey. I'll make this quick, I promise. She snapped her fingers and the servant stepped forward and placed two boxes on the table. Gracefully, the queen leaned over and opened one of them. In the box, a dozen blades glinted up at us from a bed of green crushed velvet. I sucked in a breath, recognizing the wavy ornamentation of the metal. Demon daggers, Andre whispered, and pulled his own blade that the prince of the snow-capped court had given us from his scabbard. His was smaller than the ones in front of us, although no less deadly. Demon daggers, also known as hell blades, were weapons made of metal forged in hell. They were powerful equalizers, able to kill all levels of demons, and could be wielded by magicals and humans alike. Yes, demon daggers. Made from the same supply of metal as yours, I believe. I blinked in confusion. But Queen Tiali told us that one of their citizens journeyed to hell and brought the hell blades back. Queen Aquatia nodded. That's true but he didn't go alone. Many of the neighboring fairy courts sent one or two citizens. It was a coordinated effort. Not all returned, but the blades that they brought back were split evenly amongst the participating courts. She gestured to the box and the closed one next to it. There's an equal number of blades in that box. They're yours, if you so wish. We all stared at her. What if you need them? Eva asked after a few moments of stunned silence. What if we fail? and you end up needing these to protect your people. What she wasn't saying was obvious. We witches could use spells, albeit very difficult spells, to kill demons. But unless they were ether-blessed, and there weren't many of those, the Fae had no such talent. Their only saving grace was that demons couldn't cross over into fairy. Then again, if we failed, if the demons grew in power, even that might change. And then all the fairy courts would be in peril just as our world was at that very moment. I'd still like for you to take them, if you fail, and I hadn't give them to you. I would always wish that I had. She paused and swallowed. Plus, you saved Hallid. You saved my son's life. Nothing can repay that. But I hope that these blades might come close. The room stilled as her words sank in, true and heavy. And just when I thought none of us might ever speak again, Alex leaned forward and plucked a dagger from the box. Thank you for this gift. His blue eyes seared into the queen's green ones. I promise we'll put them to good use. Chapter 26 Two days later, we were still waiting for Amethyst's parents to return with ghostly tributes. During that time, I slept a lot. My friends took their fill of much-needed rest, too, and when we were awake, we made it a priority to teach others the druid spells. A handful had actually mastered the freezing spell, and when I learned that they'd never used the killing curse for greater demons, I was happy we'd taught them. Personally, I would fall back on demon magic, but they didn't have that option, and the more tools people had, the better. Once they tired from practicing the new spells, 
We insisted that those who would fight with us work with the demon daggers. There might only be 24 Hellblades, but as far as I was concerned, as many people as possible needed to know how to wield one. Despite keeping busy, by lunchtime on the second day, the minutes dragged like hours. When do you think they'll come back? I asked, as we lunched in one of the castle's three solariums. Dad chuckled. Patience had never been my strong suit. There's no telling, honey. Mom picked the cucumbers from her salad and placed them on my plate. The ghost plane is different from our world. Obviously, I don't know firsthand, but I've heard stories. It's large and easy to get lost there, even if you belong. We can't wait long. I wonder if we could have found a more experienced spirit walker faster in the human world. Faster isn't always better, P. Dad set down his fork. I'd like to kick those devils out of our world as much as you, but we have to do it right. Our sources say that they're still manipulating world governments left and right, preparing to make a big move. What do the humans think? I couldn't imagine being on the other side of this, oblivious and unsure as to why the world was changing for the worse. Mom heaved a sigh. Lots of them are raising questions. Others are just going with the flow, or even cheering for the changes the demons want to make. There's always a division when it comes to how people want to lead or be led, or lose all of their free will. I muttered. Once the royals wrestled power from the government, the humans wouldn't be leading at all. That's one way to look at it. Mom agreed and began picking at her salad again. I took a couple bites of my own food, a sandwich with some unidentifiable meat. I didn't dare ask what animal it came from, lest it be a unicorn or some other mythical creature, especially because I couldn't deny that I liked it. How are you getting your information? I asked. Headmistress Wake made contact with Ezra Darklight and Alpha Conan not long after you arrived, Dad replied. They've been building an army, and she urged them to do so faster. Since then, they've been sending messages using the older students. Well, the shifters have, at least. Vampires can't get past the Fey wards without another Fey, but shifters are allowed through if they take certain precautions. Headmistress Wake meets them at the academy and takes the brief. Was one of them named Dasha? I considered my friend's mates, the outgoing and nerdy Howley, quiet Heath, and gruff mountain wolf Gregor. Or maybe Gregor, Howley, or Heath? Mom tilted her head. Dasha sounds familiar. Do you know her? I nodded. She's Alpha Blood. Although she said she wouldn't become an Alpha until her parents stepped down from their leadership roles. She was a champion of the spy games, along with her three mates. My parents blinked simultaneously. Three mates? Mom asked. I bit back a laugh. She looked horror-stricken, much like I had always felt when considering having to deal with three dudes all the time, particularly three possessive wolves who were all so different. Yep, her alpha blood calls to all of them, and apparently that's okay. Universe, have mercy on that girl, Mom muttered, and Dad broke out into laughter. Anyway... I said, trying to bring the subject back around to what I was really interested in. If you guys are getting word from messengers, have they figured out where the prison is? Dad's face hardened. We're still working on that. Mom patted his shoulder. Your father's upset. We think we've located the prison, but it seems that breaking in will be harder than we could have imagined. It's well guarded by humans and technology, but there are signs of magical protections too. A second later, I was about to ask another question pertaining to the prison, when Hunter burst into the solarium. All three of us jumped and spilled some of our lunch on the floor. He had some sort of condiment smeared across the side of his face, telling that he had been mid-meal when he came to find us. Hunter, what happened? I asked, my voice high from the shock. They're back, he cried out. Amethyst's parents are back. I leapt out of my seat and dashed down the hall, Hunter a half-step in front of me. We were both out of breath when we arrived at Amethyst's room. We found her sitting in the same wing-back chair she had so often occupied, but this time, two ghosts perched opposite her. Her parents. Tears threatened to flood my eyes. But I wiped them away when a smile appeared on Mrs. Ryan's diaphanous face. Odette Dane, is it? Her smile brightened as her eyes darted behind me to take in my parents, who had just burst into the room. Lauren, she looks just like you, but with your height, Joseph. 
What a beautiful girl. A sob choked out of Mom's throat. I was no mind witch, but I knew my mom. From how her wide eyes took in Amethyst's mother, it was obvious to me that she was envisioning how easily she and Dad could have been in the Ryan's position. Dad wrapped his arm around her shoulder comfortingly. Thank you, Mom sniffled. Amethyst is lovely, too. Mrs. Rines nodded. Thank you. For the first time, I noticed that she smelled cold, like menthol. I'd never experienced that with another ghost. Or maybe I just hadn't noticed it. Mr. Rines floated over. We're here at the request of our daughter, although we cannot say for how long. We haven't been ghosts long enough to tolerate this plane for extended periods, but Amethyst tells us you need something done, and she'll require our help. However, I must ask, are you ready to bind yourself again? His ghostly white gaze pierced me, and although I'd been waiting for this moment for days, I hesitated. Yes, I said after a moment of silence. Have you found someone who Eva and I can trust? Louise had done a fine enough job back in the 17th century, although I couldn't say that I had liked having her in my head. She'd been too lazy for me to totally trust her. Mr. Rines nodded. We conducted a thorough search and asked for many opinions. The witches we found will suit your needs. You might even recognize their names. My gaze shot to Amethyst, and her lips quirked up. Recognize their names? Are they famous? Who are they? I asked, electricity dancing across my skin. If you can believe it, they were both in our year, Amethyst interjected, her tone wobbly, as if she were nervous. Their mind powers aren't as strong as some witches who live full lives and practiced, but my parents assured me they were keen for the job. They're also naturally talented and have an excellent reason to want to be in your head. Mrs. Ryan said, Both will work harder than those ghosts you bonded with. That matters quite a lot. I cut a glance back to my parents. They looked intrigued, but from how my mom was biting her lip, I knew worry was simmering in her gut, just like in mine. My eyebrows arched, and I turned back to the ghosts. Go on.